Forward of Boston Blackie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. Forward. The great fire that followed the San Francisco earthquake had burned itself out. Half the city was a seared waste of smoldering ruins. Though the sky by night still reflected the red but dying glow of the wall of flame that had leaped from block to block like a pursuing creature of prey, the undevastated remnant was safe. Those of us who had lived through the four unforgettable days of chaos just past began to look about us once more with seeing eyes. Men smiled again as amid the ruin they planned the reconstruction of a city more beautiful than the one they had lost. The indomitable spirit of a people united by a great and common disaster rose undaunted, and hope mastered despair. For the moment all men were equal. Gold had lost its value. Food, first of all necessities, was not for sale, and master and servant, banker and laborer, Millionaire and beggar waited together at the relief stations for their equal daily ration. Every park, every square, every plot of ground was covered with the improvised camps of the refugees. One hundred thousand people had fled from their homes before the incredibly swift sweep of the fire. They had fled with only such possessions as they could throw together in a moment and carry on their backs. With this inadequate material, Men built such makeshift shelters for their families as individual skill permitted. Each man was on his own, the sole protector and provider for his mate and children. Out in Golden Gate Park one Sunday afternoon, the fourth after the earthquake, I came upon a rude but comfortable refuge with a blanket forming each of three walls and a tarpaulin for a roof. Before the uncurtained entrance a man sat cross-legged with a little child on his lap. With masculine clumsiness he was trying to fashion a rag doll from a torn piece of sheeting and a bit of blue ribbon. The tot on his knee watched, smiling, with eyes wide with excitement and pleasure. Nearby three other kiddies, the eldest not older than six or seven, sprawled on the grass playing contentedly. Something prompted me to pause. The man looked up and smiled. "'Some job for a mere man this is,' he said, indicating the caricature of a doll on which he was working. "'Not so bad, evidently, from your little girl's viewpoint,' I answered, with another glance at the glowing eyes of the waiting child. "'But maybe her mother will improve on it.' "'I'm the only mother there is in this camp,' he answered. Then, as if he sensed my curiosity, "'You see, partner, none of them is mine.' "'None of them is yours?' I echoed in amazement. "'Not one. I picked them up, lost and crying, poor little stray lambs, during the fire, and now it's up to me to take care of them. I'm hoping their folks, if they're still alive, will wander by my nursery and find them. If they don't, well, I guess we'll stick together, eh, little pals?' That was my first meeting with a strange but to me wonderfully human character I have tried to picture with photographic accuracy in the following story. I have hidden his identity under the name Boston Blackie. To the police and the world he is a professional crook, a skilled and daring safe-cracker, an incorrigible criminal made doubly dangerous by intellect. To the world Boston Blackie is that and nothing more. But to me, who saw him in the park, caring tenderly as a mother for the forsaken little children the fire had sent him, Blackie is something more, a man with more than a spark of the divine spirit that lies hidden somewhere in the heart of even the worst of men. University graduate, scholar, and gentleman, the Blackie I know is a man of many inconsistencies and a strangely twisted code of morals a code that he guards from violation as a zealot guards his religion. He makes no compromise between right and wrong as he sees it. Principle is to him a thing beyond price. Today Boston Blackie would go smilingly content to a lifetime behind prison bars rather than dishonor the conscience that guides him. 
and shall we judge him, you and I? When prompted to do so, inexorably there rises in my mind the picture of a man, gravely faced and kindly, sitting cross-legged on the grass, and making a rag doll with loving hands for a lost and homeless little child. It was Christ who said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and even as ye have done unto the least of these, so even have ye done unto me. With these words before me, I halt, leaving the verdict to God himself. Jack Boyle, March 1st, 1919 End of Forward Boston and Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Boston Blackie. Boston Blackie. In the archives of a hundred detective bureaus, the name, invariably followed by a question mark, was penciled after the records of unsolved safe robberies of unequal daring and skill. The constantly recurring interrogation point was proof of the uncanny shrewdness and prevision of a crook who pitted his wits against those of organized society and gambled his all on the result of the game he played. For it was in the spirit of a man playing a vitally engrossing game against incalculable odds that Boston Blackie lived the life of crookdom. The question mark meant that the police suspected his guilt, even though they knew it, but had no proof. The name Boston Blackie was an anathema at the annual convention of police chiefs. The continually growing list of exploits attributed to him left them raging impotently at his incomparable audacity. He neither looked, worked, nor lived as experience taught them a crook should. Traps innumerable had been laid for him without result. All was, it seemed, an intuitive foreknowledge of what the police would do guided him to safety. In short, Boston Blackie, Safe Cracker Deluxe, was the great enigma of the harried, savagely incensed guardians of property rights. Though detectives never guessed it, the secret of Boston Blackie's invulnerability lay in his mental attitude toward the law and those paid to uphold it. In his own mind he was not a criminal, but a combatant. He had declared war upon society and if defeated was ready to pay the penalty it inflicted. Undefeated, he felt the world could not hold a grudge against him. The laws of the statute books he discarded as mere scraps of paper. He saw himself not as a lawbreaker, but as a law upholder, for he lived under the rigid mandates of a crook world code that he held more sacred than life itself. A guilty conscience proves the downfall of most prison inmates. Blackie, his conscience clear, played the game winningly with the zest of a schoolboy and the joy of a gambler confidently risking great stakes. Boston Blackie was no roistering cabaret habitue, squandering the proceeds of his exploits and nightlife dissipation. University trained, and with a natural predilection for good literature, his pleasures were those of a gentleman of independent means, with a mental trend toward the humanitarian problems of the day. His home was his place of recreation, and in that home, sharing joyously the perils and pleasures of his strangely ordered life, was Mary, his wife. Boston Blackie's Mary, to the crook world that looked up to them with unfeigned adulation as the chief exponents of its queerly warped creed. Mary was Boston Blackie's best-loved pal and sole confidant. She alone knew all he did and why, and knowing, she joined in his exploits with the whole-heartedness of unquestioning love. Together they played, together they worked, and always they were happy in good fortune or evil. A strange couple, so unusual in thought and life and habit, that detectives judging them by other crooks were forever at sea. Seated in their cozy apartment in San Francisco, which for the time was their home, Blackie suddenly dropped the current volume on mysticism which he had been reading and looked across the room to Mary, busy with an intricate piece of embroidery. 
"'We need a bit of excitement, Mary,' he said with the unconcerned air of a husband about to suggest an evening at the theater. "'We'll take the Wilmerding Jewel Collection tonight.' "'I'll drive your car myself, if you're going out there,' she answered, with the faintest trace of womanly anxiety in her voice. "'Well, then, that's settled.' Boston Blackie resumed his reading, and Mary her embroidery. End of Chapter One of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Boston Blackie's Little Pal The room was faintly illumined by the intermittent flame of a wood fire slowly dying on the hearth of an open grate. The house was silent dark, seemingly deserted. Outside, the dripping San Francisco fog clung to everything in the heavy, impenetrable folds that isolated the residents from its neighbors as though it stood alone in an otherwise empty world. Inside the handsomely furnished living room, and opposite the fire, which now and then leaped up and cast his shadow in grotesque shapes against the ceiling, stood a man intently studying the paneled walls, a man with a white handkerchief masking his face and a coat that sagged under the weight of the gun slung ready for instant use beneath one of its lapels. The man was Boston Blackie. Concealed behind the oaken panels he inspected so painstakingly was a safe in which lay the Wilmerding Jewels, a famous collection. For two generations San Franciscans had eyed them with envy. Handed down from mother to daughter, they had played their part in the social warfare of the city of the Golden Gate for half a century and Blackie was there to make them his own. He ran acutely sensitive fingers, sandpapered until the blood showed redly below the skin, over the woodwork, seeking the hidden spring he knew was there. For an incautious servant's remark had traveled up through the underworld until it reached Blackie, the one in a thousand expert enough to use it. Quickly his questing fingers located the key panel, and the door rolled noiselessly back disclosing a steel strong-box. "'Ah, oh, neatly arranged,' murmured the safe-cracker in an inaudible and satisfied whisper as he stooped and gently turned the combination knob. It revolved without perceptible sound. But science is an impartial ally, the ally of able crooks as well as of those who wore upon them. Blackie laid a tiny metal disc against the combination. Wires led from it to a transmitter he hooked over his ear. Then he turned the dial knob again slowly and with infinite care. The audion bulb within the transmitter, science's newest device for magnifying otherwise imperceptible sound, carried to his ear plainly the faint click of the tumblers within as the dial crossed the numbers of the combination that guarded the jewels. One by one he memorized them slowly but surely reading the combination that once his would enable him to open the safe, take the jams, relock the strong box, and depart without leaving behind the slightest outward evidence that robbery had been done. The cracksman smiled contentedly as he worked. Already he reckoned the Wilmerding collection of jewels as his own. A faint sound from behind caught his ear. He straightened quickly, dropped the audion bulb into his pocket, and slid the panel noiselessly back into place. A step on the stair, he whispered in sudden alarm, and I was sure the house was empty except for the two servants asleep below stairs. I counted them out one by one, and yet there's someone coming down from above, coming down slowly, stealthily, too, as he heard a second cautious step. Too bad. In another five minutes I'd have been gone. He drew his mask higher over his face and stepped backward into the shadow of the drapery before the window he had prepared for a quick exit in an emergency. Then he waited, listening with every sense alert, every muscle rigid. Again he heard the step, now close to the doorway. Then in the dim firelight a small, tousled head appeared, the head of a little child who stood irresolute outside the room. The boy, a mere baby of four, hesitated on the threshold of the dark room, evidently trying to summon courage to enter. 
The safecracker from his refuge saw and read a conflict between fear and determination in the wide eyes of the little intruder. For a full minute the child hung back. Then suddenly, with a low cry, half fearful, half courageous, he ran across the room to the window and tumbled straight into the arms of the safecracker, of whose presence he had no inkling. Blackie, fearing an outcry, spoke quickly, soothingly, but the boy neither screamed nor cried. He stared wonderingly for a moment into the kind eyes that looked down into his, and then with a faint sigh of relief, involuntarily nestled closer in the protecting arms that held him. A lonely, frightened child, finding comfort and consolation in the unexpected solace of human companionship. "'Who is you?' lisped the little fellow, smiling confidently up into Blackie's perplexed face. Then with suddenly increased interest, "'You isn't Santy, is you?' "'No, you isn't Santy, because that on your face is a hanky, not beards.' He had reached up and given the partially disarranged handkerchief mask a gentle, inquiring tug. Blackie smiled back at him. "'No, I'm not Santa Claus tonight, little man,' he said. "'Who are you?' "'I'm Martin Wilberding, Jr., and I'm four years old,' the boy said proudly. "'You are. Well, well. And where is your mama and your papa?' "'Papa's gone away,' Mama says, "'and Mama's gone to a party. "'And when Mama was gone, then Nursie went out, too, "'and said she'd spank me if I told. "'John and Emily is downstairs sleeping, "'and I woke up, and it was dark, "'and I was afraid a little.' "'So they've all trapassed off and left you alone "'for me to entertain, have they?' said Blackie, "'his eyes narrowing grimly as understanding of the situation came to him. But what were you coming downstairs for? Looking for Mama? Oh, no. Mama won't come for ever and ever so long. I was all alone and afraid, and I came down for Rex. Rex? Who is he? said Blackie quickly. He's my doggy, my woolly doggy. See, here he is. The boy squirmed out of Blackie's arms and pattered in bare feet to the window seat, where he resurrected Rex from beneath a cushion. Then he hurried back to Boston Blackie and climbed into his lap with the toy dog clasped in his arms. "'Rex seeps upstairs with me,' the child informed his newfound friend. "'But tonight Mercy forgot him, and I woke up and remembered where he was, and it was so dark, and I wanted him so bad, so I come downstairs for him. I isn't afraid when I is Rex, because I can hold him close and talk to him, and then we both goes to sleep. See, isn't he a dear little doggie? Unconsciously, Boston Blackie's arms tightened around the soft little body, nestling contentedly against his breast. "'You poor abandoned little kitty,' he said softly. "'You poor little orphan. "'You're a little man, too, for it took real nerve to come down here after your pal Rex. "'Far more nerve than I had to use to get in here.' "'I likes you. You're a nice man.' said the boy with childish, intuitive understanding that the man in whose arms he lay was a friend. Blackie looked at his burden in puzzled indecision. He had the heart to desert his newfound pal, and yet he was a safe-breaker in a strange house with each passing minute doubling his risk. Even the sound of their voices, low-pitched though they were, was an imminent danger. The boy, quiet and content, cuddled close to him, hugging his precious woolly dog. "'Hadn't you better run back to bed, Martin?' said Blackie gently at last. "'Nursie will be back soon, and she'll be cross if she finds you down here.' The child clutched the arms that sheltered him. "'Yes,' he admitted slowly. Then wistfully, "'It's awful dark and quiet upstairs. "'If you come up and tuck me and Rex in bed, "'we'll be good and go right to sleep. "'Please?' "'Of course I will.' said the safe cracker a bit huskily. I'd do it if the whole house were full of coppers. He rose with the boy still in his arms. You must show me the way, Martin, he said, and we mustn't make any noise and wake John and Emily. Now we'll go. They climbed the dark stairway together, and the child directing came to the open door of a big deserted nursery. 
A little empty bed revealed the refuge from which Martin Wilberding, Jr. had begun his perilous adventure in search of Rex and companionship. Blackie laid the boy down and covered him gently as a mother might have done. "'Good night, little pal,' he said. "'I'm glad I happened to be here tonight.' The boy clutched his hand. "'Please stay and hold my hand,' he pleaded. "'I's going right to sleep, if you will. Please, cause it's awful dark.' Boston Blackie sat on the edge of the bed and took a tiny hand in his. The boy, with a sigh of perfect contentment, nestled snugly in downy comforts. "'Good night,' he said drowsily. "'Good night, little pal,' answered Blackie. Silence descended over the nursery as Blackie, with aching throat, waited hand in hand with the little Wilmerding heir, who was learning too soon that life's problems must be mastered alone and unaided. Five minutes passed, and Blackie, looking down, saw the boy was fast asleep with baby lips parted in a peaceful smile and Rex's fuzzy head tightly clasped to his breast. The safecracker gently withdrew his hand and smoothed the covers. "'Poor little chap,' he said. "'Everything in the world it doesn't count, and only one real friend, Rex. Poor, lonely little chap.' The safecracker crept noiselessly down the stairs to the room that contained the purpose of his visit. The fire had died to a few glowing embers. Again he rolled back the panel door and exposed the safe. Again he adjusted the audion bulb and began anew the task of deciphering the combination. And again with his work but half finished there came a startling interruption, a short and long blast from an auto horn that sounded from somewhere out in the fog. Mary signal. "'Someone's coming,' he reflected disgustedly. Quickly he drew a damp cloth from his pocket and mopped off the door of the safe and the woodwork to destroy the possibility of telltale fingerprints, then once more closed the panel. He drew back into the comparatively safe shelter of the window hangings and waited. "'I'm going to have these jewels tonight if I have to stay here till morning,' he murmured resolutely. "'I wonder who this can be.' The nurse who slipped out on her own business and left the poor little kitty alone, I suppose. The faint purr of a motor stopping before the house reached his ears. That doesn't sound like a nurse to me, he thought. If it's the mother of that boy, she'll be here, likely enough, with all the lights on in a minute. Well, anyway, we'll wait and see what happens. The window's ready for a quick getaway, and all the coppers in town couldn't get me once I'm outside in this fog with Mary and the machine ready. We haven't lost out yet. The whir of the motor died, and voices sounded outside as steps ascended from the street. Two are coming, a man and a woman, murmured Blackie. Matters are growing interesting. The outer door opened and closed softly. In the darkness the safe cracker sensed two dim forms in the doorway. Then an electric button clicked, and the room was flooded with light. Blackie saw a brilliantly handsome woman, clothed and in evening dress, and an equally handsome man similarly garbed. The woman let her wrap slip to the floor as she turned to her companion. "'What is it, Don?' she asked apprehensively. "'What is troubling you so? Tell me.' "'The same thing that always troubles me,' he answered, stepping toward her and taking her hands in his. "'My love for you, Marion.' The man drew her closer to him, gently but irresistibly, and his arm dropped to her slender waist. "'Your own heart tells you all that is in mine. It must,' he added quickly. "'Marion, dear, this torture must end tonight.' For a second with his arm around her she swayed toward him, then slowly she released herself and drew away. "'Don't, Don, please,' she begged tremulously. You know we agreed not to discuss things that that can't be remedied. Is this all you had to tell me? Is this why you have brought me home now from the dance, where at least we might have forgotten and been happy for an hour? Her face, as she looked up at him, was a strangely mingled contradiction. There was reproach in her voice. There were tenderness and regret in her eyes. But behind them lay an instinctive womanly shrinking from something to be feared. Yes. 
her companion said, studying her face. That is what I have come to tell you tonight. First, that I love you. Then, that I am going away. Marion, I sail for Honolulu tomorrow morning on the Manchuria. Oh, no, no! The woman cried, springing to his side and catching his arm in a movement imploringly detaining. Oh, Don, you wouldn't, you couldn't tell me it isn't so. You say you, you care. And yet you would leave me to face an empty life here, alone, in this house. To Blackie, watching from within the window embrasure, the sweeping gesture of hate that accompanied her final word was as revealing as a diary. It seemed to picture the luxurious home as a prison in which love and a woman's illusions had slowly stifled and died. It seemed the signed confession of an unhappy and embittered wife and also in its resentful recklessness. The gesture explained the man she called Don, the man who now gently drew her into his arms and tilted her head until she faced him squarely. "'It is true that I am leaving on the Manchuria,' he said. "'But it is not true that I am leaving you. Because,' as she stared up at him in breathless wonder, "'Marion, dear, you are going with me.' A slowly rising flush colored her white cheeks, and for just a second her eyes answered the fire and tenderness in his. Then she laid trembling hands against his breast and slowly pushed him away as she bowed her head. "'It can't be, Don,' she said, speaking so low the man stooped to hear her. "'What you ask is impossible. I can never do that. Never.' "'And why not?' he answered. Is it because of what our friends here will say? That for them and their gossip, snapping his fingers. For a week idle tongues will buzz over teacups and cocktail glasses. We'll let them. You and I will not be there to hear. We will be together, far out on the Pacific, under a, a warm sun and a blue sky, with heartache forever dead and buried beyond the horizon, and a lifetime of perfect happiness rising before us as you see the islands rise out of the sea. Hawaii is a beautiful land, dearest, a land that has no yesterdays. Are we to miss all that awaits us there, all that makes life worth living, because we fear chattering tongues two thousand miles behind us? No. Dear one, we must both sail on the Manchuria. He stopped, seeing a glimpse of her averted face. Why must you go? she asked, her head still bowed. There is serious labor trouble on the sugar plantation. Michaels cabled me this afternoon. It is absolutely imperative for me to return at once, and the Manchuria tomorrow morning is the only steamer this month. I have taken passage, and I can't, I won't leave you behind. Will you go, Marion? Slowly she shook her head. This, then, is the end, Don, she said. You know I can't go, and you know, too, her voice now was bitterly resentful. That life will be a hideously empty thing to me after the Manchuria sails in the morning. But I can't go. I am tied here with bonds that can't be broken by me. Do you mean that, Marion? She hesitated and brushed a hand quickly across her eyes, then nodded silently. If you do, he continued, betraying the bitterness of his disappointment, it proves one of two things. Either you are a coward, afraid to risk a momentary sacrifice to buy a lifetime of happiness, or deep in your heart you still love your husband. Which is it? Do you care for Wilmerding? Has my love been no more than a toy to amuse you in idle hours? How can you ask that, Don? she answered quickly. You know it hasn't, and as for my husband— she stopped and stood staring down into the fire, her face altering with each of many swiftly changing emotions. At last she looked up and into the eyes of a man beside her. "'I did love Martin Wilberding once,' she said. "'Sometimes I have thought that if the past two years could be blotted out, forgotten, I might love him again, even yet. But now, today, tonight, I do not love him. That is my answer, Don Laval.' Tonight I do not love him. How long has it been since you thought you might care for him again? Laval demanded jealously. Since you came into my life 
and taught me to care for you. He stooped over her eagerly. You tell me that and expect me to leave you here, he whispered. Never. In saying you love me, you have decided. Come, Miriam, come. For a second their eyes met. His were eager, ardent, passionately tender. To a woman grown reckless through neglect, they pleaded his cause better than words. She crouched by the vanishing fire, weighing her problem. Behind her, Laval, intuitively avoiding speech, awaited her verdict. From his hiding place, Boston Blackie watched, forgetful for the moment of why he was there. Minutes passed. Minutes in which Marion Wilmerding, choosing her future at diverging crossroads, relived her life. The years behind her flitted one by one through her mind, years she saw as a nightmare of steadily growing disillusionment. She had loved big, handsome, debonair Martin Wilmerding when they were married. As a suitor, he had stood out alone among the many men who had asked her hand. They had been very happy at first, were still happy when their boy was born. When and how had the present gulf between them grown? Memory told her. It had begun when she found the romance-haloed suitor she had married, slowly altering into a husband who regarded her love as an irrevocably given possession, requiring neither attention nor the refreshing nourishment of tender response. Time widened the breach. She had been morose, petulant. He had not understood and had withdrawn more and more into a cycle of interests in which she had no share. She, hiding her wound, retaliated by plunging into the feverish gaiety of ultra-smart society. For many months they had lived as strangers, never meeting except occasionally at dinner. And now she was facing the inevitable result, listening to the plea of a man for whom she had confessed her love, urging her to leave home and husband. What was the answer? End of chapter 2《of Boston Blackie》by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Boston Blackie's Code Her throat tightened in an aching pain as her eye fell on the thin gold band that encircled a slender finger. Martin Wilberding had stooped to kiss that hand and ring on the day it first was placed there. "'Dear little wife,' he had said. That ring is the symbol of a bond that will never be broken by me. Throughout all the years before us, whenever I see it, this hour will return, bringing back all the love and devotion that is in my heart now. Recollection of the long-forgotten words swept her with a sudden revulsion of feeling, and she sprang to her feet. In that instant, she realized for the first time why she had come to love Don Laval. It was because... In his fresh, ardent, impulsive devotion, he was so like the Martin Wilmerding who had kissed her hand and ring with the vow of lifetime fealty that had left her clinging to him in tearful ecstasy. Don, she said, if you really love me, go, now, now. Laval's arms, eagerly outstretched toward her, dropped to his side. It was not the answer he had awaited so confidently. A vague resentment against her tinged his disappointment with new bitterness. "'That is final, is it, Marion?' he asked. "'Yes, yes, don't make it harder for me. Please go,' she cried almost hysterically. He slipped into his overcoat. "'Perhaps you will tell me why,' he suggested with increasing asperity. "'Because of the boy and this,' the woman said brokenly laying a finger on her wedding ring. "'Nonsense!' he cried angrily. "'What tie does that ring represent that Martin Wilmerding has not violated a hundred times? You have been faithful to it, we know, even though you admit you care for me. But has he? I have not the pleasure of your husband's acquaintance, but no man ever neglected a wife like you without a reason.' "'Go, please, quickly,' she pleaded, shivering. 
"'I will,' he said, instinctively avoiding the blunder of combating her decision with argument. He caught her in his arms, and stooping quickly kissed her on the lips. She reeled away from him, sobbing. "'Our first and last kiss. Good-bye, Marion,' he said gently, and left the room. She followed, clutching at the walls for support as she watched him from the doorway. He adjusted his muffler and caught up his hat without a backward glance, and she pressed her two hands to her lips to choke back a cry. Then, as he opened the outer door, the crushing misery of her loneliness swept over her, overpowering self-restraint and resolution. "'Don! Oh, Don!' she pleaded, stumbling toward him with outstretched arms. In a second he was at her side, and she was crying against his breast. "'I can't let you go,' she sobbed. "'I tried, but I can't. Take me, Don. I will do as you wish.' From his hiding-place Blackie saw them re-enter the room. The woman stopped by the fireplace, drew off her wedding ring, and after holding it a second between shaking fingers, dropped it into the ashes. "'Dead and gone,' she said. "'Dead is the love of the man who put it on my finger.' "'My ring will replace it,' said Laval tenderly, but with triumph in his eyes. "'Wilmerding will want a divorce. He shall have it. And then you'll wear the wedding ring of the man who loves you, and whom you love, the only ring in the world that shouldn't be broken. Don, promise me that you will never leave me alone, she pleaded falteringly. I don't ever want a chance to think, to, to reflect, to regret. I only want to be with you, and forget everything else in the world. Promise me. Love like mine knows no such word as separation he answered. From this hour we will never be apart. Don't fear regrets, Marion. There will be none. My boy, she suggested, he will go with us. Poor little Martin. I wouldn't leave him behind, fatherless and motherless. Of course not, he agreed. And now you must get a few necessaries together quickly, just the things you will require on the steamer. You can get all you need when we reach Honolulu, but there is no time for anything now, for under the circumstances it is best that we go aboard the steamer before morning. Can you be ready in an hour?" "'In an hour?' she cried in surprise. "'Yes, I can, but, but how can we go aboard the steamer tonight? We can't, Don. Your passage is booked, but not mine.' "'My passage is booked for Don Laval and wife.' he informed her smilingly. She turned away her head to hide the flush that colored her face. "'You were so sure as that,' she murmured, with a strangely new sense of disappointment. "'Yes,' Laval answered, "'for I knew love like mine could not fail to win yours. Will you pack a single trunk while I run back to my hotel and get my own things together?' I can be back in an hour or less. Will you be ready?" "'Yes, I will be ready,' she promised wearily. "'I will take only a few things. I want nothing that my husband ever gave me. I shall only take a few of my own things, and the jewels in the safe that were in Mother's collection. They are my own, and they're very valuable, Don. It will not be safe to risk packing them in my baggage. I'll get them now, and give them to you to keep until we can leave them in the purser's safe tomorrow. Be very careful of them, Don. They couldn't be replaced for a fortune." Boston Blackie saw her hurry to the wall, saw the sliding door roll back. With a quickly indrawn breath, he watched the woman fumble nervously with a combination dial. The safe door swung open, and she rapidly sorted out a half-dozen jewel cases and reclosed the safe. "'Here they are, Don,' she said, handing the gems to Laval. "'I have only taken those that came from my own people. And now you must leave me. I must pack, and I can't call the servants under these circumstances. I must get the boy up and ready, and also, she hesitated a second and then added, I must write a note to Mr. Wilmerding, telling him what I have done and why. Don't mail it until we are at the dock, warned the man. Where is he, at his club or out of town? He's at the Del Monte Hotel near Monterey, or was, she answered. The letter won't reach him till tomorrow night. 
and tomorrow night we will be far out of sight of land laval cried that is as it should be i am glad i never met him for now i never need do so he stuffed the jewel cases into his overcoat i'll be back in my car in an hour he warned hurry marion my love each minute until i am with you again will be a day he caught up his hat and ran down the steps to the street where his car stood at the curbstone as the door closed behind him marion wilmerding sank into a chair and clutched her throat to stifle choking sobs intuitive womanly fear of what she was to do paralyzed her for many minutes she lay shaking convulsively as she tried to overcome the dread that chilled her heart then the dismal atmosphere of the masterless home began to oppress her with a sense of wretched loneliness she rose and with hard reckless eyes shining hotly from behind wet lashes ran upstairs to pack as donald laval threw open the door of his empty car a man who had slipped behind him around the corner of the wilmerding residence stepped to his side i'm sorry to have to trouble you for my wife's jewels laval he said the triumphant smile on laval's face faded and he shrank back in speechless consternation your wife's jewels he ejaculated trying to recover from the shock of the utterly unexpected interruption you are yes i am martin wilberding and the happy chance that brought me home tonight also gave me the pleasure of listening from the window seat of the living room to your interesting tete-a-tete with my wife a gun flashed into boston blackie's hand and was jabbed sharply into laval's ribs give me marion's jewels the pseudo husband cried hand them over before i blow your heart out that's what i ought to do and i may anyway laval handed over the cases that contained the wilmerding collection of gems now continued his captor i want a word with you the gun was thrust so savagely into Laval's face that it left a long, red bruise. "'I have heard all you said tonight. I know all your plans for stealing away my wife,' the inexorable voice continued. "'And I've just a word of warning for you. You're dealing with a man, not a woman, from now on. And if you phone, write, telegraph, or ever again communicate in any way with Marion, I'll blow your worthless brains out if I have to follow you round the world to do it.' Do you get that, Mr. Don Laval? I understand you, said Laval helplessly. Again the gun muzzle bruised the flesh of his cheek. And as a last and kindly warning, Laval, Blackie continued, I suggest that you take extreme precautions to see you do not miss the Manchuria when she sails in the morning. Because if you are not on board, you won't live to see another sunset if I have to kill you in your own club. Will you sail or die? I'll sail, said Laval. Very well. That's about all that requires words between us, I believe. Go, and remember your life is in your own hands. One word of any kind to Marion, and you forfeit it. I don't know why I don't kill you now. I would if it were not for the scandal all this would cause when it came out before the jury that would acquit me. Now go. Laval pressed the button that started the motor as Boston Blackie stepped back from his side. I have just one word I want to say to you, Wilmerding, Laval began, his foot on the clutch. It's this. You have only yourself to blame. Don't accuse Marion. You forced her into the situation you discovered this evening by your neglect of the finest little woman I ever met. I was forced into it by a love I had met frankly. Don't blame Marion for what you yourself have caused. I won't ever see or communicate with her again. That's the most decent speech I've heard from your lips tonight, said the man beside the car, dropping his gun back into an outside pocket. I don't blame her. I've learned many important facts tonight, one of which is that the right place for a man is in his own home with his own wife. I'm going to remember that. And the wedding ring that was dropped into the ashes tonight is going back on the finger it fits. Good night. Laval, without a word, threw in the clutch, and his car sped away and was enveloped and hidden by the fog. Halfway down the block, Boston Blackie came to another car standing at the curb with a well-muffled chauffeur sitting behind the wheel. 
As he climbed in, the driver, Mary, uttered a low, thankful cry. No trouble. I have the jewels here, feel the packages, and a whole lot happened, said Blackie with deep satisfaction. I've a new story to tell you when we get home, Mary. It's the story of a big burglar named Blackie, and a little boy named Martin Wilmerding, and a still littler, woolly dog named Rex, and a woman who guessed wrong. I think it will interest you. Let's go. I have several things to do before we go home. When they reached the downtown district, Blackie had Mary drive him to the Palace Hotel. There he sought out the night stenographer. "'Will you take a telegram for me, please?' he said. Then he dictated. "'To Martin Wilmerding, Del Monte Hotel, Monterey. "'The boy needs you. I do, too. Please come. Marion.' Though there was a telegraph office in the hotel, he summoned a messenger boy from a saloon and sent the message. Then he went to another hotel and found a second stenographer, to whom he dictated a second message. Mrs. Marion Wilmerding, 3420 Broadway, San Francisco. The packages you gave me were what I really wanted. Thank you and goodbye. D.L. Summoning another boy, he sent the second message from a different telegraph office. Those telegrams and how they came to be sent will be a mystery in the Wilmerding home to the end of time, he thought, deeply contented. Let's go home, Mary, he said then, returning to his car and climbing in. I think I've finished my night's work, and I don't believe I've done such a bad job, either. He was silent for a moment. I've given a wife to a husband, he said half to himself. I've given a father to a child. I've given a mother the right to look her son in the face without shame. And I've played square with the gamest little pal I ever want to know, Martin Wilmerding, Jr., and his dog, Rex. And for my pay, I've taken the Wilmerding Jewel Collection. I wonder who's the debtor. End of Chapter 3 Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Cushion's Kid Boston Blackie dropped the paper he had been reading, a satisfied smile lighting his face. Two months had elapsed since the evening still treasured in his memory on which he had met and comforted his little pal at the Wilburning home. And now in the daily column of society notes he read, Mr. and Mrs. Martin Wilmerding, accompanied by their son, are leaving the city for a month at their country home in Monterey County. It succeeded, he cried joyously to himself. It couldn't help it, not with a boy like that drawing them together. I wish Mary were back. This news will make her even happier than it has me. Impatiently he began to pace the floor, visions of a tiny youngster in night clothes and with a woolly dog, filling his mind as he waited for his wife. A step sounded in the corridor. "'Mary at last!' exclaimed Blackie in tones caressingly tender. Then his ear caught the sound of a second light step on the stairway. He listened with every faculty strained and abnormally alert. His hand, which instinctively at the sound of the strange footfall had sought the revolver which lay nearby, let the gun slip back to its place. "'A woman with her,' he added. "'Strange.' But she comes for a good reason, if she comes with Mary. He rose and unbarred the door at the light, distinctive rap of the elect among crooks. Mary threw herself into his arms and clung to him, sobbing. Behind her entered a second woman, with the face and figure of a young girl, but with eyes old and tired and world-weary from heartache and suffering. She, too, was weeping, but quietly, hopelessly, as women who love do for their dead. Blackie recognized her at once. "'Why, it's little Miss Happy!' he exclaimed, using the name with which Crookdom had rechristened her when she was first introduced to its circles by the Cushion's Kid, youthful pal of Blackie in bygone days. "'What's wrong, little girl? What's happened to the kid?' The girl covered her face with tiny hands, frail and thin and almost transparent, and sobbed silently. 
Mary released one arm from Blackie and encircled the thin shoulders that seemed so pitifully childish for the burden of grief they bore. The girl's head fell on Mary's shoulder. "'Oh, Blackie!' cried Mary. "'The Cushion's kid is in Folsom prison, and he's sentenced to—to—' to... Her lips failed as she strove to speak the dreaded words. The other girl raised her head and laid her hand on Boston Blackie's arm. "'The kid's sentenced to be hanged, Blackie,' she said, forcing the words slowly one by one as though each tore her heart. "'Only fourteen days left, Blackie. Only fourteen little days. Oh!' Her voice rose as self-restraint snapped. Day and night I see him standing on the trap, bound and helpless. I see the black cap sliding over his dear face. I see the... the... She covered her eyes as though thus she could shut out the picture imagination seared on her brain. I love him so, Blackie. I love him so, she moaned. You won't let them kill him. You'll save him for me, won't you, Blackie? Her blind confidence in the power of a hunted crook to wrest her lover from the hand of the law was as a little child's belief in the omnipotence of a father. "'Make her some coffee, Mary,' he said, "'and you're going to lie here and tell me all about it. You look terribly sick, child.' "'I've been starving myself. I needed every dollar I could make for the kids' mouthpieces. Every day they want more Jack, more Jack, more Jack, and there was no one but me to make it. The kid's pal turned out a rat, you see. Boston Blackie raised himself and stared at the girl, his eyes aglow with admiration. He had felt the agonizing torture she had chosen to endure for the sake of a love that knew no higher law than sacrifice and service. Game, little girl, he muttered. The worst of us see the day when we thank God for our women. Tell me about the kid's fall, Happy, he added aloud. Why wasn't it in the papers? It was. They were full of it, but he, he called himself Jimmy Grimes, and the coppers never made him. They don't know who he is yet. It was the express car robbery on the Overland Rattler at Sacramento. The messenger was killed. But Blackie, the kid didn't do it. He wasn't even in the car, though he was in on the job. Whispering Malone bumped the messenger and tossed the package and Jack and Jules to the kid who was waiting for them at the river bridge. They got the kid at the hop joint that night with the stuff still on him. Malone blew after the pitch, the yellow-hearted rat. And now the kid's up at the big house with a death sentence that isn't coming to him because he's too right to snitch, even on a rat. The girl lifted herself on her elbow and raised one frail hand as though taking an oath. So help me God, she cried. I'd go straight to the coppers and tell him who killed that messenger. I'd tell him how the job was pulled. I'd tell him everything, enough to put Whispering Malone where my poor boy is now. But if I did, the kid would quit me. You know he would, Blackie. That's all that stops me. You may say I'm a copper at heart, but I can't help it. I would. I would. The girl's voice rose as emotion mastered her. But I can't, she added with a hopeless gesture and dropped back on the couch, whimpering like an animal wounded by the jaws of a trap. Blackie laid a comforting hand on her thin arm. "'You haven't a wrong drop of blood in you, child,' he said gently. "'You wouldn't snitch to the coppers, no matter whose life depended on it. We men who play the crooked game must pay some day, and while we pay behind bars, our women suffer, like you, outside them. It doesn't seem right, but it's true. It's part of the price of loving men like us, like me, or the kid who—' "'Stop!' interrupted the girl. Don't say that. The only happiness I ever had was with the kid. The only happiness I ever want is his love. Do you think that if I could, I'd forget what we've been to each other? I suffer because I'm afraid for him. It's thinking what those terrible days and nights must be to him that, that drives me wild. You can imagine what it is to count the days, the hours, the minutes of life that are left you to face them alone and helpless like a trap rat. I see him led from the death cell, young, strong, and full of life, and then in just one little minute, lying white and cold and... and... The girl sprang suddenly to her feet, wringing her hands. They must not, they shall not, she cried. She dropped on her knees and held out two fragile arms, imploring divine mercy. Merciful God, help us now, she prayed. 
Don't let him die. He is so young, and you know he didn't kill the messenger. He was so good to me. He never, never betrayed a friend. Oh, God, it isn't right that he should die for whispering alone. The time left is so very, very short. Please, please, oh, God, help Blost and Blackie to save him. Amen. Mary was on her knees as little Miss Happy finished. Boston's Blackie's head was bowed. The girl, still kneeling with arms imploringly outstretched and tears streaming down her face, strained her eyes upward as though to speed her prayer to its destination. The intense, unmistakable sincerity in the plea that came from the overburdened heart of the child woman, a wife in fact, but not in name, seemed to chasten and sanctify the air of the room and the hearts of the trio within it. Vividly Blackie pictured the cushion's kid, still a boy, in the first days they had been together. Chicago, Denver, a dozen places flashed to his mind where they had pulled off jobs, Blackie, the master, and the kid, his protege. And then that night in K.C., where the kid had risked everything for him. What he was, Blackie had made him. Every trick and stall was Blackie's own. Love akin to a father's was in his heart for him. The kid was right. Boston Blackie, husky under the stress of the feeling Happy had fanned into a flame of determination, broke the silence. What have the lawyers done? he asked. Have they been to the governor for a commutation? The appeal was denied long ago. They have just come back from the capital. It took my last two hundred dollars to send them. The governor refused to interfere unless we show the kid is innocent and turn up the right man. Boss Tom Creedon turned us down, too. You're the last hope, Blackie. The mouthpiece is through. The girl searched the man's face for some sign that would stimulate into new life the hope that her love would not let die. I suppose you had to raise the money for the trial, too, Blackie said. How did you do it, Happy? The girl looked into his questioning eyes, frankly. I'm working at the Spider's dance hall, she said without embarrassment, though no place bore a more unsavory reputation. I dress like a school kid and sell more drinks than any two of the girls. No, in answer to the query in his eyes, I'm not like the rest of the girls. I promised the kid I wouldn't be. I went to the Spider's joint as a last resort when the lawyers said they'd quit the appeal if I didn't raise money. I've been filling in as a stall for Red Eye, Costigan's gun mob, but they're a cheap, worthless lot, not our kind, Blackie, and my bit wasn't enough to keep the lawyers going. So I went to the dance hall. There was nothing else to do. I had to have money to fight the kid's case. Poor, brave little woman, said Mary, putting an arm protectingly around the girl and kissing her gently. I know what you have gone through, dear. I stood it better at first, when I knew that every time I sold the drink or begged luck money after a dance I was earning a dollar that might save the kid, she said. Lately, since the mouthpieces told me they didn't see any hope, it has been worse than hell itself. Mary, Blackie, I've sat there pretending to drink with strangers while the picture of my boy in the death house blinded me. I've laughed and joked while I counted how many hours, how many minutes even I left him. I've danced with men, knowing each step was cutting my poor boy's life another second shorter. Oh, she shuddered. How oh, I hated the touch of their hands, the look in their eyes, the words on their lips. I hated the music. I hated the crowds. I hated the lights and the laughter. For always I could see the kid lying alone in the dark, waiting waiting, waiting. But I laughed with the rest, for the lawyers wanted dough, and it takes a laughing face to get the money at Spider's. Boston Blackie, without a word, rose from the pallet and switched on the lights. How much money have we, Mary? he asked. Mary, whose face was white and drawn, delved into a trunk and handed him a big roll of bills. It was the money which meant escape from all the dangers that threatened them. Blackie counted it, then he divided it into two piles. "'That's for you, Mary, in case anything happens to me, in case I don't come back,' he said, indicating the smaller package of bills. He stuffed the larger roll inside the breast of his soft shirt. 
This I'll take with me. Money is the right kind of ammunition for a job like this, and there's eight thousand dollars here. It's enough. He slipped the revolver on the table inside the waistband of his trousers. He took a second gun and a holster from a desk drawer and slung it under his left armpit. Then he turned to little Miss Happy and, with gentle hands laid on her shoulders, stilled the convulsive shudders that shook her body. "'You stay here with Mary,' he commanded. "'You've done your bit for the kid, little woman. No more of the spiders for you. Everything a man can do for him is going to be done, provided the coppers don't get me first. Don't despair, and don't hope, too much. Just pray as you did a moment ago. I'll be at Folsom by noon tomorrow. Mary slipped to his side and clung to him. He looked into her face and kissed her gently, as though in renunciation. I'm sorry, dear one, he whispered. Happiness seemed our very own this morning. Now who knows? But you know I must go. You know I must try, even if I fail. Yes, yes, go. I want you to, dear. I knew you would when I brought her here. There is no other way. But, oh, my dearest, why is life so very, very cruel and hard? Blackie, I am only a woman. There was no break in Mary's voice, no tears in her eyes. Instead, in them Blackie saw and recognized the same spirit of willing sacrifice with which women sent their men to the trenches somewhere in France, and watched them go with smiling lips, brave eyes, and breaking hearts. Blackie stooped and kissed her. You see now, dear, he said with deep conviction, why I felt held here. Now we understand why. Once more he kissed her, then with a cheery word to Happy, he was gone. Mary covered her face and choked back a sob as the door closed. Happy knelt beside her, and the two women clung together, united by misery, for each knew the life of the man she loved was at stake now. If all men were like Blackie, there wouldn't be any like him, Happy cried, and paradoxical as it sounds, this was precisely what she meant. End of chapter 4Five of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. One Week to Live. Folsom Prison is tucked away in an isolated nook in the lower foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. The prison is built in a small level plain, barren, brown, and treeless, that lies in the shelter of a semicircle of hills. The gray, squatty buildings are a bleak and unlovely blot on the scenic grandeur that surrounds them. Behind the prison flows the American River, between low, sandy banks. On the other three sides, dotted every hundred yards by watchtowers manned by gun guards, stretches a broad, glaring white line. It is the dead line of the prison, for Folsom has no walls and needs none. Within that line, men in stripes pray or curse as they choose, while they work out the stunted measure of life that the law has left them. To step beyond the line, even one step beyond it, is death, for the guards in the towers are ordered to ask no questions, to wait for no explanations, to shoot, to kill. Many times, on turbulent prison days, they have obeyed that order with unerring aim. Convicts call the deadline, the river sticks. From the second-story window of one of the buildings in the prison enclosure, a man looked out through barred windows toward the faraway mountains whose snowy peaks glistened and gleamed in the rays of a setting sun. His face was young and boyish, but his eyes were hard, desperate, and aged, for he was counting the sunsets that still remained to him, just six. Early in the gray dawn of the seventh day, before the sun peeped over the mountains now before his eyes, his life was to be blotted out. Through the partitions in the death house the sound of hammering reached his ears. He shuddered and gripped the window bars more tightly in spite of the years of training that had taught him that there is no dishonor for such as he but weakness and a babbling tongue. He knew the hammers were building the scaffold on which he would stand for a few brief seconds before a sea of morbid, curious, enemy faces until the world ended in sudden blackness. He hoped they would be quick, mercifully quick, when the final moment came, 
for he wished to die with a smile and a jest on his lips, according to the tradition of his kind. He looked at his hands and moved them. He touched his eyes, his lips, and pressed a hand over his heart to feel it beat. Hands, eyes, lips were all a part of him now and responsive to his will. In six days they would all be dead clay, responsive to nothing. And what of the will that controlled them now, that consciousness of self, that awing individuality called I, that has its home in the innermost recesses of the brain, would it too be merely a thing dead and done? Or the snap of bolts turning in heavy locks and the clang of a door in the corridor dragged the mind of the prisoner back to the present. The door of the cell was unlocked, and a guard stepped in, followed by a convict carrying a tray covered with a newspaper. The cushions kid swept a pile of magazines from the one small table, and the convict set the food down. The latter looked toward the condemned man, caught his eye, and then with his back toward the guard, who stood within three feet of them, spoke rapidly in the prison language that makes no sound. Stiff, that is letter, in orange, he said, key in newspaper, page four, column four. The man laid his hand on the paper that covered the dishes and raised it, as if to see whether he had slopped the food about in carrying it. Page four, column four, he repeated. Then he turned and went out. The guard followed him and shot the lock in the cell door. The instant the clanging corridor door informed him he was alone, the cushions kid picked up the orange that lay on the dinner tray and examined it with eager eyes. It was not until he had gone over the entire surface, inch by inch, that he discovered a circle in the skin outlined by an all but imperceptible knife mark. He pried out the inside of the circle and found inside the orange a pellet of paper protected by tin foil. In case of unexpected interruption, he cut up the orange to destroy any evidence that had been tampered with, and smoothed out the paper, his heart beating high with hope of he knew not what. The writing was not Happy's, as he had hoped. It was Boston Blackie's. He recognized the well-remembered chirography at once. This was what he read. Cigarettes have often saved men's lives. Those physicians declare the ash from the burned paper is injurious to the health, as it forms a black deposit on lung tissue or anything else it touches. This easily can be proved. That was all. There was no signature to the cryptic message, but it needed none. Boston Blackie is framing something for me, the kid thought, trembling like a child in the wild joy of newborn hope. With the old chief outside, there's a chance, even for me. He scraped the dinner into his slop bucket. He couldn't eat, but to avoid possible suspicion, it was necessary to get rid of it. Now we'll see what's what, he said. Once more assuring himself that he was alone in the death house, he picked up the newspaper that had covered the food. He turned to the fourth column of the fourth page. It was a column of society notes. Peeling off several of a packet of cigarette papers, the cushions kid touched them with a match and watched them burn to curling crisps of charred ash. He spread the note on the table before him and poured the ashes of the paper on it. We'll see what cigarette papers do to the lungs, blacky old pal, he said, rubbing the ash lightly into the paper. Nothing appeared but a gray smudge. Smiling like a schoolboy bent on mischief, the kid turned the note over. Maybe it's the back of the lungs and letter that are affected by burned cigarette papers, he said to himself as he repeated the operation. His guess was right. As his fingertips gently spread the black ash over the paper, characters outlined in black began to appear. Perfectly scandalous what cigarette papers do to a man's lungs, ain't it, Blackie? He whispered as he worked the ash evenly over the page until its entire surface was a dirty gray on which, outlined in pure black, were long rows of figures. They had been written with oxalic acid mixed with milk, and were absolutely invisible until the fine ash of the paper adhered and turned them black. When the kid's work was done, the first line of Blackie's message looked like this. Two six, eight four, six one, six one. Ten one, nine four, two one, three five, five three, four two, eleven one, seven three, twenty eight, two one. Burning with impatience, the boy turned to the designated column of the paper. The first of Blackie's line of figures was two six. The sixth letter of the second word in the column of type was H. 
The kid jotted it down beneath the figures. Next was 8-4. That proved to be an A. The 6-1, repeated, proved the double P. Then came Y. Happy, repeated the kid, working in an agony of fear. The next word was sends. Thank God she's all right, he breathed with quick relief. Ah, love. Happy sends love. Dear, dear little girl, bright and true always. And good, thoughtful old Blackie, to guess that even now that's what I'd want to know first. He worked on, slowly turning the tiny lines of figures into letters and words. As the words became sentences, his breath came in quick, strained gasps, for Blackie's message outlined a plan of escape that could scarcely fail, barring mishaps. The cushion's kid was told that on the following night he would find a ball of black thread in the banana that would be served with his dinner. He was to weigh the end of the thread and lower it from the window of the death cell after dark. At midnight, the convict runner who delivered hot coffee to the watchtower guards would tie a cord to the slender, invisible thread, and at the end of the cord there would be a package containing a revolver, a gimlet, a fuse and caps, and a bottle of nitroglycerin. Raising the cord with his thread, the kid could pull up this precious package and find himself armed and provided with enough explosive to blow out the window casement of the death cell. With this avenue to freedom open, the drop to the ground would be simple and safe, for in the midnight coffee served the guards on the night set for this escape, there would be enough chloral hydrate to leave them safely unconscious for many hours. The kid was not to try to cross the quarter mile of open ground between the death house and the river, for there was no way of disposing of the night captain and the extra guards in the executive offices. Instead, he was to dodge to the end of the death house, where a steel grating, usually padlocked, covered an air hole into the prison sewer, which led direct to the river and was sufficiently large to permit a man to crawl through it. In place of the iron padlock, he would find a painted wooden one. Through that sewer, the kid was to go to its mouth on the river, where Boston Blackie would be waiting, with the huge steel bars that guarded the exit already open for him. The rest would be easy. They had then only to let the current of the river carry them down as far as the railway bridge, where a track velocipede commandeered from the Folsom section house would be hidden to carry them over the twenty miles of rails to Brighton, the railway junction, from where there was a freight before daylight that if all went well they would ride to the city of Stockton in safety. The plan was flawless. As he comprehended in its entirety the road to freedom that was open to him, the Cushions kid realized what fearful risks had been undertaken in his behalf. He wondered how Blackie had managed to smuggle the gun and liquid dynamite and chloral into the prison. He wondered how he had dared even to visit the prison, for it was apparent he had visited it and secured cooperation from the inside. If he had known that as Blackie in a miner's garb sat in the prison visiting room three days before, he had looked straight at a glaring poster which contained his likeness and an offer of a thousand dollars reward for his arrest, the Cushions kid would have had some idea of the peril which Blackie had faced. If he had seen Blackie in the presence of a guard talking commonplaces to a convict interspersed by inaudible instructions in the lip language, the kid would have had an even clearer idea of what the risks had been. Louisiana had undertaken the task of arranging all details inside the prison, undertaken it without a second's hesitation. Though he knew well he was risking a frightful punishment and additional years of servitude for a man he had never seen, that he was Blackie's friend, however, was enough. Smuggling the arms and explosive into the prison had been a delicate and dangerous task. Waiting until the guards present at this interview with Louisiana were off watch, Blackie had re-entered the prison with a crowd of sightseers. There had been a crucial moment of danger when the guard, before admitting the party, made a perfunctory search of the men for weapons. Had he found the package slung under Blackie's left arm, the adventurer would have culminated then and there in swift disaster. But the guard didn't find the package. A half hour later, as the party passed through the great, noisy, dusty rock quarry of the prison, Blackie lagged behind, picking up and examining pieces of rock as the miner he seemed to be might be expected to do. One boulder was marked, not by chance, with a drilling hammer standing upright. 
Blackie, stooping behind that rock, in one swift motion transferred the package from beneath his arm to an excavation beneath the boulder, and kicked a stone, not there by chance either, into the opening to conceal the contraband. That night, in the comparative safety of Louisiana Slim's cell, were hidden the gun and nitroglycerin, soup, the safe blower's term it, that was to free the condemned man, also chloral for the guard's coffee and a bunch of skeleton keys to release the padlock that barred the sewer entrance. Louisiana and his partner, who had carried the package in from the quarry at a risk of which they were well aware, fondled the weapons that opened the way to possible escape with a longing inconceivable to any but men with many long years of imprisonment before them. The gun, the explosive, the keys, the keeler for the guards in the tower, were in their hands and pointed the way to escape for themselves. Freedom beckoned and was within easy reach. Louisiana Slim and his cell partner stared at each other with glittering eyes that revealed souls tempted almost beyond resistance. At last Louisiana Slim spoke. You just naturally can't be dead, buddy, he said. The kid's facing the rope. If we use these tools for our own selves, he'll swing sure. Any time we stepped into a joint on the outside, the gang would spit on the floor and holler, Coppers in the house, and walk out. And they'd be right. Nix can't be dead. But God Almighty, it's hard. Terrible, terrible hard. Pack the junk up, Slim, whispered his partner, wiping a wet, clammy brow. Separate it and pack it up. I dasn't touch the stuff. I've played the game square for twenty years, but I'm afraid to lay hands near this. During the day, Slim arranged the delivery of Blackie's note to the cell of the condemned man. Then he intercepted Fred the Count, the convict who carried the guard's midnight coffee and was indispensable to Blackie's plan. The Count was a sleek, suave bigamist and forger whose specialty had been making love to trusting women whom he deserted when he had stripped them of their wealth. He was a constant plotter of revolt, and was stamped right among his fellows. Slim asked him to attach the package to the end of the cushion kid's dangling black thread on the following night, and to drop the chloral into the guard's coffee. As the entire night's supply of coffee was to be drugged, suspicion after the escape would not center on the count, though it was obvious he and a dozen others would be subjected to third-degree methods. Slim made no mention of the sewer's part in the plan, nor did he tell from whom the weapons of escape had come. "'I'm with you, Slim,' the Count assured him. "'I go to hell and back, and hang in the sack a week, if necessary, to save a man from being topped. Count on me for my part.' The preparations for the rescue were now complete. With his dinner that night, the Cushions kid received the silent message, "'Tonight at one.'" End of Chapter 5 Six of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Not to Snitch on a Pal. Darkness settled over the penitentiary, and lights winked out from the cell houses. At eight o'clock, one of them, the one that showed in the cell of Louisiana Slim, suddenly went out, then on again, then out and on once more. "'Thank God things have gone as I planned,' cried Blackie, creeping from a hiding place on the crest of the hill behind the prison as the welcome signal caught his eager eyes. In the death cell the kid lay on his bunk, simulating slumber, while his pulses throbbed with excitement and impatience so intense it was a physical pain. A day and night death watch had not been set over him yet, and he was alone. The lights out bell sounded, and the incandescence died out in blackness. The prison settled into slumber. To the boy lying alone in the darkness, with everything staked on a single roll of fate's fickle dice, the dragging minutes of inaction were almost unendurable. The half-hours between the tolling of the prison bell each seemed a lifetime of suspense. But with eleven o'clock at last came the time for action. The condemned boy sprang from his couch at the stroke of the bell and groped in his breast for the ball of thread. 
He tied a stubby piece of pencil to the end of it and lowered it from his window until it rested on the ground. Then he nodded it to one of the bars and crouched in the darkness, waiting. It was nearly an hour. It seemed centuries to the waiting kid, before a quick, furtive step sounded on the gravel beneath the window. The step paused, and the prisoner's finger, laid on the thread where it was fastened to the bar, felt a gentle tug that proved the man below had found its dangling end. There was a second of silence. Then the gravel crunched under footsteps that died away around the corner of the death house. The bell tolled midnight, breaking the stillness with a sudden shock that was like a blow. The cushions kid crept to the window and looked out into the prison yard, lighted by a dozen flaring arc lights. It was deserted, as he knew it would be while the guards were eating. He raised the thread slowly and began to pull it in with infinite caution. Before the cord to which the thread had been tied reached his trembling fingers, the added weight on the tiny string told him the package below was swinging clear of the ground. Meanwhile he was forced to pull the thread over the rough stone of the window ledge, stone that, because of the weight below, threatened to sever it. Would the thread hold? A life, his life, hung swaying in the balance on the end of the inadequate strand of linen. Inch by inch the thread came up. At last the end of the knotted cord appeared over the angle of stone. With that in his hands, the danger was over. The kid rapidly dragged up the package, squeezed it through the bars, and clutched it to his breast. Sudden relief from the mastering strain of the past minutes left him suddenly weak, sick, faint. He dropped down on his bunk, caressing the package with eager fingers as though to convince himself that hope was now reality. From the further end of the corridor a sound reached his ear. He sprang to his feet as stagnation of mind and body fell from him like a discarded cloak. Bolts were thrown in the locks that guarded the death house. Someone was entering. To be found dressed and awake at that hour of the night would be fatal. The cushions kid tossed his package between his blankets, drew them over him, and closed his eyes with a heart heavy with dread. The last door was thrown open noisily, proving that no effort was being made to steal upon him secretly. The prisoner took heart. It was scarcely possible that his package had been seen as he dragged it to the window, and yet a visit at that particular hour was a strange and threatening coincidence. Two men were approaching the cell, talking as they came. "'The leak's up here somewhere,' the kid heard one say. "'Everything's flooded down below and getting worse every minute.' The condemned man felt, rather than spoke, a prayer of thankfulness. They weren't after him or the bundle that nestled in the crook of his knees. He heard the footsteps outside the door of his cell. A flashlight roamed its four corners and came to rest upon his face. This was the crucial instant, the kid felt. He kept his eyes closed and breathed with the deep, even respiration of a sleeper. "'I don't see any loose water around here, but we'd better make sure.' said a voice that the prisoner recognized as the night captain's. A key turned in the lock, and a door creaked on its hinges. "'That's a shame to wake the kid, poor devil. Well, we've got to find that broken pipe before—' The cushion's kid's arms were suddenly seized and pinioned to his sides beneath the blankets. Burly hands caught him by the throat and jerked him from the bunk to the middle of the floor. He tried to fight, to struggle, but it was useless. The blankets were torn from about him. His hands were twisted behind his back, and in an instant, handcuffed and helpless, he looked up in the glare of suddenly lighted electrics and found himself staring with eyes of hate and hopelessness into the grimly smiling faces of the night captain and a guard. "'Come on, boys. We got him trussed up as tight as a drum,' the captain called. And there was a shuffle of padded feet in the corridor as a half-dozen men, some with revolvers and some with short-barreled shotguns, poured into the cell. The captain lifted the blankets, and the package that Boston Blackie and the others had risked so much to put into his hands rolled to the floor. The sight of that precious package in the hands of his enemies stung the cushions kid to furious desperation. Life and liberty were no longer possible, but liberty and a death of his own choosing lay on the floor before him, notwithstanding his manacled hands and watchful captors. In the package on the floor he knew was a bottle of soup, nitroglycerin so refined that any quick jar would explode it. One quick kick, 
and he would die with the knowledge that the grinning enemies about him had died with him in the sudden overturning of their short-lived triumph. He sprang forward and aimed a savage blow at the bundle, even as one of the men stooped to pick it up. Myriads of colored lights flashed through his brain, then came blackness. The cushion's kid slowly won his way back to consciousness with a growing surprise that he was not in another world. Peering down at him were the hated faces of the night captain and the warden of the prison. His hands were still manacled. He was still in his cell. "'What happened?' he asked feebly. "'Your intentions were all right, kid,' the captain remarked. "'But my smash to your jaw made your aim bad, which explains why any of us are here.' The cushions kid sat up, sullen and silent and inexpressibly hopeless. He had failed again. Nothing awaited him now but the death decreed by law. With difficulty he choked back a cry of despair. That strangled cry encouraged the warden to begin the work for which he had come. "'Well, boy,' he began with an obvious attempt at kind intimacy, "'you took a long chance and lost. I can't blame you. But you never really had a chance. You might have blown your way out of this place, yes. But after you were in the yard, what then? You would have been shot down before you had gone a dozen steps. You owe us something for saving your life, even if it is only for a few days. The kid eyed him narrowly. Evidently he didn't know of the part the sewer leading to the river played in Boston Blackie's plans, nor of Boston Blackie either though it was perfectly evident that there had been treachery by someone Blackie had been forced to trust. The thought that Blackie even now was waiting at the other end of that sewer forced upon him the necessity of diverting any suspicion in that direction. "'If I had made it to the yard, I'd have shown your gun screw some fancy shooting,' he said with apparent frankness. "'Once on the ground, I'd have walked out from under their rifles.' Of course, your friend on the outside is waiting somewhere just over the deadline for you now, the warden said interrogatively, but you never would have lived to reach him. I haven't anyone on the outside, said the boy shortly. I suppose you want me to think that gun and dynamite just grew on the end of that black thread you had out your window. The warden unwittingly had given proof of the treachery that the cushion's kid suspected. It was conceivable, but not probable that some guard might have seen the package being pulled to the window, but it was absolutely impossible that in the dark anyone could have seen the black thread. Knowledge of that proved definite information. It doesn't make any difference now, but I'm curious to know how that gun got hooked on to the end of your line, the warden continued ingratiatingly. It wasn't there before dark. I'm curious to know the name of the yellow-hearted snitch that tipped you it was there. No one snitched. A guard just happened to see you pulling it in, the warden hastened to assure him. Well, then, no one put it there. It just grew out of the gravel, gravely asserted the condemned boy. The warden saw he was accomplishing nothing and changed his tactics. He crossed to the bunk, sat down, and laid his hand on the kid's knee. Boy, he said, I'm going to quit beating around the bush and talk straight. I want to know how that stuff got into this prison. I want to know who handled it after it got into the prison. You could tell me. Nothing doing, warden. Wait. I haven't finished. You're going to hang in just four days. Just four days, boy. It isn't pleasant to dangle at the end of six feet of rope. It isn't pleasant to lie in a cell for four days knowing that you're going to dangle. Nothing and no one can save you, boy. And then after a long pause, unless I do, I'm going to Sacramento tomorrow. I'm going to see the governor. If I were able to tell him that you aided me in uncovering the men who seemed to mistake this place for an arsenal, he might decide to give you a commutation. Do you get me? Nothing doing. Suppose I were to call the governor up and he were to tell me he would grant a commutation under the conditions I have suggested. What then? Listen, warden, the cushions kid turned and looked the official squarely in the eye. If you were going to hang me in five minutes, 
and the governor stood where you are now with a full pardon in his hand and offered it to me to snitch on the men who had taken a chance to help me, I'd hang. Hang with my mouth shut. That's final. Let's cut the foolish chatter. The boy's eyes were as convincing as his words. You'll hang all right, you fool, the warden cried, jumping to his feet. Set a death watch over him now, he added, turning to the night captain. Keep his cell lighted, and a man sitting in front of his door, watching him day and night. Four days isn't long. He won't be so cocky when the time comes to stand on the trap. When they were out of hearing, the warden turned to the captain, fuming and fussing because of the narrow escape from a break that would have been hard to explain with credit to the discipline of his prison. "'Will that young fool weaken and talk when his time comes?' he asked. "'No,' replied the officer. "'I knew from the first he wouldn't squeal. "'Men able to have and hold friends who would take the desperate chances that were taken for him never squeal. "'They haven't got it in them. "'Has the Count told you all he knows, do you think?' "'He has told us all he's going to. All it's safe for him to know.' I think he handled that package himself. But if he admitted that, he'd have to tell us from whom he got it. And if he did, the captain motioned as though his throat were being cut, he'd do his time quicker than the kid up there in the death house with four days to live. Back in that death cell, a boy, alone for a few brief minutes before the arrival of the death watch, flung himself on his face and let an overburdened heart find the natural human outlet for hopeless grief. The cynical bravado with which he had calmly refused the gift of life was gone. But now for a brief moment he could be just himself, a sobbing, frightened boy, facing a certain and terrible death without a kind word or a friendly face to strengthen his shrinking spirit for the greatest of all ordeals. End of chapter 6 of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Woman Called Rita Spanish Mickey, proprietor of a poker game that enabled him to live in easy affluence on the earnings of the ill-paid guards at the penitentiary, lolled on a couch in his specially furnished room in Folsom Town's one hotel, indolently tinting and polishing the nails of slender fingers, soft and white as a woman's. Across the room, before a dressing table that had cost more than any of Mickey's patrons earned from the state in a month, sat Rita the Queen, present partner of the good fortunes that had given Spanish Mickey the one gambling game within reach of an institution with a $10,000 monthly payroll. Rita was using a lipstick and an eyebrow pencil with experienced fingers. A first glimpse at the pair indicated that Spanish Mickey and Rita the Queen were eminently suited to make each other deliriously happy and maddeningly miserable in an endless and delightful succession of emotional tides. Once it had been so. Once love, passionate jealousy, and furious anger had alternated in making their life a daily drama worth living, a drama the swift changes of which left no time for ennui. Gradually, however, Mickey became secure and satisfied in undisputed possession, and their life had become one of humdrum monotony. Rita watched Mickey for a second in her mirror, made a grimace of impatient disdain, and returned to her eyebrow pencil with a sigh of utter soul weariness. She was tired of Folsom, tired of the once-loved man who kept her there, tired of idle, purposeless days without adventure or excitement. I solved the secret of the mystery man, Rita. Spanish Mickey's voice was vibrant with satisfaction as it broke the woman's reverie. Yes. There was interest and curiosity in the inflection. He's the fellow who framed the getaway a night before last for the guy they're going to hang at the prison Friday. It would have gone through, you know, if a con hadn't tipped the game off. But that ain't all. This fellow who framed the break wasn't done when his first play went wrong. He's been sitting late into the poker game every night and taking pains to make friends with the prison guards. 
Larry Donovan, who's on duty in the death house after midnight, was in the game and blew his paycheck as usual. He tried to touch me for a twenty. Nothing doing, of course. He sure has the card fever bad. He tried to borrow all around the table and was turned down. Nobody but me having checks to spare. Well, he was running around crazy mad to play again when someone says, after he tries to peddle his watch, Go on out, Larry, and peddle a prison, why don't you? You'll be able to sit in for a whole hour then. I'd peddle a prison and everything in it for enough checks to keep me in the game till my luck changes, he says, and he meant it. I caught the stranger looking at him watchful-like, and right then I had my suspicions. Larry finally goes out to try and make a touch from Dutch, the saloon man. He's no sooner out the door than the mystery man says he's tired and cashes in. Spanish Mickey stopped, rolled a cigarette with one hand, and struck a match with the other. "'Go on, go on. What happened then?' cried Rita, her black eyes flashing with excitement and deep interest. "'The stranger goes out,' Mickey continued languidly. Half an hour later, Larry Donovan comes back with money. He's still playing when it comes time for him to leave the go-on watch outside the death cell. You get me, Rita? On watch in the death house, with the stranger's dough in his jeans. Mickey stopped as though his tale were ended. Rita's cheeks were flushed with a tint that isn't bought in boxes, and her eyes were dark, seething pools of emotion. Here at last was what her nature craved, excitement danger, a last hour and desperate attempt to save a man already within the shadow of the scaffold. "'And there'll be an escape tonight?' she questioned, lowering her voice. "'No, there won't be any escape tonight,' Mickey answered between puffs of smoke. "'I don't know where the stranger is, but I know where he will be, behind bars, inside, looking out, for him.' He hesitated in momentary indecision as to the advisability of further revelations. Then he continued, "'Listen, Rita, you stick around here tonight and keep your eyes open and you'll see a real rumpus. Your old man Mickey has pulled some wise inside stuff, kid. After Larry left last night, I called up the warden and told him what I'd seen. I've been looking for a chance to do him a good turn ever since the town knockers began to howl about my games keeping the boys from the stir from paying their bills. I told him to call Larry Donovan into his office and throw a scare into him and he'd find out something he wants to know.' The warden did it, and Larry spit up everything. He was to get five thousand dollars in cash to let this fellow Grimes, that, that's the one they're going to hang Friday, tie him up in the death house tonight and cop his keys. The stranger showed him the real money, and Larry, thinking how many poker checks he could buy with that, agreed to stand for the getaway. But there won't be any getaway for Jimmy Grimes or his friend either. For when Mr. Mann shows up here tonight, the warden's going to grab him and his five thousand dollars. Planning a jailbreak calls for from five to forty years in this state. Smart stranger might as well pick out a cell up at the big house right now. And meantime, Spanish Mickey and the warden are pals. Fine time the knockers will have getting him to bar the boys from my game now, eh, kid? If this mystery guy carries a gun, and I've got a hunch he does, there's a lot to be lead flying tonight, for he's nervy. If Spanish Mickey had been as experienced in reading a woman's mind as he was in reading a deck of cards, he wouldn't have finished his revelation with a smile of satisfaction with which he now turned to receive Rita's commendation. He failed utterly to interpret aright what he saw in the girl's face. He thought it was frightened concern for his safety. Really, it was disgust, hatred born of a dead passion, an adventurous resolve. Don't worry, kid. I won't get hurt, he said, putting on his coat and hat. You'll have to eat alone tonight, unless the doings are over before dinner time, for I'm going to stay down in the poker rooms where the warden's six gunmen are hiding until this bird shows up. So long, babe. And I took that thing for my man, the woman exclaimed with a vicious look at the door through which Mickey had vanished. A copper-hearted rat who ought to be wearing a star in a blue uniform. What a fool I've been to waste six months with him. Rita wrinkled her brow into a sudden frown. Who knows, she said, answering the unspoken question in her mind. Stranger things have happened. And he's class, that's sure. Or he wouldn't be taking this kind of chance for a pal in the death cell. Rita dressed for a tramp, picked up a fishing rod, and slung a creel over her shoulder. 
At the door, she turned back and took a revolver and a box of cartridges from Spanish Mickey's trunk. Then she went downstairs and sent the clerk to the hotel kitchen for a box of sandwiches. The Folsom house hadn't discovered bellboys yet. All prepared now for the project in her mind, she swung down the dusty road that led to the river and, incidentally, the prison. Rita reached neither the river nor the penitentiary. At the fork of the roads, a mile from town, she selected a grassy slope behind a boulder and sat down to wait for the coming of the man who monopolized her thoughts, though she didn't know his name and had spoken to him but once. But Mickey's tale had placed this man as one of the lawless legion who were the heroes of the life she craved, and Rita, being Rita, had no conventions to stay her pretty hand from reaching forth to grasp what it coveted. At last he came, a dark shadow slipping quietly along the road well after sunset. She rose from the grassy slope almost at his feet to find a gun against her breast before she could speak. "'It's Rita! Put up your gun!' she cried. An electric flashlight flared in her face. Then it carefully sought out with its beam of light every place of concealment about them. "'I'm alone. You have nothing to fear from me.' I've been waiting here all afternoon for you to come. She thrilled with the joy of that moment. Well, what do you want? Blackie snapped out with scant courtesy. I don't want anything, Rita said with careful inflection. But you do. You want to know, for instance, that in the room behind Spanish Mickey's joint, there are six gunmen from the prison waiting for you right now. You— What? cried Blackie. Are you sure? I am. Mickey was suspicious last night when Larry Donovan, the death house guard, came back into the poker game with money after you followed him out. He— I told the lying fool he mustn't go back, and he swore he wouldn't. That's a square shooter for you. Go on. Mickey phoned the warden and told him what he suspected. The warden called Larry in today and sweated him. You know the answer to that. Blackie swore viciously. Come over here and we'll sit down while I think this business out, he said, taking her by the arm and helping her down the bank to her former position by the roadside. I'm thankful for this service, Rita, very thankful, but I don't quite understand yet why you're here. You're Spanish Mickey's girl, aren't you? I was, but I'm done. No man can do what he did last night and say that Rita belongs to him. I've been taught to hate coppers. If I can't have a man, a real man, I'll live alone the rest of my life." Blackie suddenly turned his flashlight full into her face and studied her in silence. She flushed like a young girl. "'You believe me, don't you? You trust me? You can. Every drop of blood in me is right.' The girl leaned toward him and clasped his arm with both her hands. "'Yes, I trust you,' Blackie answered unhesitatingly. "'I'll not forget what you have done for me tonight, either. It is because I knew you won't that I did it." A slight pressure on his arm gave added meaning to her words. "'You can't go back into the town. What are you going to do?' she asked after a pause. "'Are you absolutely sure Donovan won't be on duty in the death house tonight?' Blackie demanded. "'Absolutely.' "'And the kid has only one more night to live. Well, I'll stick and keep trying to the end. While he still lives, there's a chance. You're going to stay now, even when you know you are discovered, know they are looking for you? Hero worship intoned every word. Sure. Something may happen. You can never tell till you try. Well, Rita, I've got to lie out in the hills tonight, and you've got to get back to town or you'll be missed if you haven't been already. Goodbye. When this business is over, I'll send you our address, and if you're ever in a tight place and need help, you'll get it if you call on me. The girl noted the plural hour with a quick tightening of the lips, but no surprise. That hour means his girl, she thought, as Blackie rose and helped her to her feet. I expected that. Such a man as this doesn't travel alone. But she'll have to be some girl to be more attractive and useful to him than I'm going to be, especially more useful. I knew you'd be hungry, so I brought you something to eat, she said. Also a gun and an extra box of cartridges, she added as she handed the articles over. You may need them before you're safely out of this. 
Do you know where the little log cabin is, in the clump of woods just below the rail bridge over the river? Yes. It belongs to Mickey, and here's the key. You'll find an oil stove, coffee, and blankets inside. Mickey is homesteading the land and has to sleep there once in a while. It will be safe and comfortable for you. You couldn't risk making a fire in the open, for they'll be combing the country for you before morning. I'll come at three tomorrow with a basket of food and all the news there is. Then you can plan your getaway. You'll meet me? I certainly will, little girl, Blackie assured her with more warmth in his voice. He was astonished at the complete efficiency of her forethought. I don't understand why you have done all this for me, a stranger, but I want you to know I'm grateful from the bottom of my heart, and I never forget a friend or a favor. Maybe you'll understand better after you think it over, Rita answered. Good night, and do be careful, after a second's hesitation. Dear. Good night. Blackie slipped away in the darkness, refusing to recognize the revelation in the girl's final word. End of chapter 7 Of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Miracle Boston Blackie drank Spanish Mickey's coffee and ate Rita's sandwiches in pitch darkness. He did not think it prudent to light the lantern he found in the cabin. Then he rolled a cigarette and concentrated his acute brain upon the Herculean problem before him. For only thirty-six hours of life remained now to the cushion's kid. The more deeply Blackie studied and analyzed the situation, the more hopeless it appeared. His first plan of escape had offered every chance of success, but a traitor had wrecked it. Spanish Mickey had frustrated his second effort, a desperate expedient born of desperate necessity, and roused the prison authorities to double precaution both by day and by night. And now, what? An hour later, Boston Blackie slipped out of the cabin and picked his way silently through the brush and boulders to a point that jutted out into the river above the mouth of the prison sewer, which from the first had been the key of his plans. He was thankful that the unknown traitor within the prison had not been able to reveal that, too. He swam the river noiselessly and landed safely in the shadow of the underground causeway that led to the very foundations of the death house. Two bars of the great iron grating that protected its mouth were sawed. He had attended to that on the night of the first attempt, when he had lain until dawn beside the sewer, waiting for the boy who never came. Blackie pushed the bars aside, entered the sewer, and crawled forward on hands and knees into Stygian blackness. On and on he went, through air that was foul and gas-laden. He lost all sense of time and distance. His hands and knees were bruised and bleeding. The darkness seemed like a blanket that wrapped itself about him and hindered his progress, and the moldy, damp underground odor made him think instinctively of a grave. He kept on interminably, and at last a faintly diffused glow broke through the wall of blackness. The air grew fresher, and his reeling senses cleared. He was under the manhole beside the death house. Kneeling under the grating that covered the manhole, Blackie felt for the guns and the bottle of nitro he carried in his breast pocket. Then he pressed upward on the grating. It creaked, but held fast. He pressed harder, and still harder without result. Finally he threw his whole strength again and again against the crisscrossed steel covering that held him in. It did not budge. Once again chance had intervened to balk him. Not two hours before, a convict employed by the night kitchen had slipped from his post and put back the iron padlock for which Louisiana Slim had substituted a painted wooden one. Believing Blackie must have abandoned all hope of effecting a rescue, Louisiana had ordered this done. It was a final, crushing blow. Fate played too strong a hand for the man crouching below the immovable grating, and almost sobbing, in an agony of despair. He scarcely remembered how he made his weary way back through the tunnel, how he swam the river, how he stumbled back to the cabin and threw himself weakly on a bunk, where he lay through the long night, haunted by the vision of a boy standing on a scaffold, with a black cap being drawn slowly down over his frightened face. 
It was scarcely noon the next day when Blackie, gaunt and haggard from exhaustion and seventy-two sleepless hours, heard a motor car come to a stop on the little-used woodland road that ran along the top of the ridge above the cabin. He slipped out of the log house and into the concealment of a thicket and unslung his guns. He even hoped the motor contained a posse come to attack his refuge. Anything was better than the maddening ordeal of lying idle and impotent while his watch ticked away the few remaining hours of life left to the boy he had failed to rescue. A twig snapped on the trail above the cabin, and he saw Rita hurrying toward him with the lithe, swift, graceful movements of a forest animal. A leopard, beautiful but dangerous to any but those she might choose to call her own. She was dressed for city motoring rather than woods tramping, and she carried a suitcase. He called to her, and she rushed to him with a half-stifled cry of welcome and gladness. "'Oh, Blackie!' she cried, dropping on her knees beside him. "'I'm so thankful you're here now. I was deathly afraid you'd be off somewhere and I'd have to wait. We've got to get away from here quick. They know who you are up at the prison, and that there's a thousand-dollar reward for your capture. Mickey recognized your picture this morning on one of the posters in the warden's office. They've found the sawed bars at the entrance of the sewer.' As soon as they can gather the men, the whole country will be out to hunt you down. Blackie leaped to his feet, and Rita threw open the suitcase. I've brought you clothes, a hat, auto goggles, all Mickeys, she continued. Dress quickly, dear. The term fell from her lips quite naturally this time. I'm going to carry you away from under their noses. And, Mr. Boston Blackie, she stepped close to him and looked straight into his face to judge the effect of her words. Whether Mary likes it or not, you're going to take a nice long auto drive with another girl, with me. How did you know about Mary? he asked. Read about her and you in the paper when the coppers wanted you, stupid, she answered. The second I knew you were Boston Blackie, I knew all about you. I have friends in Frisco who know you and have often told me what a wonder you are. I'm glad I didn't know it at first, though. If I had, you might think I fell for you because you are Boston Blackie. Now you will always know that that wasn't the reason. It was just because you are you. For once Blackie's ready tongue was bereft of words. He stood looking down at her dumbly while a premonition of impending difficulty shaped itself in his mind. Her laugh broke the silence. Dress, Blackie, she cried. Don't stand staring at me like that. Wait till we are in the car and speeding toward Sacramento and safety. Then you're welcome to stare as long as you like. "'Will you drive or shall I?' she asked, when they stood beside a high-powered roadster ten minutes later. "'You drive. I want to think.' "'Of me? If so, I'll drive you round the world and back.' "'No, Rita, of the boy we're leaving behind us in the death cell at the stir. A boy won't be a boy this time tomorrow, unless a miracle happens. I came up here to save him, and I've failed, failed, where I would give everything I have or ever will have to succeed.' You've done everything a right pal could do, and more, Blackie," Rita answered, dropping her battering spirit for one of deep, comforting sympathy. You've risked your life again and again, and you would have had him out now if it had not been for a couple of human rats. When your pal dies, Blackie, it won't be because you failed him. He mustn't die, girl. Blackie's teeth snapped with undying resolution. He isn't even guilty. He's hanging because he's too right to squeal on a yellow-hearted pal. And unless a miracle saves him, he'll die in the morning. The one last chance is the governor, and that's not even a chance, for he's already turned down a commutation. Blackie was silent as Rita guided the car out of the twisting hill road into the broad highway that leads to the state capitol. I'm going to Abe Ritter, the lawyer, he continued after a long pause. He's a politician, and he likes money. He's close to old Tom Creedon, political boss of Frisco. Creedon elected this governor. I'm going to offer Ritter five thousand dollars, more if he asks us, to get Creedon to go to the governor for the kid. Creedon could save him if he would, but, well, he's cold-blooded as a fish, and he doesn't need money. I can only pay Ritter to try, and if he fails, it's the end. Blackie's face was anguish itself as Rita turned her eyes to his. You care very, very much to save this boy, don't you, dear? You'd give anything in the world to do it, wouldn't you? 
Anything and everything, Rita. He's almost like a son to me. Many minutes passed, and the glistening dome of the capital was in sight above the intervening woodland before either spoke. What kind of girl is Mary? asked Rita suddenly. The best in the world. Faithful, true, right in every drop of her blood. A sudden contraction as of pain passed over the girl's face. I saw her picture in the paper, she said slowly. She's pretty, but not prettier than I am when I wish to be for a man I care for. She can't be more loyal than I, if I care. Mary couldn't have served you better than I have when you needed me, could she, Blackie? You did everything any woman could have done, Rita. They would have got me if it hadn't been for you. Well, then, she turned to him with eyes from which the hardness had vanished. Is there a chance for me or not? Her eyes held his unswervingly as she waited for her answer. Blackie did not dodge the issue or pretend to misunderstand. I have Mary, he said. We've been together in good times and bad, and she has never failed in love or loyalty. I'd hate to be what I would be if I gave her less than that. Ah, oh, so it's like that with you. The girl turned from him quickly, and the car shot forward as her foot pressed the accelerator. I wonder if Mary knows what a lucky, lucky girl she is, Rita said after a long pause. She sat beside him in silence until the car glided into the city and he directed her to the lawyer's office. I'll wait for you. We'll have dinner together? She questioned as he climbed out of the car. Blackie nodded acquiescence and disappeared. He returned to find a Rita who had cast off the somber mood in which he had left her. What luck and where to? She queried as he climbed in beside her. To Carrie's. Ritter is going to phone me there. There isn't much hope. Creedon's our only chance. Ritter is going to see him at once, but he doesn't expect good news. I'm afraid the end has come, Rita. Halfway through the dinner, she suddenly dropped the jesting mood with which she had tried to help him escape the agonizing anxiety that weighed his mind, and leaned across the table toward him. Blackie, she said, I'm done at Folsom. I'm never going back. All my life I have wanted a man like you. Can't you find one little vacant corner in your heart for me? Very little will make me very happy. I don't ask much. I don't ask Mary's place. I just want to be near enough to you to see you sometimes. Will you let me? Blackie shook his head. He could not lie to her. It's no use, he said. It can't be. Rita stood up, walked around the table to Blackie, and laid her arm on his shoulder. I never knew before there were men like you, she said softly with a quickly choked sob. I wish I had sooner. The waiter's discreet rap on the door summoned Blackie to the phone. His face, when he returned, told his news before he spoke. Nothing doing, he said. The last hope is gone. Oh, my dearest, I'm so sorry, she cried. Sorrier than you will know. Will you drive me to the train, he asked. I must get back to Frisco before this happens at the prison, and try to break it somehow to a little woman I left on her knees, praying for the kid's life. I don't know how to tell her. It would be easier to go along with the kid. They rode in silence to the station, and Blackie climbed from the car too distraught for words of any kind. "'Aren't you going to give me your address?' Rita asked. "'You promised to, in case I should need you sometime.' He penciled it on a slip of paper and handed it to her. As the girl took it, she caught his hand between both hers with a pressure that made delicate knuckles show white beneath her skin. "'Anyway,' she whispered, there's one comfort that she can't take from me. I've served you as well as she could. 
I always will serve you, no matter what it costs me. You'll see. And besides, her voice was hard and ruthless again, if I had known you first, not Mary or a thousand Marys could take you from me. She's luckier than I, that's all. Goodbye, Blackie. It was early morning, the morning of the execution, when Boston Blackie left the owl car that had carried him from the ferry and came to the flat where Mary and Happy had their refuge. It took all his resolution to force himself to enter and softly climb the stairs. There was no rush from within as he knocked, no door flung frantically open, no faces within, frenzied with grief, to read the death verdict in his face even before he spoke. He rapped again, and then a new fear spurring him on unlocked the door and entered, though he realized he might be walking into a police trap. He half hoped he was. A swift turn of his flashlight showed him the room was empty. He sat down wearily to wait. The door below opened and closed, and light running steps came flying up the stairway. Blackie rose to his feet and switched on the lights. It had come, the moment when he must kill a woman's heart as surely as they were killing the cushion's kid even now. The door flew open, and two women came rushing in. As they saw him, both flung themselves into his arms, showering him impartially with kisses and incoherent cries and sobs of wild rapture. "'Oh, Blackie, Blackie, how did you do it? How did you do it?' cried Happy when at last the power of articulation returned. "'My boy is going to live, live, live!' In a wildly trembling hand she waved the newspaper she held. "'It's a miracle! It's the miracle I've prayed for!' Blackie snatched the paper from her hand as she sank on her knees, vainly trying to put into words the prayer of thankfulness that came straight from her heart. He could scarcely believe his eyes as Mary's shaking finger directed him to a telegraph dispatch tucked away in an obscure corner. He read, Folsom Prison, October 13. At midnight, a telephone message from Governor Nelson announced the commutation to life imprisonment of the sentence of death against James Grimes, youthful train robber, who was to have been executed at dawn this morning. It is understood newly discovered evidence convinced the governor there is some doubt of the prisoner's actual guilt of the murder of which he was convicted. All preparations for the execution were complete when the reprieve reached the prison, no previous intimation that it was to be expected having reached Warden Hodgkins. Grimes was at once taken from the death cell and lodged with the other prisoners. "'It is a miracle,' cried Blackie as he comprehended the meaning of the lines. "'Mary!' happy. I didn't do this. I didn't even know of it. When I left Sacramento at nightfall, the last hope was gone. What? cried Happy and Mary together. It's true, Blackie continued. I was waiting here to tell you everything was over. Three times I framed an escape for him, and each time a last-minute freak of fate stopped it. I tried to reach the governor through Boss Creedon, and that failed. I came back beaten, and find this. He pointed tremblingly at the few printed lines that had created a new world for four human beings. "'Mary, it is a God-sent miracle,' he concluded in an odd voice. He dropped into a chair with the two women crouching at his knees and told them all that had happened at Folsom. When he had finished, they were staring at him with odd eyes and blank, wondering faces. "'It doesn't matter how it happened,' Happy exclaimed at last. "'My boy is safe.' that is all i want to know every night as long as i live i shall thank the good god on my knees for this and tonight i'm going back to the spiders to begin to earn the money to get my boy a full pardon some day the child woman was radiantly happy that there could be any incongruity in kneeling nightly in a prayer of thankfulness after selling drinks at the spiders for the sake of the man so marvelously restored to her that never entered her mind. Perhaps it wasn't incongruous. Who shall say? Blackie was asleep that afternoon when the woman from whom they rented their flat climbed the stairs to hand Mary a letter addressed to her in a feminine hand. She opened it and read. Then she awakened her husband. This letter was addressed to me, Blackie dear, she said but after reading it I am convinced it is meant for you." Blackie roused himself and took it from her. 
Mary stood beside him, looking up into his face with a slyly, quizzical smile. This is what he read. Thursday night. My dearest. Mary won't mind my calling you that, I hope, for it's true. You know by now your friend is saved. As I write, the reprieve has been phoned to the prison. I hope you are happy as you read this, dearest. I am as I write it. Do you remember what I said in the restaurant this afternoon? I said I would do more to serve you, risk more to serve you, sacrifice more to serve you than you know. I'm going to prove that, Blackie dear, tonight. You said this afternoon that Tom Creedon was your pal's last hope. Your lawyer failed with him. Well, Blackie, I know Tom Creedon, too. I met him in Frisco before I went to Folsom, and he fell for me. He's past fifty, but he tries to turn the clock back thirty years when he's with a woman, a pretty one like me. I laughed at him in Frisco. After you left me at the train, I phoned him, and he came rushing to me as I knew he would. I told him what I wanted. He objected, denied he could handle the governor, and tried to stall. But in the end he gave in, as men like him always do to a woman. And so, dearest, I have given you what you said you wanted more than anything on earth, the life of your pal. Creedon is waiting. I have slipped away for a moment to write this. I am glad and happy, Blackie dear. Are you? Could Mary do more for you than I am doing? Your answer is my reward, my only one now. Adieu, my dearest. Yours always. Rita. What a woman! exclaimed Blackie, with a husky catch in his voice. He looked up at Mary, still staring down at him with a twisty little smile on her lips. But why did she address this letter to you? I don't understand that. I know. Any woman would know. Mary sat on his knee and drew his head toward her. Because she wanted to be quite sure I would see it. And having seen it, if I were foolish and jealous and distrustful like some women, I might quarrel and fuss with you and give her in the end the man she wants, you. But I do trust you, and I'm not foolish, and so, a long pause, she won't get you. She kissed him with a wry little smile still on her pretty lips. End of chapter 8of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fred the Count The day toward which all imprisoned creatures measure time, the day of freedom, had come to Fred the Count. Prison doors opened, and he passed out, jubilant in the intoxicating consciousness of liberty. The vain attempt to keep on good terms with two wives and the law at the same time had cost him five years in stripes, five years that would have been seven had he not shortened his time at the expense of fellow convicts. Like everything within the realm of human desire, the Count's short cut to liberty had a price tag attached. Ostracism and hatred, bitter and revengeful, beyond the conception of the outside world, were the cost of his officially reduced sentence. But as he stepped through the double gates of Folsom Penitentiary and found the world of free men with all its beckoning allurements once more open to him, he felt he had bought cheaply. He had not always been so certain of this. There had been many months during which the Count, with fear in his heart, had been forced to compute his chances of living to enjoy the liberty for which others had paid with their lives. Two over-trustful convicts with whom he had planned a feasible scheme of escape had slipped from their cells at midnight to be shot to death on the threshold by hidden gun guards. When a second break, in which the Count was the leading spirit, ended in swift disaster for all but himself, his comrades in stripes began to suspect and watch him. 
But for a time, the bigamist's suave, plausible tongue lulled suspicion. Then came the betrayal of Blackie's plan to free the cushion's kid from the death cell on the eve of his execution. The kid, as the whole convict world knew, was facing death for the sake of the code that had prohibited him from naming the pal for whose act he had been sentenced. The condemned boy was seized in his cell with a means of escape in his hands. The next day the convict colony knew that within it was one willing to barter a comrade's life for his own petty gain. The elimination, one by one, of those in the betrayed secret definitely fastened responsibility on the Count. From that moment he was a man condemned to death by the prison world in which he lived. With timely intuition he sensed the verdict against him and induced the warden to assign him to duties that kept him well out of reach of the knives which day after day patiently awaited their opportunity beneath a dozen striped shirts. Though the Count lived for months in an endless nightmare of dread, the hidden knives never found the target of flesh that feared them so. And now he was free. His transient regret at the treachery that had endangered his own life slipped from his shoulders as easily as the convict suit he joyously changed for civilian clothes. Remorse he had never felt. Being safe now, he rejoiced wholeheartedly in the unfair bargain by which he profited. Unalloyed contentment was in his heart as he strode down the hill toward the town and the railway. At the foot of the grade a sharp turn revealed the prison cemetery, weed-grown, unkempt, and dotted with wooden headboards. The names on two, close to the fence, caught his eye. There, side by side, lay the trustful pair he had betrayed to their death, with the grass growing green and strong above their graves. No tremor of fear or regret lessened the Count's buoyant spirit as he noted this. No man need fear the dead, he thought. And as for conscience, that, to him, was a superfluous something which bothers only women and fools. Fools like those left behind in stripes. Fools like those past whose moldering bodies he was hurrying back to life and gaiety and all the joys of freedom. If there is some good in even the worst of men, as sociologists assert, the Count as a boy must have been kind to his mother. At the railway station the Count's wary and experienced eye noted with quick gratification that no one who might have a star beneath his coat was waiting for him, as there might have been, for there were many incidents in a bigamist's long career that were not purged by his sentence for victimizing two trustful women who had more money and credulity than discernment. Time, however, which mollifies and ameliorates everything, even the law, had served him well and he found no one on the station platform but a young girl. Admiringly, appraisingly, he noted the trim, childish figure and pretty face, clouded by something difficult to interpret. He always eyed women. They interested him to the same extent, and in precisely the same way, the stock ticker interests Wall Street speculators, as the obviously easy and only natural avenue to wealth. Their weaknesses, their foibles and follies, even their virtues, were as water turning a mill-wheel that poured the grist of luxury into his ruthless and covetous hands. As he noted the unpretentious dress and unadorned fingers of the girl, his interest died. A pretty little Cinderella without any fairy godmother, he thought, and straightway he forgot her. Other things being equal, the Count preferred youth and beauty but all was beauty backed by a checkbook. When the train came, the Count settled himself and forgot even his newborn liberty and the joy of planning the quick turn he intended to make in the crooked money market. Behind him rode the girl of the station platform, a girl whose childish face, now that she was safe from his observation, was marred by resolute, immutable hatred, hatred consciously righteous and of the sort that never lessens or dies. Could the Count have known the girl was on that train only because he was, and that the sight and thought of him alone had so altered her sweetly girlish beauty, he would have realized that the hatreds and dangers he thought so safely shackled in the prison behind him had followed him out into the world, and were dogging him now, step by step, with implacable, ominous resolution. That night Fred the Count, ex-convict, 
landed at the San Francisco ferry and dived like a rabbit to its warren into the sheltering purlieu of the city. A week later, at a fashionable hotel, there appeared in his stead Sir Harry Westwood Cameron, English gentleman, apparently of unlimited leisure and wealth, but whose wardrobe seemed surprisingly new for a man whose luggage indicated an extensive tour. Sir Harry, it is only fair to accord him the privilege of the name he chose after a careful study of Burke's peerage, lay in his suite reading and rereading a trivial item in the morning's paper. It announced the arrival in San Francisco of Sir Arthur Cavanus of London on a secret mission supposed to involve the purchase of vast quantities of war supplies for the British government. He had been the guest of honor at a banquet given by the British consul. Beside this item, Sir Harry laid another clipped from the same paper. It related the fact that Miss Bettina Gerard, daughter of Sherwood Gerard, pioneer Mendocino lumberman, had celebrated her eighteenth birthday with a dance at which the countryside fox-trotted and one-stepped on the waxed stump of a single giant redwood tree. The paragraph added that Miss Gerard was the sole heiress of her father, owner of the largest tract of uncut redwood in the state. For a full hour Sir Harry, with mind keyed to its highest pitch of concentration, conned the possibilities for him contained in the two bits of news. Then he rose, bowed to his reflection in the mirror, and went down to dinner, satisfied with himself and the world. During the next three days Sir Harry made a number of preparations with business-like dispatch. First he wrote a letter to the British consul, omitting the sir from his signature, stating that he was an Englishman desiring to enlist and asking instructions. He got them, of course, by return mail on consulate stationery and over the consul's signature. Then, after nightfall, he visited a dirty, dilapidated little print shop located in a single room in an alley near Chinatown. The sole occupant of the place was a misshapen little man lying on a couch in a frowsy dressing gown. To him, evidently an old acquaintance from their greeting, Sir Harry showed the consulate letter and asked for duplicate stationery and a sheaf of checks bearing the same identifying insignia. "'I'll be ready tomorrow night, Fred,' the little old man wheezed after examining the sample with a microscope. "'And the charge to you will be twenty dollars, which I'll take now.' Twenty dollars? That's robbery!' remonstrated Sir Harry angrily. "'No, no, Fred, no robbery about it,' chuckled the hunchback. "'I charge one dollar for doing the work, and nineteen for forgetting I did it. Cheap enough, when you think it over, ain't it?' Sir Harry handed him a twenty-dollar bill. When he received the papers ordered from the print shop, he bought a plate of glass, cut to fit inside one of his suitcases, and an electric light extension cord. Then he locked himself in his room and drew down the curtains. On the bottom of the glass he carefully pasted the genuine letter received from the British consul. Next he laid the glass across the top of his open suitcase with a lighted incandescent beneath it. On the top of the glass he laid, one after another, a series of letters he had personally typed on the stationery provided by the printer, and traced on each, with a deftness and accuracy that proved long experience at the task, the exact duplicate of the consul's signature. The light beneath the glass, outlining the genuine signature on the blank papers, as clearly as though it were written there. These letters, addressed to himself, he mailed, and received back again, properly stamped by the postal service. That night Sir Harry Westwood Cameron packed his luggage, paid his hotel bill, ordered a taxi in time for an early morning train, and fell to sleep contentedly in blissful anticipation of an approaching golden harvest. While Sir Harry slept, an underworld jury of six, four men and two women, grouped around a table in a secluded flat, discussed him with the same consciousness of solemn responsibility with which a court jury debates a death verdict against a man already adjudged guilty. From the hour of his release from Folsom, one or more of the six had been at his heels, following, watching, waiting with silent purposeful doggedness. Each of Sir Harry's preparations for an approaching flyer in high finance had been observed and reported to Boston Blackie, the mob chief who sat at the head of the group, grave and taciturn. K.Y. Lewes, whose hotel room adjoined the Englishman's, 
had brought the news that Sir Harry had paid his bill and was ready to leave town, that the time to strike had come was the evident sentiment of the majority. Jimmy the Joke was speaking. If he's going to blow town in the morning, tonight's the night to ring down his curtain, and here's the way to do it. There's an eight-inch ledge between K.Y.'s room and his, out one winter and then the other. A cloud over the head with a sap and a poke with a shiv, and he'll be hard to wake when they call him for his train in the morning. Jimmy illustrated with gestures more vivid than words. Say the word, Blackie, and it'll be all over by daylight. One of the two women, Boston Blackie's Mary, who sat beside him, shivered slightly. The other, a girl with the face of a child and eyes old with worldliness, stared unseeingly before her as though trying to visualize the scene just described. A sleeping man, a dark shadow slipping through a window, a quick blow, a knife stab, a groan, and silence. There was no trace of mercy in the set lines of her face. For the man this child-woman loved as only such as she can love was he whom Fred the Count had sought to betray to the hangman, and who because of that treachery was still behind prison bars instead of at her side. They all turned towards Boston Blackie and waited. In all things he was the final arbiter. I don't want him bumped off. A sigh of relief from Mary, and a low gasp of surprise from the rest, followed Boston Blackie's words. "'Why, Blackie? Oh, why? Why?' cried the girl, asking the question in every mind. "'Because, little Miss Happy, it's too easy, too quick, too inadequate,' Blackie answered. "'Unless the future holds something worse than death for Fred the Count, he has escaped us. Only years of suffering, filled with a gnawing knowledge of why he suffers, can square the debt this man has taken on himself. Death won't do. We must wait and take him when— Boston Blackie paused. Jimmy, he continued after a moment's thought, pick him up at the hotel in the morning and trail him wherever he goes. It won't be far. He's ready to pull one of his regular capers. He'll take you up to some out-of-the-way place and begin work. The moment he does, wire me. And Jimmy— don't risk one chance, not even one, of losing him. As the group disbanded mutteringly, Little Miss Happy crossed the room and took hold of Boston Blackie's arm. "'You won't let him get away, will you, Blackie?' she pleaded. "'If I thought there was even a chance he might, I'd—' She stopped short. "'Don't worry, little girl,' Blackie answered, laying his hand on her head. "'He'll not escape this time. I promise it. The following afternoon, a puffing little logging train left Sir Harry Westwood Cameron at Sherwood, a mountain village in the heart of California's great redwood forest. Before night, he was talking lumber with old Sherwood Gerard, the pioneer, to whom he had displayed credentials, revealing a mission that made him the most honored guest ever received into the lumberman's home, where in the simple open-hearted fashion of the mountains all travelers were welcome. While Sir Harry talked to her father, Betty Gerard, who some day soon would own the vast, unbroken stretches of virgin forest that rolled away, ridge below ridge, to the horizon, changed the gingham apron in which her visitor had found her for her most becoming party dress, and nervously piled the golden braids of hair that had hung about her shoulders high on her head in the most womanly coiffure she knew. Sir Harry was the first real baronet she had ever seen and at supper that night, as he noted the flushed face and eager eyes with which the motherless little heiress listened to his stories of an ancestral and visionary home in England, Sir Harry exultingly blessed the happy chance that had sent him to Sherwood, for it was plain the aged master of the house, already bound by feebleness to his wheelchair, could measure in months or even weeks the life that remained to him. In his room that night Sir Harry summed up his prospects with keen elation simple-minded, guileless Betty, who judged him by her mountain standards and listened to his stories of London with a fresh zest and perfect belief of a child, would be, he foresaw, easy prey for a man like himself, skilled in the deception of women far more sophisticated than she. When he married Betty, already an accepted fact to him, nothing would stand between him and the sole possession of the vast forests on every side but the life of an old man slipping palpably and inexorably toward an early grave. 
He was thankful there was no mother to combat and convince. Mothers, he had found, were strangely intuitive sometimes. "'It'll be the best job of my life,' Sir Harry assured himself delightedly. End of Chapter 9 of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Price of Success During the weeks that followed, Sir Harry had no reason to doubt the truth of his boast. Detail after detail of his plan of campaign worked like smooth-running machinery. His first step was a call at the Sherwood offices of President Muir of the Milling Company, which turned endless trainloads of Gerard logs into sawed timber. To Muir, a Scotchman with all the shrewdness of his race, Sir Harry presented papers, seemingly unimpeachable, accrediting him as a representative of the British government, instructed to purchase vast supplies of lumber. He showed a specification list detailing sizes and quantities, and asked for a bid on the largest order ever placed in California lumber annals. He made but one stipulation. For government reasons, the entire transaction must remain an absolute and inviolate secret. Muir considered his visitor with innate caution. "'It's mighty big business you speak of, Sir Harry,' he said. "'Who's to pay, and how?' A perfectly proper question, Sir Harry answered. I will pay, and, he leaned over and tapped the desk to emphasize his words, in lieu of the usual investigation you, as a businessman, naturally would make of my finances, I make this suggestion. If we agree on prices, I will make an advance payment of ten thousand dollars on the day we sign the contract. As the lumber is delivered at the seaboard each month, I will pay spot cash for the shipments before they are moved from the wharves. You get my money before I get your lumber. Is that satisfactory? Ah, it sounds fair and businesslike, admitted the Scotchman, and he plunged into a discussion of costs. In this phase of the negotiations, Sir Harry further lulled Muir's really groundless doubts of himself by displaying an intimate knowledge of lumber values and a marked disposition to haggle over every penny. They parted with the lumberman convinced that good fortune had sent him a customer who would keep his mill running night and day for months. While he continued to argue costs and delivery details day after day with Muir, Sir Harry devoted himself with the skill of experience to winning the second and greater part of the stake for which he was playing, the heart of Betty Gerard. This was an easy task, for to Betty Sir Harry Westwood Cameron became, in a week, the dream prince for whom all girls, young and not so young, wait and watch and long, and sometimes really find. He was the personification of romance, the realization of secretly treasured hopes, the fulfillment of desire, for she saw him with eyes blinded by girlish visions of an imaginary Prince Charming. His thin lips, steely, half-veiled eyes, and mirthless laugh were, to her, only delightfully aristocratic. Glibly casual references to England's best names helped to build the pedestal from the foot of which she looked up to him in awed wonder, that she, a simple mountain girl, should have the privilege of intimacy with one who belonged in such exalted circles. In a word, Betty Gerard was eighteen and motherless. Sir Harry wooed her with calculated artistry, and never a word of love. One day he showed her a photograph of himself lounging on a lawn before a baronial-looking country home. Betty could not guess, of course, that it was a picture of one of England's show-places that all Cheapside might visit, if it chose, for a shilling fee. "'Betty, I've wondered very often lately—' Sir Harry checked himself, as if with an effort. "'What?' she urged, studying the photograph with a new thrill. "'Whether you—' He stopped again and shook his head as she looked up at him. "'It isn't fair to tell you, now,' he continued with a gesture of pained self-denial. Betty was too much a woman not to guess the purpose of the words he denied her. Why wasn't it fair to tell her, if he wished to, she wondered. The possibility that some obstacle might bar a still unconfessed love— 
helped to fan the flame Sir Harry wished to kindle, and brought her to an inwardly made admission that she did love Sir Harry Westward Cameron, and would always love him, no matter what threatened to separate them. She cried herself to sleep. It never occurred to Betty to ask herself whether she loved Sir Harry enough to go with him to a mountain cabin and be happy there in Calico. At eighteen, and sometimes at thirty-eight, women forget to test their love with such unromantic possibilities. With the intuitive knowledge of women that is the gift of such men, Sir Harry kept the girl's mind always centered on himself, sometimes in doubt, sometimes in hope, but always on him. At the end of a fortnight he was satisfied Betty was his for the asking. On the day he changed his last twenty-dollar bill, Sir Harry Westwood Cameron decided he had jockeyed long enough with Muir in his lumber bid, and that the time had come to marry Betty, collect his toll from the village of Sherwood, and vanish. Success was now almost within the reach of his grasping fingers, and so, with a look that thrilled Betty's hero-worshipping heart, he asked her to take him for a last drive in her car. "'My work in Sherwood is almost done, Betty,' he said. I must leave in a few days, and before I go there is something I must tell you. I have tried to keep silent and failed. Do you care enough to listen?" Betty nodded. At last she was to hear the secret she thought would determine whether happiness or sorrow was to be hers. Sir Harry was silent until her car stopped on the edge of a rocky promontory which overlooked miles of the Gerard forests. Then suddenly he leaned toward her and caught her hands. "'Betty, dear,' he cried, as though an overflowing heart were forcing the unbidden words from his lips, "'you know I love you. Love like mine reveals itself without words. You've seen in my eyes and felt in the touch of my hand all that my lips have longed for days to say. Shall I tell you why I have not spoken? Shall I tell you why, if I could, I would have gone away without speaking?' "'Yes,' Betty whispered. "'Because I am going back to England.' back to France, where what is left of my regiment is fighting on the Somme of Front. In one month or six after I reach French soil I may be a maimed cripple, a burden forever to myself and the wife I long for. I have no right to ask you to leave such a home as yours to risk such a future, and yet when they love women like you are such willing martyrs to that love that sometimes I have almost dared to hope. Betty, are you brave enough? Do you, can you, care enough to go back to England with me and share as my wife what the future has in store?" Betty, thrilled beyond bounds with the joy of knowing the hero she loved, had with knightly magnanimity hesitated to ask her to accept even a share of the sacrifice for patriotism he chose uncomplainingly for himself, sobbed contentedly on his breast, and promised she would. A motor, coasting silently down the hill, suddenly rounded a turn in the road. Betty Gerard sprang away from Sir Harry's encircling arms and vainly strove to smooth her disheveled hair and hide her flushed cheeks. The driver, a woman, gave the pair one quick glance and passed on out of sight without apparent interest. "'She saw us!' exclaimed Betty, hanging her head blushingly. "'Why should we care, dear?' Who is she, anyway? I have seen her a dozen times lately when we've been out driving," Sir Harry answered. "'She's one of a vacation party that has been camped in the woods below our house for the last week or two, Betty replied, stretching out her hands for him to help her to her feet. "'Will you drive me home, Harry?' She used his name for the first time with a blush. "'And let me tell Dad how very, very happy I am.' While Betty told her father that night that some day she was to be Lady Cameron, Mary described to Boston Blackie and his camp within gunshot of the Gerard home the scene on the promontory of rock. "'They're engaged now, beyond a doubt, Blackie,' she concluded. "'Which means that she'll be married to him within a week, if he has his way,' Blackie added. "'Our hour is coming swiftly now and the price of success is going to be everlasting watchfulness. Isn't this a strange old world, Mary? Think of it. The fate of this innocent little mountain girl we never heard of two weeks ago depends now on us, 
a crook mob the world would cage rightly enough like wild beasts if it could in the second day after betty gerard had promised to marry him sir harry westwood cameron sat in the office of the mill company reading a contract just handed him by its president by the terms of this agreement sir harry contracted to purchase fifty million feet of redwood lumber the company agreeing to deliver the timber at the seaboard in monthly lots of five million feet each, with a sharp price discount as a penalty for delayed deliveries. On his part, Sir Harry agreed to pay spot cash for the lumber as it reached the wharves, with an additional advance payment of $10,000 to stand as a forfeit in case any of the subsequent payments should be defaulted. The contract was a tightly drawn document. Muir had seen carefully to that, and there was no conceivable way in which the mill company could lose or be defrauded under its terms. The lumberman watched Sir Harry narrowly as he read the contract, then turned back and reread it. Somehow, far back in his canny Scotch mind, there still remained the first reasonless but persistent doubt of the Englishman's integrity. But if his customer was satisfied with his contract, Muir conceded he must admit himself wrong. Meanwhile, he was on his guard. "'Absolutely correct and satisfactory from my standpoint,' Sir Harry announced finally. "'As it suits you, Mr. Muir, shall we sign and consider the matter settled?' Sir Harry scrawled his signature at the bottom of the page. Muir did the same. "'And now, except for the matter of the advance payment, our business is satisfactorily settled, I think.' Sir Harry drew out a sheaf of checks on which Muir recognized the same consular insignia he had seen on his customer's credentials, and filled out one for ten thousand dollars to the Muir Lumber Company. He flipped it across the table to the lumberman. "'If our deal is as satisfactory to you as I am sure it will be to me,' Sir Harry said, "'we are both to be congratulated.' He lighted a cigarette, smiling inwardly at the double meaning in his words, and sauntered out to the automobile in which Betty Gerard was waiting for him. Muir endorsed Sir Harry's check and called his cashier. "'Mail is to our bank,' he said, "'and instruct them to notify me by phone when it is honored.' To himself he added, "'When it's cashed, and not till then, we'll put a night shift to work. "'Everything seems all right. "'It can't be otherwise, as far as we are concerned. And yet I have a wee doubt in my head. I wonder why. Mid-afternoon found Sir Harry Westwood Cameron again within sight of the offices of the Muir Lumber Company. Timing himself accurately, he rushed in just as the mail to go out on the afternoon logging train was being made up. I find I made a stupid blunder when I gave Mr. Muir his check this morning, he said to the cashier. I drew it on the bank in which the Canadian instead of the British funds are deposited. Has the check gone yet? No, that's fortunate. This is the check you should have had. I'll exchange it with you, if you don't mind. He handed out a new check, drawn in a different bank, and made out, as the other had been, to the Muir Company for $10,000. Certainly, acquiesced the cashier, opening the letter he had written the bank at Muir's command, and handing Sir Harry the first check as he laid the second aside to await endorsement before being mailed. Sir Harry tore up the check in his fingers and let the fragments flutter to the floor. "'Fortunate I happened to discover my error before it passed out of your hands, wasn't it?' he said. "'It would have been a beastly nuisance to have rectified it, bound up as I am by red tape. Thanks awfully!' And he sauntered out. Hidden in the palm of his hand was the check returned to him by the Muir Company. The one he had torn to bits in the presence of the cashier was an exact duplicate, except that it lacked the one essential that gave it value, the endorsement of John J. Muir. The blood raced through Sir Harry's veins as he turned up Sherwood's boardwalk. The touch of that magic bit of paper concealed in his hand was like a fiercely intoxicating wine. He knew he needed only to present it at the Muir Company's bank, now that it bore the guaranteeing endorsement of the lumberman, to receive without question gold that would buy all he craved in the world of pleasure. And when that gold was gone, there would still be Betty to be cajoled, threatened, or abused into giving him more and endless abundance. A single month of freedom had given him wealth. Nothing remained to be done now but to cash the check when the bank at Ukiah, forty miles away, opened in the morning, 
and then to disappear, leaving those he had mulked to count the cost of the acquaintanceship of Sir Harry Westwood Cameron. Betty, of course, must go with him, begrudging each moment that still separated him from the actual possession of the money waiting at the bank. He hurried back to the Gerard ranch to find her. He showed her a telegram written to himself by himself, recalling him secretly and at once to San Francisco to undertake an urgent mission, and urged her with convincing sophistry to marry him that night in Ukiah. "'This sudden summons to undertake a new mission may mean anything, Betty dear,' he pleaded. "'It may mean a dangerous trip to the city of Mexico. That was spoken of before I came here. It may mean months of separation. It may—' Betty laid her hands in his. The only happiness I hope for, the only happiness I ask of life, is to share all your dangers and troubles, she said. I am not afraid with you. Sir Harry caught her gently and drew her to him. You will go, you will marry me tonight, and send me away, if I must leave you, with the comfort of knowing that you, my wife, are waiting for me here, and longing as I shall be for the happy day when separations are over and we can go home to England together." There was a cruelly masterful gleam of satisfaction in Sir Harry's eyes. Once bound to him by a wedding ring, he never intended that Betty Gerard should see her mountain home again, never at least, until he had wrung the last available dollar from her father's rich forests. But, Dad, she whispered, stirring in his arms. I will explain to him. He will understand and consent, Sir Harry answered. Then, if you wish it, I will go. And Betty, who had begun by declaring the idea of an immediate marriage to be impossible, hurried away to pack a suitcase while Sir Harry went to her father. When a girl is eighteen, in love, and spells romance with a capital R, her own heart pleads with irresistible potency a cause such as Sir Harry's seemed. Old Sherwood Gerard, simple-minded and unsuspecting as Betty herself, had drawn his wheelchair to the spot on his porch from which he could best see the rolling stretches of forest he loved with the love of one who has met and mastered in their peaceful solitudes the problems of a lifetime. Sir Harry showed his forged telegram and explained that he and Betty wished a father's consent to an immediate and secret marriage. "'Why secret?' the old man asked, studying Sir Harry's face with eyes level and keen, though dimmed by age. "'Because, Dad,' said Harry, laying his arm affectionately round the old man's shoulders, "'the world must not know that I have even been in Sherwood.' until the lumber I have bought here for our armies is safely landed at its destination. Nothing afloat is safe from the U-boats. The mere fact that Sir Harry Westwood Cameron, known representative of the British government, has been in Sherwood, if published, would be ruinous to our projects. You know what your American newspapers are. They would make a sensation with pictures, likely enough, of the news that our little Betty has become Lady Cameron. Our wedding will cause no comment in Ukiah, where I am not known, and shall not use a title that I sometimes regret is mine. What does it matter when or where we are married? Betty will return to you tomorrow to wait here for the day when this new duty to my king is done, and I can return to claim her. Give your consent, Dad. Her happiness and mine depend on it. Sherwood Gerard leaned back in his chair in silence. This sudden wedding seemed uncalled for, almost unseemly. And yet, he mused, I am old, and age is always slow and hesitant in the face of youth. Twenty years ago, Betty's mother and I thought a month a year while we counted the days to our wedding. Why should I deny my children now what they wish? He turned to the man beside him. Give me your hand, boy he said, gripping the palm outstretched to him as do men to whom a spoken word and a hand clasp are a bond that may not be broken. It shall be as you and she wish. And Sir Harry, the old man's voice was tremulous with emotion, be very good to my little girl, very good, my boy, and very, very kind. She's only a child. I may tell her, cried Sir Harry, leaping to his feet. Yes, and then send her to me. And may God be good to you, as good as you are to her. 
Amen, added Sir Harry with seeming reverence, but smiling at the design in his heart that made that word a blasphemy. Sir Harry drove Betty to the train in the early evening and left her auto in the village garage. He would follow in it after nightfall, he told her, as the necessity of keeping his departure absolutely secret was imperative. Meanwhile, she was to go to a Ukiah hotel and wait. She agreed. Without a thought of possible evil, she waved him a tremulous, happy au revoir, and began the wedding journey the bigamist intended should deliver her irrevocably into his ruthless hands. With a cruelly satisfied smile, Sir Harry watched her go, and returned to the Gerard home to wait in a scorching fever of impatience for the darkness that was to cover his own flight. That night, while Sherwood Gerard sat in his wheelchair, watching the moon rise over his redwoods, and wondering how he could ever endure the loneliness he would suffer if Betty left him while he lived, Sir Harry said a brief farewell, took the auto from the garage, piled in the suitcases he had hidden by the roadside, and turned the car down the empty moonlit road that led to Ukiah and the realization of every evil hope that he had nursed through five weary prison years. End of chapter 10《Of Boston Blackie》by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Spirit of the Cushion's Kid Sherwood's block-long business street was silent, dark, and deserted. The one gleam of light in the night was from the incandescent that hung above the big safe in the offices of the Muir Lumber Company. Examining the strong box with a calmly critical eye of an expert stood Boston Blackie. He ran his hand delicately over the burnished steel, fondled the combination knobs, and turned to the masked man with him who was unpacking a suitcase. "'It's a good box,' he said. "'Let's get at it. It will take a half hour to cut into it, and that hick watchman might get back before his time." Two steel cylinders that just filled the bottom of the suitcase were taken out and set up before the safe. From each, a hose led to a metal nozzle punctured by a tiny blowhole. A heavy curtain of blankets was carefully draped above and around the outfit to cut off from the street the dazzling bluish light of the flame that was to eat through the solid steel. Boston Blackie took off his mask, replaced it with heavy automobile goggles, and then crawled beneath the blankets, which were propped away from the door of the safe by chairs. "'If the copper comes before I finish, don't forget what I told you,' he warned. His companion nodded assent. From beneath the blankets there began a hissing, sputtering sound, and between them the faint reflection of a blinding light was visible. The second man, armed and masked, stood just inside the front door, peering out into the night from behind drawn curtains. Twenty minutes passed. There was a faint thud as a heavy piece of metal fell to a cushioned floor. The sputtering noise ceased for a moment, then began again. Five minutes, and there was another thud on the floor. Then the light beneath the blanket died, and Boston Blackie, throwing them aside, rose from their folds. "'She's open,' he said. "'Take a look.' Both doors of the safe were swung back, and a ground gaping hole in each showed where the irresistible heat of the oxyacetylene torch had carved its way through the solid steel as a knife slices cheese. Boston Blackie drew out a dozen or more unbroken packages of currency and a canvas sack full of silver and scattered them on the floor. "'It's the payroll, lose," he reported in a whisper. "'I'm glad it happened to be here tonight. It would be a nifty little haul, eh?' So far, Boston Blackie had conducted the business of the evening with skill, dispatch, and in all ways as a man of his reputation might be expected to do. Nothing remained to be done to complete a neat job but to bundle the money into the empty suitcase and slip out the rear door. Instead, the safecracker began a series of preparations which would have puzzled and amazed others of his hazardous profession. First, he put on his mask. Then he unlocked the front door of the office with a master key he took from his pocket. He opened it and left it slightly ajar. Returning to the safe, he studied carefully the arrangement of the desks and counters, finally indicating one with a jerk of his thumb. 
Get behind there, Luz, and whatever happens, keep out of sight until I give you the office. Here is your blanket, and be sure you get him on the first throw, for we can't have any noise. Blackie tossed a blanket to his pal, who obeyed him in silence. He isn't due for twenty minutes, but he might be ahead of time, and we mustn't have any kind of a rumble tonight, he commanded as he drew a chair behind the safe and seated himself. He rolled a cigarette and lolled back, waiting with the unruffled nerves of a man enjoying a quiet evening smoke in his own home. The lighted incandescent left the dismantled safe and scattered packages of money in plain sight from the half-open door, while the minutes dragged slowly away in absolute silence. As the clock showed the passing of the hour, a step sounded on the board sidewalk down the street. "'He's coming,' whispered Blackie, slipping out of his chair and crouching behind the safe as he readjusted his mask. The footsteps approached slowly and suddenly stopped before the open door. There was a quick ejaculation of alarm as the watchman saw the wrecked safe and scattered money. He hesitated, fumbling for the revolver he never before had needed, and his eye roamed the room in sudden fear of a bullet from its shadows, a bullet either of the two men hidden within could have sent into his body a dozen times as he stood silhouetted against the window. But no shot came. Instead, Blackie, who had been watching from behind the safe in grim amusement, slowly rose into view with his hands held high above his head. "'Don't shoot!' he cried. "'You've got me. I quit!' The watchman succeeded at last in dragging out his gun and covering the safe-cracker. "'Keep your hands up!' he commanded nervously, advancing on his prisoner. "'No monkey business, or I'll pop you ashore!' "'I don't want to commit suicide,' growled Blackie. "'You got me with the goods, and I surrender.' The watchman felt for his handcuffs with his left hand. "'That settles it,' ejaculated Blackie disgustedly as the bracelets came into sight. "'I thought I might get a chance to beat it when we got outside in the dark. But now I suppose you're going to cuff me to yourself. I'm done for keeps.' "'That's just what I'm going to do,' the watchman exclaimed, adopting the suggestion and showing rising excitement as he thought of the reward his night's work would bring him from the lumber company. Then I'm going to march you over to the Mr. Muir's house and keep you safe until he gets the sheriff. You thought you could come up here from the city and blow a safe and get away with it, did you? I guess you know now you can't. He locked one handcuff over Blackie's extended wrist and snapped the other on his own arm. Come on now, march, he commanded. You're some copper. As he snapped out the word copper, Blackie drew slightly away from his captor. It was the signal for which Luz was waiting. The thick folds of a blanket dropped suddenly over the watchman's unsuspecting head. A blow on the wrist knocked the revolver from his hand, and he was thrown to the floor, struggling fiercely but in vain to free himself. With his free hand, Boston Blackie snatched a bottle from his pocket and emptied it over the blanket. The captive's struggles grew fiercer, then gradually ceased as the sickly sweet fumes of chloroform tainted the air. At last he lay quiet and inert. Blackie drew out a bunch of keys, unlocked the handcuff that still bound him to the unconscious man, and rose to his feet. "'Neatly done, Luz,' he said smilingly. "'He's out. I'll attend to him now. You get the boys in the auto. Be quick, and remember, not a sound from the engine.' Luz slipped out the rear door and disappeared. Blackie lifted the blanket and examined the drugged watchman, then dropped it lightly back over his face. "'Not even scratched.' And he'll have a story to tell after this night that'll last him the rest of his life, he mused. A moment later, Blackie's quick ear caught the sound of an auto being rolled quietly by hand into the alley behind the building. Three masked men appeared at the rear door. Between them, bound and gagged, was a prisoner at the sight of whose white, rage-contorted face Boston Blackie's lips parted in a singular smile. The prisoner was Sir Harry Westwood Cameron. Sir Harry's bloodshot eyes roved in terrified amazement over the strange scene before him, the wrecked safe, the packages of money scattered over the floor, the body hidden by the blanket, and the four masked men who guarded it. When his auto had been stopped at the bridge a half-mile out of town, and he himself seized and bound, he had thought himself the victim of a hold-up. But what sort of hold-up men were these, who carried him back to the office of the Muir Lumber Company, the last place on earth he must be at dawn? and held him there now, amidst the ruins of a cracked safe. "'I'm going to take the gag out of his mouth. I want to talk to him,' 
If he speaks above a whisper, crack him over the head, said Blackie to his helper. What does this mean? What do you want? gasped Sir Harry as the loosened gag released his lips. You! Boston Blackie's eyes hardened into points of steel. Me? Who are you? Boston Blackie thrust his masked face close to Sir Harry's. Through the slits in the mask, the bigamist felt rather than saw two cold eyes that seemed to bore him through and through with a message of hate and menace. Who am I? In spirit, I am the Cushion's kid. The same Cushion's kid round whose neck you tried to put a rope to buy your worthless self a few extra months of freedom. The Cushion's kid, who has left his cell at Folsom Prison tonight to teach you, in the hour when you thought you had beaten the world, that a man who plays always pays, and in the same coin. Sir Harry shrank away in a frenzy of uncontrollable fear from the voice that spoke from behind Boston Blackie's mask, and stared up at him with wide, terror-stricken eyes, scarcely able to believe what they saw. And these, with a gesture, Blackie indicated the other masked men, can you guess now who they are? There stands the Kokomo Kid, whom you induced to join you in a break and then deliberately betrayed to his death. Do you remember? You thought he was safely underground in the prison cemetery, didn't you? He isn't. He's here tonight, too, in spirit, to watch you pay your debts. Now do you begin to understand why you are here and what is before you, Fred the Count? As he heard his prison name flung at him with unutterable hatred by the mysterious man before him, Sir Harry sank on his knees with a fear of death in his heart. Whoever these men were, who whatever they were, they knew him and all his prison treacheries. He thought he knew what to expect from them. With chattering teeth he pleaded piteously for his life. "'You don't realize even yet what is before you, or you wouldn't beg for life,' snarled Blackie in disgust. "'You will live to beg for death. Listen carefully, Fred the Count. From the day you left your cell, you have been watched and followed step by step in preparation for this hour. We're not going to kill you. That's too quick and easy. Instead, we're sending you back to a cell to stay until they carry you to that cemetery to which you once thought it clever to send other men. I let the watchman on the floor here take me in the act of cracking this safe. I let him handcuff me to his wrist. Then we chloroformed him, and now I'm going to handcuff you to him and touch off the burglar alarm. When Muir and the rest come running down, they'll find you cuffed to the watchman, who will tell them how he caught you. You see the end now, don't you? Safe cracking to an ex-convict means life. And to make quite sure no mistake will be made, I'm going to put this envelope with your prison photo in one of your suitcases. The boys up at Folsom will welcome you back, won't they? Ah, you begin to get it now, don't you, Count? Sir Harry groaned and groveled on the floor. You'll learn your lesson well in the years ahead of you. Boston Blackie stooped and snapped on Sir Harry, the handcuff dangling from the still unconscious watchman's wrist. Then he unbound him and, turning to one of his silently waiting trio, said, Bring her in. I promise she should see him. From the darkness outside the door, a slight, girlish figure, with face masked like the rest, slipped into the room and stopped before the man on the floor. Suddenly she stooped and looked straight into his face, the face of the now pitiful wreck of a man who but an hour before had boastingly called himself Sir Harry Westwood Cameron, as he hurried toward a bride and a stolen fortune. All my life I thank God for this moment. The girl, little Miss Happy, cried softly to the cowering man, All my life I shall remember your face as I see it now, until I die. If I must go on to Lent without the kid, the years will be less lonely, less hard, because of the picture of you as you are tonight, which I shall always have with me, Fred the Count, you traitor. God I know now is just. She was gone as silently as she'd come. Boston Blackie pressed the burglar alarm. We're done, Count, he said. You're the first man I ever helped send to prison. The first man I ever knew whom I think belongs there. Courts don't do the kind of justice we've done tonight. Don't ask mercy of me 
ask it of the men who are in their graves because of you, if you dare. It's a job. It's a frame-up. I'll tell the truth about it. Sir Harry screamed, raving and struggling with the desperation of utter despair. Tell it all to the judge. I believe you, but he won't. Blackie flung back at him as he slipped out the rear door behind his pals and disappeared. When the townspeople, routed from their beds by the alarm from the Muir home, came running to the company offices, they found Sir Harry Westwood Cameron, English lumber buyer, raging like a wild beast and screaming curses from foam-covered lips as he tried to drag the helpless watchman toward the door by handcuff that cut them both to the bone. Sir Harry's trial was a short one. A jury of sunburned woodsmen heard the watchman's story, examined the accused man's prison photo, inspected the endorsed Muir check found in his pocket, and then, after listening with smiles and covert winks to the prisoner's wild tale of foremast conspirators who had dragged him against his will to the scene of the crime, brought in a verdict of guilty. Fred the Count, no longer dapper or well-dressed Sir Harry Westwood Cameron, was on the last stage of his journey back to Folsom Penitentiary. Handcuffed to a sheriff, he crouched dejectedly in the prison van as it slowly climbed the hill that shut the prison from view. As the van turned the crest of the grade, the driver stopped to rest his horses. Fred the Count looked up. Below him, exactly as he had left it on that morning, only a few short weeks before, when he went out with the swaggering, self-sufficient ruthlessness of one who thinks himself master of his own fate, was the prison he had never expected to see again. The quarry gang, a group of pygmy figures in stripes, was working among the rocks. One looked up, recognized the Count, and called to his fellows. Tools were thrown to the ground, a score of striped caps were flung high in the air, and cheer after cheer of savage satisfaction floated faintly up from the convicts to the man who was going back among them to do all of it. It was his own world's welcome home to Fred the Count. Abject and utterly broken in spirit, the Count dropped his head on his manacled hands and sobbed aloud. "'If God is good,' he cried. He will let the knives that are waiting for me down there get me soon. If he is merciful, he will let me die tonight. Boston Blackie's prophecy was fulfilled. Fred the Count was praying for death. End of chapter 11. Of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Problem in Grand Larceny Life is like a lake on a summer day, Mary, said Blackie, dropping the tenth consecutive cigarette and twisting restlessly in the easy chair which he had drawn before the glowing grate in their San Francisco apartment. If you don't drop a pebble now and then, there's never a ripple to break the monotony. Fred the Count was a ripple, wasn't he, Blackie? asked Mary. For a moment, yes. But he's safely behind the bars of grim old Folsom, and he's no longer of any interest to anyone but himself. My mind's getting rusty. I need something to occupy it. Mary sighed faintly. She loved the quiet and peace of their home. But she knew that when the restless spirit of adventure lured him, the man she loved inevitably must answer the call. "'Diamond Frank is in town,' she suggested after a moment's thought. "'Good,' cried Blackie. "'That's an idea. Frank always has the latest gossip from the North. I'll phone him to come up and have a talk.' An hour later, the two, from the center of a pall of cigarette smoke, were exchanging news of the hidden world in which each was a recognized leader. Two million dollars in gold! A truckload is waiting for anyone smart enough to get it! Diamond Frank, an ace in the world of crime, paused and shook his head sadly, as might an art connoisseur who contemplates a priceless treasure doomed to lie hidden forever from human eyes. But it can't be done! he added with regretful resignation. Not a chance in the world. It's awful, Blackie, but it's true. 
I know, for I've tried. Think of it, pal, enough good yellow gold to make any of us rich enough to be worth robbing, and yet a man can't lay hands on it. Why? asked Boston Blackie. Diamond Frank, lolling back in his chair, summed up the situation with the succinct directness of one who had given his subject painstaking study. On a beach at Nome, it's an iron-bound, sealed, and padlocked chest, guarded night and day by gunmen. Not a chance so far. Then it goes into the strong room of that old floating tub, the Humboldt. No guards there, Blackie, but there isn't a stateroom that gives a man a possible chance to cut through to the treasure from top, bottom, or sides. The padlock on the strong room is a double combination that unlocks with two keys, one kept by the captain and one by the purser. It is never unfastened from Nome to Seattle. A charge of soup would blow it off, but that, of course, is out of the question on shipboard, with the strong room almost opposite the purser's stateroom. At Seattle, it's uploaded to a truck guarded by more gunmen. Then it goes into the first national vaults to stay. There you are. Three tons of gold, unwatched on a steamer for from five to eight days, and I traveled all the way to Nome and back on the old Humboldt last fall without finding a thousand to one chance of laying a finger on it. It broke my heart, but I had to give it up. Boston Blackie lay back in his chair, thoughtfully silent. I should say offhand it would be far easier to lay hands on the gold than to get it past the custom house men and safely away after I had it he remarked at last. "'Jump to it if you see a chance. I'm done,' said Diamond Frank. "'Maybe I will,' said Blackie. And though he dropped the subject as if no longer interested, he sat alone till dawn after his friend departed, mentally visualizing the treasure room of a tubby, plunging steamer plowing her way southward from the Nome beaches with a king's ransom locked in her steel-bound vault. It could be done, he said softly to himself, and inasmuch as James J. Clancy is president of the company that owns the Humboldt, there's the best reason in the world why Mary and I should do it. All the gold the Humboldt ever carried would not even the score we owe old eye for an eye, Jim Clancy, who identified Mary's father as the hold-up man who robbed him years ago in Spokane. Jim found his identification had been a blunder and justified it as a, a regrettable incident, but not really a miscarriage of justice. For the wrongly convicted man, now dead, was, he said, one who from his manner of life could have been no benefit to himself, his family, or the world that is well rid of him. Blackie's fingers were clenched, and his eyes were cold and steely with determination as he quoted the words that had been Clancy's epitaph to the memory of the man he had wronged. Yes, he said to himself grimly, the man who could say that, a big, open-hearted, kindly old Dayton Tom, is a man whom it will be a pleasant privilege to rob. We'll do it. Three weeks later, the Humboldt lay off the shore whose golden sands made a thriving city of the once deserted Nome Beach. At intervals above the monotonous surf roar, the sound of high-pitched laughter and broken bars of dance music floated faintly out across the water. The last homeward-bound steamer of the season was ready to sail, and all Nome was celebrating. The Humboldt's upper deck was deserted except for one passenger, a girl who leaned over the after rail intently watching the labor of seamen, who were lowering weighty, carefully guarded chests of gold from a jutting pier to small boats that were to carry them to the strong room of the waiting ship offshore. The girl, off guard in the safety of her solitude, watched the movement of the treasure with almost proprietary solicitude. Because of that jealously guarded gold, she was a passenger on the Humboldt. Because of it there lay on her forearm, hidden by the sleeve of her traveling suit, a tight-fitting bracelet, a dozen times more precious to her than its weight in diamonds. Often and involuntarily her fingers slipped beneath her sleeve to caress softly the circlet they found there. It represented a difficult adventure skillfully accomplished. It was confirmatory proof of the logic of the mastermind that had set itself the seemingly impossible task of rifling the steamer's treasure vault. It was an instrument of revenge, infinitely precious to the daughter of the man the world had called Dayton Tom. 
The boats, each with a shotgun guard, idle but watchful in the stern seat, put off from the wharf and drew up beside the Humboldt. A whining cargo engine lowered a rope net to the bobbing carriers, and one by one, with infinite care, the treasure chests were swung to the steamer's deck and piled there in ten rows, each four boxes high. Forty chests of gold, forty iron-bound storehouses of vast, illimitable power. The boxes were counted, checked, and recounted, and then wheeled down the companionway to the ship's strong room. Inside the steel-bound vault, with guards barring the doorway against the curious, the chests were counted once again, and each of their heavy seals examined by Captain McNaughton, Purser Dave Jessen of the Humboldt, and the gnome manager of the express company that was guaranteeing the treasure's safe delivery in faraway Seattle. Every seal was intact, every chest in its place, and with a sigh of relief as his responsibility ended, the express manager accepted the receipt signed jointly by the ship's captain and the purser for two million dollars in gold. At a command from the captain, a dozen or more trunks, boxes, and treasure parcels, entrusted to the steamer for safekeeping by passengers, were wheeled into the strong room and checked off the purser's list. All were there. The Humboldt's treasure room was in order. With a final, sweeping glance of satisfied security, the captain's eye roamed the interior of the steel-lined room. Then he stepped out, pulled shut the great steel-barred door, and put in place the giant padlock that guarded it. The captain's key turned softly in the lock. The pursers followed it with another gentle click of hidden ratchets, and the treasure was as safe as human ingenuity could make it. Purser Jessen, with a sigh of relief, locked his key in a secret compartment of his private safe. Captain McNaughton hid his key in the money belt that girdled his waist and never left his body night or day. Then he opened a panel in the wall above his berth and threw on an electric switch that turned a death-dealing current through the steel plate in the floor just within the strong-room door and connected also a series of alarms that would rouse the ship if the treasure-room door were opened so much as an inch. "'Well, that's well off my mind,' the captain murmured and went on deck to direct his final preparations for sailing. A shrieking blast came from the steamer's siren. A score of small boats and launches, each crowded with passengers, put off from the pier. An hour later they swarmed over the Humboldt's decks by hundreds, and the Humboldt, with a final siren blast, slowly swung her prow seaward and began her long homeward journey. Nightfall found the girl who had watched the loading of the treasure with such interest standing alone against the after-deck rail, abstractedly watching the steamer's foamy wake fade away into the darkness of an empty sea. On the passenger list she was registered as Miss Marie Whitney, Chicago, a name that cloaked the presence on the Humboldt of Mary Dawson, Boston Blackie's Mary, able assistant of the husband for whom she was waiting now, tense and eagerly expectant, to surrender the circlet on her wrist against which her fingers lay protectingly. A step on the deck behind her caught her ear. From the darkness a voice spoke softly. Mary, it said. The girl stirred in a revealing movement of love, joy, and pride in her own well-accomplished task. Without turning her head she stretched two hands behind her and grasped the man's eagerly. I have it, Blackie, she said, speaking in a whisper. Absolutely perfect, too. It's on my left wrist. Take it quickly, and, oh, my dear, do be careful of it. It couldn't possibly be replaced now. The door is wired, as you thought. Alarms ring all over the steamer if it is opened. The wires run out through the upper left wainscoting of the companionway. Everything is arranged as you planned. The man who said this trick couldn't be turned didn't know my Mary, whispered the voice behind the girl's head. The strong, deft fingers slipped the bracelet over her wrist with a caressing touch, as thrilling to her as rare wine. "'Your work is done, well done, dearest,' he said. "'Take no more risks, whatever, no matter what happens. Neither recognize nor communicate with Luz or me again. With this bracelet in my hand, a gold already is ours.' "'Do be careful, Blackie dear.' she urged under the stress of the natural, ever-present fear of a woman for the man she loves. I've had this queer feeling, a sort of 
premonition. Shh, interrupted Blackie. Someone's coming. Silently as a shadow, he glided away across the darkened deck. A man's firm, heavy step approached, and as Mary leaned across the rail and stared again in seeming idleness toward the disappearing wake beyond the steamer, a blue uniform appeared at her side, and Dave Jessen, the Humboldt's purser, stooped and peered into her face. "'It is you, Miss Whitney. I knew I couldn't be wrong, even in the dark,' the young officer said, betraying with each word the deep and deferential interest which had grown steadily during the weeks since the Humboldt had left Seattle with Miss Marie Whitney among her passengers. "'I'm the unfortunate bearer of bad news, Miss Whitney,' he concluded seriously. "'Bad news?' repeated the girl, looking up quickly. "'I fear so,' he concluded. "'You know how crowded we are this trip. Every stateroom is sold, and we're even bunking some of the miners down in the cruise quarters. But even so, I was sure until the last moment that I could keep your double stateroom for you alone. But I can't. An hour before we left Nome, Captain McNaughton received a wireless from Seattle that forces us to make room for express company detectives, and—' "'Detectives?' echoed the girl. In the darkness her slender hands clutched the rail until the knuckles whitened. With a quick, fierce effort of will she mastered her fear and looked up at him with a smile that invited confidence. "'How exciting!' she exclaimed. "'But what have detectives to do on the prosaic old Humboldt?' The man bent toward her and lowered his voice. The Seattle police have been informed by one of their spies, a woman, that two crooks, top-notchers with an international reputation, the wire said, are on board the Humboldt for the purpose of looting the treasure room on the trip home, he said. That, of course, is impossible. The strong room is absolutely burglar-proof. But with two millions of gold on board, precautions even against the impossible are necessary. So I had to turn over a stateroom opposite the treasure room to the officers and must ask you to permit me to give you company on the return trip. I'm sorry, but whom are you putting in with me? A Miss Nina Francisco. She's a Californian, an exceptionally likable young woman, I think. She has been in Nome all summer, visiting mines in which her father is interested, she told me. Do you mind sharing your cabin with her, Miss Whitney? He finished with unconscious tenderness. "'Certainly not,' Mary answered. Then, spurred by the necessity of obtaining further information by Blackie's danger, she looked into the officer's face with parted lips and eyes that were bright with an excitement which she had no need to feign. "'A robbery planned on this ship!' she cried. "'How wonderfully exciting! Are these crooks being watched? Will they be arrested here on the Humboldt?' "'Probably not, unless they really make an attempt to break into the strong room,' Jessen replied. "'We have their names and a description, but they are using aliases, naturally, and we haven't been able to identify them yet. But it really doesn't matter, for now that we have been warned, there isn't a chance in a million for them to accomplish anything on shipboard. And at the dock in Seattle, officers who know them will take them into custody as they go ashore.' The girl's body stiffened, and her face, protected by the darkness, grew suddenly white and infinitely careworn. Imminent danger threatened Boston Blackie, for she knew he would use without delay the circlet she had given him but a moment before. She must warn him at once of his peril. "'I think I'll go below,' she said. "'It's growing chilly.' She shivered, but not from cold. "'I may have Miss Francisco's baggage moved into your cabin?' asked the purser, steadying her with a gentle hand as they returned across the deck. "'Of course, and thank you for your courtesy,' Mary answered with cordiality that quickened the pulse of the bronzed, clear-eyed young officer beside her. "'As you have chosen her as my companion, I am sure Miss Francisco and I will be congenial, and I am so excited over your news about the, the crooks. You'll let me know if anything exciting happens, won't you, please?' Why, it's all just like a movie, with all of us playing a part in it." She laid her hand on his arm and looked pleadingly into eyes as innocent and straightforward and free from guile as the sea winds that tanned his cheeks. "'You know I will, Miss Whitney. Good night,' said Jessen, his voice revealing what he feared to put into words. "'Good night, and don't forget your promise,' she said with a smile that gave no hint of the anxiety in her heart 
as she disappeared toward her stateroom. Mary penned a hasty note telling Blackie the crucially important news, and slipped out of her stateroom to rap in the code of the crook world at his door, under which she slipped the note when an answering rap came from within. During Mary's absence, a young woman, tall, dark, and voluptuously handsome, entered and stood eyeing curiously the cabin to which her baggage had just been moved. On the table she saw the tablet on which Mary had written, with a freshly used pen beside it. Without hesitation she stepped to the table and held the paper to the light. On the sheet beneath the one that had been used, and which Mary in her hurry had neglected to destroy, a few words were visible. Seattle. Wireless. Treasure room. Detectives, the woman read with widening eyes at each telltale word. So she knows the secrets of the wireless room, does she? She mused. And she was talking with a man out on that dark deck when the purser went for her. Ah! She hurried down here and wrote a note and evidently has gone to deliver it. I'm lucky to have stumbled across this. I think the delightful Miss Whitney, who so obviously has turned that simple-minded purser's head, is not quite what she seems. Once more she picked up the tablet and strove to decipher further information from the few faint words imprinted there. As she bent over the paper, Mary entered. The newcomer laid down the tablet without a trace of embarrassment. "'Miss Whitney, I presume?' she said, extending a jeweled hand languidly. I was just admiring the tint of your stationery. You have guessed, of course, that I am Miss Francisco, whom you have so kindly permitted to share this cabin. The women's eyes met in a long, appraising glance, during which each tried vainly to hide beneath smiling lips a surging flood of hostility based on feminine intuition rather than reason. I'm sure we shall have a delightful trip together, said Mary in slightly strained tones, as she picked up the tablet and tossed it carelessly into a drawer. Her quick eyes had caught the words at which her new companion was staring as she entered, and she realized that her momentary carelessness had doubled the gravity of her problem. A spy, she decided instantly, a spy put here to watch me, but I'll not let her know that I suspect. She sees the words imprinted on that sheet of paper and knows I have read them, thought Miss Francisco. She's on her guard now, but can't possibly guess that I know who is on this steamer and why he is here. I'll win her confidence, and maybe... She turned with a smile to her new friend. Ten minutes later the two went arm in arm to the music room. End of chapter 12《of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Shot in the Dark As the Humboldt, plowing steadily southward beneath sunny skies, neared Seattle, the tension in the stateroom occupied by Miss Whitney and Miss Francisco increased until it became a tangible something as vibrant as an electric current. Neither woman for an instant relaxed her ceaseless watchfulness, and neither betrayed it. Yet each knew that as she spied, she was being spied upon. Mary, in the light of her knowledge of the crucial situation on shipboard, found much in her gay companion's conduct to deepen her suspicion that Miss Francisco, if not actually a detective, was an emissary of those whom she knew were on board. On the days following the woman's first appearance in Mary's stateroom, Nina spent much time in the steamer's wireless station, where apparently she flirted flagrantly with the operator, a role in which she proved herself decidedly adept. Camouflage to cloak her anxiety for further news from Seattle that will enable the officers to identify Blackie and Luz, was Mary's inward comment, as for the hundredth time she studied her fellow passengers with the hope of determining the identity of the police officers she knew to be among them. The detectives were lodged close to the treasure room, the purser had said, and gradually her suspicion centered on an Englishman, 
Sir Arthur Cumberland on the passenger list, who with a secretary companion was ostensibly making the Alaskan trip as part of a round-the-world tour. Cumberland was a big blond Britisher with a long drooping mustache, an accent that was joyfully mimicked by other passengers in the salon, and a decided weakness for the American bar below decks. His secretary was a keen-eyed little man named MacDonald, whose burr suggested the Clyde. Just why she doubted Cumberland, Mary herself could hardly have explained, except that she felt he was too obviously in dress and personal appearance what he seemed, too perfectly the familiar titled Englishman of the American stage. A chance word crystallized her suspicion into certainty on the night she hid herself in a secluded nook behind a lifeboat to win for a moment the relief of being off guard. The Englishman, smoking, stopped beside the boat. Almost immediately he was joined by the secretary. "'What have you learned?' demanded Cumberland. "'Haven't located anything yet,' answered MacDonald. "'You must, quickly, for I'll have them before we sight Seattle, or my name's not—' He stopped, glancing round as if fearing eavesdroppers, and laughed at his own caution. "'Be careful,' warned his companion as they strolled on. From that moment Mary assiduously courted the company of the pair, an easy task, for a pretty face was the open sesame to Sir Arthur's goodwill and interest. She had no definite plan, no specific hope, but hour by hour prayed for inspiration. Miss Francisco had scarcely noticed the Englishman until Mary adopted them as deck companions. From that moment, however, she managed to make herself an inseparable member of the party. One night, after two frequent visits to the buffet, Cumberland dropped an H now and then, and lapsed occasionally into an accent not at all suggestive of Regent Street. Mary looked up as she caught this false note, found Nina Francisco studying her curiously. MacDonald also was keenly aware of his chief's incriminating bit of forgetfulness, for with ill-hidden anger he managed to separate him from the ladies, and the pair vanished into their cabin. That night, when they were alone in their stateroom, Miss Francisco, to Mary's surprise, began to discuss and speculate upon Sir Arthur Cumberland and his business. "'Did you notice anything peculiar in our friend the baronet's language this evening?' she asked innocently. Mary, busy at her dressing-table, flashed a quick look into the glass and met her companion's eyes in the mirror. "'She's wondering whether her detective friends have betrayed themselves to me,' she thought. It was peculiar for a titled Englishman, she said aloud. Then after a moment's thought in which to weigh her words, Mary added, But it was nothing that I was not fully prepared to expect from him. Again the women studied each other furtively. So you think as I do that our titled globetrotter may be, began Nina. I know just as you do, interrupted Mary with increasing emphasis on each word that Sir Arthur Cumberland is playing a part for a purpose. I think even you will admit he plays it badly." Nina tucked a drooping lock of her raven hair into place and toyed with a powder puff before answering. "'You're quite right,' she said at last. Sir Arthur would play any game rather badly, I imagine. Very differently from you, my dear." "'And from you also,' added Mary following the words with a look that accentuated their inner meaning. "'Does that mean necessarily that we, you and I, must play at cross-purposes on the Humboldt?' asked Nina. "'You can answer your own question far better than I,' said Mary. "'Thanks,' replied Nina. "'You have clarified the atmosphere for both of us, I think. Anyway, in seventy-two hours we will be in Seattle, and then... Mary, without replying, threw herself on her berth and switched off the lights, to save herself the ordeal of parrying Nina Francisco's coldly analyzing eyes. In seventy-two hours the Humboldt would be in Seattle, she had said pointedly, in Seattle, with detectives waiting at the dock, she meant, and a prison looming large and certainly in the background. Mary's clenched fingers bit into her palms at the thought. Her fears were not for herself, but for the man she loved. With the robbery still uncommitted, for in the light of the information she had given him she had no thought that Blackie would persevere in his attempt to secure the gold, 
Mary knew that there would be little or nothing on the Humboldt that would justify a prison term. But she knew, too, that with a man of Boston Blackie's crook world prestige and their toils, the police would find or invent something for which he could be imprisoned. Without realizing that she had slept, Mary was suddenly awakened to full consciousness by a stealthy movement near her in the pitch-dark cabin. She listened with every sense keyed to superlative alertness. The sound, a soft, slippered step, was repeated, and she felt a faint, fresh breeze stir her hair. Instantly she realized its significance. The door of the stateroom, locked when she retired, now was ajar. Silently she raised herself and stared into the darkness. Her eyes detected a blacker blotch just within the cabin door, crouching furtively like an animal ready to spring. Now and then in the faint light that filtered in through the open porthole she caught a reflected glint of bright metal near the figure at the doorway. She recognized that changing, intermittent flash, a person within the cabin watching the companionway, down which twenty steps distant was the door of the treasure room, held a revolver. Noiselessly as an Indian, Mary drew herself over the side of the berth till her feet touched the floor. She slipped into her dark-colored dressing gown, and with eyes still fixed on the figure in the doorway, felt beneath her pillow till her fingers grasped the butt of a revolver. As she rose with slow caution, a faint sound reached her from the companionway, the gentle creak of a heavy door moving on little-used hinges. As if that were an awaited signal, the form in the doorway straightened and glided silently as a shadow out of the cabin into the pitch-dark companionway. Mary, a second silent shadow, followed. With eyes accustomed now to the darkness, Mary detected two forms on the narrow passageway which branched at right angles just beyond the treasure room. One, the one that had been within the door of her cabin, was slinking inch by inch along the wall with the stealth of a jungle cat stalking its prey. The other was bent over the lock of the treasure room door. In the absolute silence, Mary heard the man's fingers gently moving over the steel plate. A faint ejaculation of astonishment came from the man before the strong room. Then a tiny ray of light illuminated the door for a fraction of a second. By its flash, Mary saw that the massive padlock that should have guarded the gold was gone. As the light winked out into absolute blackness, the figure stalking the man by the door moved quickly forward. Mary followed close behind. Then a dozen amazing things happened at once. From the cross companionway beyond the strong room a third figure rose apparently from the floor and seized the man before the door. There was a fierce struggle, followed by a deafening splintering of wood, as they crashed against the cabin partitions and fell to the floor. From between the struggling forms the sharp crack of a revolver, followed by a brilliant flash of flame, which for a second lighted the faces of the fighting men. By the flash, Mary saw them clearly. The attacker, who had risen from the floor beyond the strong room, wore a crook's mask. The man who had fired the revolver for which both were now struggling desperately was Sir Arthur Cumberland. As the shot reverberated down the narrow passageway, the figure that had stolen from the doorway of Mary's cabin leaped to the center of the melee with a clubbed gun held high as if to end the battle with a single deadly blow. Mary sprang forward to intercept that blow in midair. But with her gun upraised to strike, she shrank back against the shattered woodwork in dazed perplexity. The one whose upraised arm she would have crushed had struck, but not at the masked man. Instead, Nina Francisco's gun butt, Mary recognized her now, struck the revolver from Sir Arthur Cumberland's hand. Instantly his opponent seized it and crashed it solidly against the Englishman's temple. Cumberland fell back, limp and senseless. End of chapter 13of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mystery of the S.S. Humboldt What followed seemed a nightmare of unreality. A fourth form, apparently peering from nowhere, passed swiftly down the companionway and vanished. The masked victor, staggered to his feet and seemingly intent on making more noise and confusion, raised the unconscious Englishman and dashed him against the door of the purser's cabin, which burst open. Screams and shouts came from behind stateroom doors. 
Mary darted back to her own cabin, slipped her revolver beneath her pillow, and switched on the lights just as the door was thrown open and Miss Nina Francisco entered, her clubbed revolver still in her hand. The girl shot the bolt in the door while the uproar in the companionway increased and running men poured down from the upper deck. Without a glance toward Mary, Nina opened a grip, dropped the revolver into it, and locked it. Then she drew on a pair of stockings, slipped her feet into shoes, and with a calm, quick glance around the room, as if to make sure she had forgotten nothing essential, threw open the door of the cabin and began to scream hysterically. The companionway was lighted now, and ship's officers and seamen, aided by the shaken and white-faced secretary, were raising the senseless form of Sir Arthur Cumberland. Mary, peering over Nina's shoulders, saw that the door of the strong room was open, Blood splotches were everywhere, and Purser Jessen was loudly calling for the ship's surgeon. The doctor and the captain arrived together. "'What's happened here, Mr. Jessen?' demanded McNaughton, gazing dumbfoundedly at the bloody, unconscious passenger, the open door of the strong room, the splintered woodwork. "'Blamed if I know, sir,' gasped his subordinate. "'I was asleep when I heard a crash in the companionway. "'There was a shot, then another crash. "'Then this man came through the door of my cabin, "'tearing away the hinges.' "'The captain turned to his first officer. "'Put a guard before every stateroom on the steamer,' he commanded. "'Let no one leave a cabin until I give permission. "'Move this crowd back, each to his stateroom,' "'motioning to the half-dressed passengers "'who were pouring out of a dozen doors.' Doctor, take the injured man into Mr. Jessen's cabin and attend him, while I find out what's happening on this ship. As the passageway was cleared, the captain picked up from the floor the padlock that had hung on the treasure room door. It had been opened without leaving even a mutilating scratch. The strong room padlock unlocked, he gasped. Look, cried Jessen, pointing to an object that lay beneath the fragment of splintered wood. The captain picked it up turning it over and over in his hand. It was the exact duplicate of the strong-room lock. Nearby lay a revolver with blood-stained handle. "'Follow me, Mr. Jessen,' McNaughton commanded. Together they entered the strong-room, piled high with the treasure chests, and studied it. Walls, ceiling, and floor. Nothing appeared amiss. One by one they examined the seals on the chests. All were intact." "'They must have been interrupted by Sir Arthur as they were entering,' suggested the purser. "'Not as they were entering, but after they had entered,' corrected the captain, sniffing the air. "'Why, sir?' inquired Jessen. "'Cigarette smoke inside,' explained McNaughton, still sniffing. "'They've broken into the Humboldt strong room, though it can't be done, "'and they even dared to keep their cigarettes going while they did it.' Thank heavens Cumberland heard them, for it's evident he must have interrupted the thieves, or they would not have struck him down. McNaughton pushed his way into Jessen's room, where the surgeon was dressing an ugly wound over Cumberland's temple, with the secretary aiding him. "'Is he badly hurt, doctor?' McNaughton demanded. The surgeon shook his head doubtfully. "'I can't say yet,' he replied. "'He took a hard blow. He may come around all right shortly.' and he may have a fractured skull, which, from a blow just there, might mean cerebral hemorrhage. He may be unconscious for hours. Or even days, said the doctor. What do you know of this? McDonald asked, turning to MacDonald. I was asleep, the little Scotchman answered readily. I heard nothing until a shot awakened me. When I got the lights on and the door opened, Sir Arthur was in the purse's arms, wounded. I didn't hear him leave our cabin, and I don't know who struck him, though it's plain he interrupted a robbery of your strong room. One by one the captain visited the nearby cabins, questioning the passengers. None gave information of real value. All had been awakened by the noise in the companionway or the subsequent shot. As they rushed from their staterooms they had seen the purser raising the injured man within the wrecked cabin door. No one else was in sight except the injured man's secretary, who appeared from his cabin after the trouble was over. McNaughton came finally to the stateroom of Miss Francisco and Mary. "'What did you ladies see of this?' he inquired courteously. "'You first, Miss Whitney.' "'I saw more than she did, Captain, for I was first at the door,' interrupted Miss Francisco quickly. 
I was awake when I heard the crash in the passageway. Then there was a shot. I jumped from my berth and turned on our lights. I heard a stateroom door near ours bang shut as I threw open our door. I saw the purser with the injured man in his arms. I'm afraid that's all I know. Is poor Sir Arthur badly hurt, Captain? She spoke with such well-feigned solicitude that Mary, remembering the blows struck in the dark, wondered at the perfection of her duplicity. "'Was the door you heard close to the left or to the right of yours?' asked the captain, seizing the one important bit of information in the girl's story. "'I don't know. I only know it was very close. Almost adjoining ours, I judge.' "'Can you add anything to what Miss Francisco has told?' asked McNaughton of Mary. "'I heard the shot and the noise, and I think, as Miss Francisco told you, that I heard a cabin door nearby close immediately afterward,' Mary said, following the other's story with exactness. "'That's all I can tell you.' As she heard Nina Francisco's glib invention, Mary, Knowing that Blackie's stateroom was far away and around the turn in the companionway, decided instantly to cooperate it. Wittingly or unwittingly, that untruth furnished an alibi for the man whose safety mattered to her. Why Nina Francisco had struck the blow that ended the battle, Mary could not guess. Why she now imperiled herself by a bold fabrication was an even deeper mystery. "'Thank you, ladies. I've worked before me that can't wait.' said the captain, bowing himself out hurriedly. As the door closed behind him, Nina and Mary looked at each other with silent lips but questioning eyes. "'Well, that's over, thank goodness,' said Nina at last, sighing with relief. She turned to the dressing-table and dabbed her powder-puff over her nose. "'You're not a bad sport after all, Miss Whitney,' she concluded after a long silence. "'I beg your pardon for what I've been thinking about you.' "'And you're—' "'I don't know what,' said Mary. "'Just a woman, my dear,' said Nina with softened voice. "'A woman willing to dare anything for the man for whom she can't help caring.' They smiled across the table at each other, and though neither asked a question or offered further explanation, the strange events of the night dissipated for the first time the hostility that had divided them. Morning found Captain McNaughton sitting in his cabin, perplexed furrows wrinkling his brow. The steamer had been searched from hurricane deck to keel without result. Not the slightest additional wisp of evidence came to light to justify even suspicion. The duplicate padlock, the revolver with one empty chamber, and the injured passenger were the only bits of evidence left by those who had attempted the daring raid on the treasure. Investigation showed the electric alarm wires leading into the strong room had been cut, and the wainscoting that hid them replaced without leaving even a betraying speck of sawdust. The lead offered by the closing cabin door heard by Miss Francisco proved absolutely barren, for the most minute search of all cabins on the treasure room companionway revealed absolutely nothing. The duplicate padlock was a duplicate in outward appearance only. It could be opened with the simplest of master keys. At daylight, a seaman found a pocket flash lamp rolling on the upper deck with the movement of the ship. It might have been tossed from any one of a dozen cabins. McNaughton locked it away with a padlock and the gun and ascended to the wireless room, where he dictated a message to his company managers telling all that had happened. Until Sir Arthur Cumberland recovered his senses, the injured man's condition was unchanged. The captain had done all that seemed possible. One thought comforted him. The treasure room gold had not been disturbed, for in the search of the Humboldt, which had included the personal baggage of passengers, officers, and members of the crew, no possible hiding place for great yellow bars two feet long and weighing thirty or more pounds each had been overlooked. In addition, the chest seals were all intact. The Humboldt was backing slowly from the dock at Victoria, a special stop necessitated by a shipment of British Columbian freight and had begun the short run down the Sound to Seattle when Mary received a message that brought color back to her white face. A man passed behind her as she sat in the deck chair and deftly dropped a slip of paper into her lap. Turning as she hid the note with her hand, she recognized Blackie's pal, K.Y. Lewes. 
Concealing the note in her book, she read at a glance its five words, words that lifted the load that burdened her heart. Follow original instructions. Don't worry, was written, and the writing was Boston Blackie's. Somehow, inconceivably, but surely, she knew he had solved the problem of escape at the Seattle Wharf. She sprang to her feet, and unutterably content, tossed the now twisted bit of paper overboard, and watched it float away on the waters of the sound as she gaily joined the throng on the decks. During that last day at sea, Purser Dave Jessen watched in vain for an opportunity to speak alone with Miss Marie Whitney, to tell her he loved her, to ask her to be his wife. Though he admitted to himself his presumption, and hoping that she might feel for him even a tithe of the great tenderness in his heart, he did hope, for he was a man and in love. But never for an instant during the day was Miss Whitney alone. Among the score of vacation trippers who boarded the Humboldt at Victoria for the return trip to Seattle was a party of five, four modestly dressed girls chaperoned by an agreeable white-haired mother, one of whom proved to be a former schoolmate of Miss Whitney's. All day the new frowned friends monopolized her attention, and it was not until the nearing lights of Seattle threw their glare against the southern sky that Jessen found the opportunity he sought. He was distributing the passengers' baggage, which had been entrusted to the safety of the strong room, baggage that was removed from the stronghold under the personal supervision of Captain McNaughton. Accompanied by subordinates carrying her trunk, he knocked at the girl's door and found her alone. The men deposited the trunk and departed, but Jessen lingered in the open doorway. Mary looked up interrogatively. Marie, he said, stepping to her side with a longing, half-fearful look into the face upturned to his, I love you. Forgive me, only a poor sailor, for daring to tell you, for even daring to hope you would listen, but because I love you. And you are leaving the Humboldt tonight. I must speak now. Marie, can you, will you be my wife? There was simple sincerity and great love in the words, the voice, and the frank eyes that looked into hers as she slowly shook her head. Don't, Mr. Jessen, Mary said gently. I like you. I admire you. But what you ask, it can't be. The bronzed face paled under its tan, and the blue eyes contracted under the numbing pain of a precious hope suddenly uprooted. "'There is someone else?' he asked unsteadily. "'Yes,' said Mary, truly sorry she must so wound the love offered her. "'Forgive me, Mr. Jessen,' she added, laying a small hand on the man's arm. Jessen caught and pressed it and hurried with averted face from the cabin as women's voices sounded in the companionway. End of chapter 14《of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Missing Gold with a final whining of taut hawsers and a gentle jolt against the long Seattle pier, the Humboldt had reached the end of her voyage. The gangplank was raised to the deck, and the eager passengers thronged there shoulder to shoulder, pressing backward to let a stretcher precede them to the dock. By the stretcher walked MacDonald, grave and silent. On it lay Sir Arthur Cumberland, his head swathed in bandages. He had neither spoken or given a sign of returning consciousness since the night of the attempted robbery. On the wharf, an ambulance summoned by wireless waited to hurry him to a hospital. The injured man was carried down the gangplank and along the passageway to the custom house shed. Just inside the entrance, four men, two on each side of the doorway, were waiting, keen-eyed and vigilant. Mary, following the stretcher in the van of the crowding passengers, recognized them at once as police detectives. With an apprehensive glance, she looked back over her shoulder. Nearby, pushing forward and chatting together as imperturbably as though danger were miles removed from them instead of at arm's length, 
came Boston Blackie and Lou's. Captain McNaughton, with President Clancy of the steamship company beside him, was in the custom house shed. The stretcher was lowered to one of the long tables, and the passengers grouped themselves, silent and expectant, around the locked shed as seamen carried in the Englishman's baggage to which the need of hurrying him to a hospital had given priority of inspection. "'That's Cumberland, who saved our gold,' the captain said in a low voice to the steamship official. "'He has an ugly wound and is still unconscious.' To that, but the men who wounded him are enjoying their final moment of freedom, Clancy growled. The chief has four men here who will know these crooks the moment they lay eyes on them. They must be bold fellows. The mythical detectives I invented for you by wireless didn't appear even to make them nervous, did they? Scarcely, as they broke into the strong room, notwithstanding the fact that I had made it my business, to let the news that we had been warned become common forecastle and saloon gossip, the captain replied sourly. The inspector ran through the Cumberland trunks and grips rapidly as MacDonald unlocked them. The chief inspector watched attentively. The detectives grouped themselves by the side of the litter. Inspection revealing nothing but the ordinary equipment of traveling gentlemen, MacDonald was eager to be off to the hospital. Come on, my men, he said to the stretcher bearers. Where's the ambulance? I'll send down later for our baggage. Wait, said the chief inspector curtly. Selecting two of the Cumberland trunks, he emptied them. Then he drew a measuring stick from his pocket and took the outside dimensions of the trunks. As he comprehended what was being done, the secretary's jaw sagged, and with a furtive glance over his shoulder he began to edge toward a window. At his first movement, one of the detectives laid a hand on his arm. "'Don't be in a hurry, Bo,' said the officer. "'Anyway, that window's locked.' The inspector jotted down the outside measurements of the trunks, then applied his rule to the inner surfaces. "'Just as I thought,' he remarked. "'These trunks have double bottoms with a secret compartment between. Give me that hand axe.' MacDonald's face grew ghastly. A single blow shattered the false bottom, and the inspector dragged it from its place. In the compartment now revealed lay a tiny oxyacetylene torch, nothing else. "'Queer baggage for a titled English gentleman,' said the chief inspector with a glance toward the detective chief. "'Titled English fiddlesticks!' cried that officer, stepping to the stretcher and raising the bandages that concealed the injured man's face. Then he called to his comrades with a chuckle of satisfaction. "'Look, boys,' he called. This man calls himself Sir Arthur Cumberland, does he? Well, I've another name for him. I call him English Bill Tatman. And here's how he looks in the clothes he's used to. Stripes. He drew out the photograph of a convict and displayed it to the captain. Except that it lacked the mustache, it was a perfect likeness of Sir Arthur. And you, continued the detective with a grimace toward the secretary, I've got your mug here, too, Mr. McTavish alias Mac the Scot. A fine pair, you two, parading down the country wearing handles to your names in place of prison numbers. It ain't true, shouted the unmasked MacDonald. We'll sue. Stow it, Scotty. The blasted Bobby's Evis right is a bloomin' whistle, interrupted a voice from the stretcher as Sir Arthur Cumberland sat up and staggered weakly to his feet. I'm fit for the hospital right enough, but I'd have been missin' with my buddy. When the ambulance got there, a few bobbies had given me half a chance, he remarked ruefully, but with perfect good humor. Let's go, he said, holding out his wrists for the handcuffs with the easy nonchalance of a man well used to such situations. My head's uncommon sore where that chip chappy sliced it with his gun. Cheer up, Scotty, we've less than nothing to worry over, my lad, he added comfortingly to his companion, and dropping naturally into the broadest of Cockney accents. The Bobbies can't put us under for being willing to turn a neat trick, and they can't say their bloomin' gold ain't just where they put it in their little iron tubs. We didn't lay hands near it. Cumberland and MacDonald, ejaculated Captain McNaughton. I never would have guessed it. Then, as a new thought came to him, but if they're the crooks we've been looking for, where's the man who stepped in and saved our treasure? It's all a Chinese puzzle, declared the manager. 
just one thing interests me now i want to see these chests safely into the bank and i want to see the gold that should be in them accompany us to the bank officers and bring your prisoners while the customs men went through the baggage of the remaining passengers with unusual care and the crowd in the shed gradually vanished in search of hotels and late suppers bank messengers supported by armed guards loaded the treasure chests into the waiting auto truck and with Captain McNaughton, the steamship official, the detectives with their prisoners, and a dozen newspaper men following in autos, the Humboldt's gold was hauled to the bank vaults for which it was destined. English Bill Tatman, once Sir Arthur Cumberland, looked on with grim humor and a running fire of comment as the boxes were unpacked, one by one, in the sanctuary of the First National's gold room. "'Look at it, Scotty!' he said to his morose pal with a wave of his hand toward the steadily growing pile of gold bars. There's enough tin to make honest churchmen of us, and the bobbies, too. Deuced lucky, however, that we didn't have any of this stuff in our luggage. As the easy-tempered prisoner rambled on with his monologue, the bank messengers threw back the lid of another chest. As it opened, they uttered a cry of dismay. Inside, replacing the gold that should have been there, was a neat pile of bars half of them pig-iron, half of them lead. Before dawn, flaring newspaper extras told the city of Seattle that $60,000 in gold bars had been stolen from the strong room of the Humboldt, and that though two known crooks had been taken at the dock and were safely locked in cells, the missing gold inexplicably had been spirited ashore and safely away, although every piece of luggage on the ship was searched inside and out. As the enthusiastic police reporters informed their city editors, the story was turning out to be a whale of a mystery yarn. While a gloomy conference at the bank was still in progress, Boston Blackie's Mary admitted herself to a modest bungalow on the outskirts of the city. Within was the white-haired motherly woman who with her four daughters had been passengers on the Humboldt from Victoria. "'All here?' Mary inquired eagerly. "'All but Blackie and Lou's.' answered the woman. There was no rumble at the dock, was there? None. Blackie was through the gate and safely away before I left. It was a wonderful job, wonderfully pulled, asserted Mary, relaxing from the long strain. Blackie should be here any minute now. Then we have only to put the gold in a safe place and drop out of sight for a while. You have given up this house regularly, without risking suspicion? I arranged it all yesterday before we left for Victoria, and exactly as Blackie directed me, the woman returned. The rental agent knows I'm moving in the morning. The girls are gone already. They caught the night train for the south. The doorbell rang. That's Blackie now, cried Mary, rushing to the door. She flung it open unhesitatingly, an eager, welcoming smile on her face. Then as she glimpsed the form outside, she stepped quickly forward and barred the entrance. On the doorstep stood Miss Nina Francisco. You! cried Mary, startled beyond further speech. Miss Whitney! ejaculated the woman, equally amazed. Then she began to laugh, but with a strained, false note in her merriment. How stupid of me not to have guessed who you really are during all those days we spent together on shipboard, she said with a shake of her dark head. Why are you here? Where did you get this address? demanded Mary. Nina drew a slip of paper from her pocket and handed it to her frankly suspicious friend. On it was written in Blackie's well-known hand the street number, with these words added, Immediately upon landing. Come in, invited Mary reluctantly. I don't understand all this, but Blackie's note seems to make it all right. Who are you, Miss Francisco? Have we ever met? Never, said the visitor with an elusive half-smile. I never saw you before I boarded the Humboldt, though you must have seen a letter I once wrote, I believe, a letter written long ago, Mary Dawson, when your blackie was risking his life to save a pal from death on the scaffold at Folsom Prison, California. Do you remember that letter? It was signed by a woman called Rita, and it told how— she had done for Boston Blackie's sake the one thing he couldn't do himself for his pal, because Fred the Count betrayed him. Do you remember now? Rita, cried Mary, 
The woman who saved the cushion's kid. The woman who... She stopped, a quick flush dying her face. Yes, continued Rita, taking up the interrupted sentence and meeting Mary's eyes with a level, unflinching glance. The woman who isn't ashamed to admit she would give everything in this world for what she knows you have and will never lose. Boston Blackie's love. Another ring at the doorbell ended in awkward silence. Mary recognized Luz and Blackie in the two forms on the step. As she opened the door, Blackie caught her in his arms and held her to his breast. "'We've won, little sweetheart,' he cried joyously. "'All here and everything okay, little girl?' As Mary nodded, he caught sight of the visitor within. "'Rita!' he exclaimed. "'You lost no time in finding the house, which is well, for we're leaving before dawn.' He dropped into a chair and began to laugh. "'Share the joke!' demanded Mary. "'I can't help laughing,' he cried. "'When I think of the paper you wasted, warning me against Miss Nina Francisco, detective, while Miss Francisco was equally busy writing notes warning me against the dangerous machinations of Miss Marie Whitney, also a detective, it was better than a farce. "'I saw you the night I boarded the Humboldt at Nome, and when I saw parts of the note Mary wrote with wireless treasure room detectives so suggestively appearing in it i suspected her for the ship's people had managed to let everyone know there were detectives aboard i knew you wouldn't travel to alaska for your health i knew we carried a fortune in gold in the strong room and putting two to two i guessed it was you they planned to trap the girl explained but i was a fool not to know you could and would protect yourself never Blackie denied promptly. You proved yourself true blue, particularly when you risked everything to knock that revolver from Cumberland's hand. You did do it, did you? Yes, said Nina without enthusiasm, and Mary was just behind, ready to knock my gun from my hand if I hadn't attacked the right man. Rita, said Blackie seriously, we owe you something for that timely blow. It entitles you to a bit with the rest of us. You've earned a share of the gold. The woman shook her head. Not me, Blackie, she said soberly. I don't want money from you. Her mood changed with the words, and she smiled up at him. There's something I do want, Blackie, she said. I want to know how it was all done, if you'll trust me. Trust you? Of course I do, Blackie assured her. You're one of us since that night in Sacramento when you saved my pal from the rope. How did we do it? Rita, it was as simple as taking eggs from a hen's nest. Mary's was the only difficult part, getting the wax impressions of the two keys. I led the purser on to show me the strong room on the northbound trip while it was empty, and there was no reason why anyone mightn't be admitted, said Mary in response to Blackie's nod to begin. I pretended to be amazed that his two tiny keys could protect such a vast treasure as he said the Humboldt would carry back from Nome. I picked them up as they lay in his hand, and, accidentally, of course, dropped one. As I fumbled about my feet for it, I took impressions of both keys on a circlet of locksmith's wax which was ready on my wrist. "'Of course,' said Rita, then turning to Blackie. "'But how did you get the gold out of the strong room? How did you get it ashore?' "'All oh, much simpler than getting the keys.' Blackie said. On the night of the battle outside the strong room, I had been inside with the treasure since the previous night. Luz let me in and locked the door behind me. He had just removed the padlock to release me when the Englishman appeared to try his luck at the game. His idea evidently must have been to saw or burn off the original padlock and substitute the duplicate for which he had keys. He could have then entered the treasure room and removed the gold when he pleased. Luz jumped him, and with your help, put him out. Meanwhile, I slipped back into my stateroom. But the gold! Surely you couldn't have carried it with you. And besides, they searched all the cabins immediately and found nothing. They didn't find any gold outside the strong room because there wasn't any outside. It was still in the strong room, and there it stayed until the home bolt was docking. I can't guess the answer to that, said Rita. No. Well, perhaps you remember that my little pal Mary was on the steamer, and being a woman, naturally she had trunks with her. One of those trunks was turned over to the purser for safekeeping. 
so having been stored in the strong room it was inside with me and the gold during the twenty-four hours i spent there beastly dull twenty-four hours too for it didn't take but one to empty a chest transfer the gold bars to mary's trunk and substitute in the chest the iron and lead bars that had been in her trunk then i've replaced the broken seal with a duplicate lou's made a gnome as soon as he saw the kind used on the treasure chests so all the time they were hunting the ship for gold it was still in the strong room but in mary's trunk cried rita with rapt appreciation that's worthy even of you blackie but how did you get it ashore they searched mary's trunk with all the rest certainly but they found nothing because the gold was no longer in mary's trunk when it reached the customs house men blackie said tell her mary do you remember the girls i met on the ship after we left victoria my old school friends you know to whom i introduced you began mary well those young ladies didn't carry any baggage except ordinary one-night traveling bags but when they came off the humboldt each of them even including their nice white-haired old mother had one of these contrivances strapped round her waist under her clothes mary opened a closet and dragged from the floor a canvas belt in which bent to fit snugly against a woman's body was one of the missing gold bars for which the seattle police were combing the city i bent them to the proper shape while i was in the strong room reproaching myself that i could only allow myself one hundred and fifty pounds from the tons of old clancy's gold that lay there mine for the taking said blackie that's the whole story rita except that when i got mary's warning that a woman in seattle had tipped off our game to the coppers i knew that we hadn't been tipped off for no one not even good old mother archer or the four girls with her knew what was wanted of them or what we planned to do until mary told them today on the humboldt therefore i naturally concluded there must be another mob on board the humboldt on the same errand as ourselves and that when we reached the dock at seattle the detectives would be waiting for them not us and so it turned out now you know it all rita he rose and beckoned to lose we've work to do he said this stuff has to be taken to the safe place I prepared for it. Immediately, too, for it never pays to take unnecessary chances. You'd better do as I suggest and take a share of the stuff for yourself, Rita. No, Blackie, nothing for me. Goodbye, then, and good luck, he answered as he and Luz staggered out, each laden with belts of gold. As the men disappeared, Mary and Rita eyed each other, throughout a silence palpably heavy with thoughts neither cared to utter. "'I'm going now,' said Rita finally, rising and moving quickly toward the door. Mary made no comment or protest. As she stood in the doorway, Rita turned and laid both hands on Mary's shoulders. "'Good-bye, dear,' she said gently. "'If you are not—' Boston Blackie's Mary, and I were not Rita, a woman who would give her soul to have his love. We could be good pals. But as it is, I imagine the only word we may say to each other in friendship is goodbye. Goodbye, Rita, said Mary, and watched her guest pass swiftly into the street and vanish in the darkness. Mary locked the door and began to make coffee for Blackie. End of chapter 15《of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Frame Up The robbery of the S.S. Humboldt grew to be a very nasty thorn in the tender side of the Seattle police. Larry Renter, chief of detectives, slammed up his phone, chewed the end from the unlighted cigar between his clenched teeth, and banged a heavy, hairy fist upon his desk in savage exasperation. "'Wants his gold bars back or my job, does he?' Renter growled angrily. "'It's safe to trust old Jim Clancy to want somebody's scalp if—' anything happens to singe his hide does the doddering idiot think a crook smart enough to make sixty thousand dollars in gold vanish at sea from a steamer's double locked strong room is likely to leave it lying around where my bunch of half-witted four-flushers can find it 
Chief Renter spat out the mutilated remnant of his cigar and eyed his phone speculatively and with growing gravity. Over it but a moment before he had been told by James J. Clancy, aged and irascible president of the Northwestern Steamship Company, that unless the Humboldt's mysteriously missing gold was recovered, the resultant police shake-up would jar loose the gold star at present glittering on the breast of Renter's uniform. The harried chief knew that Clancy had both the will and political prestige to uphold his threat. It's up to me to get busy or get out, and I'll not get out, not if I can help it, the chief said to the empty room. I'll get the gold if I can. If I can't, I'll find a goat and tie this caper to him. Then, being a shrewd and politic detective, well aware of the undeniable advantage of favorable publicity, Larry Renter pressed a button and told his secretary to admit the newspaper men waiting impatiently in the outer office. To these he dictated an interview brimming with assurance, in which he hinted a solution of the mystery was at hand, predicted the early arrest of the Humboldt robber gang, and promised the recovery of the loot within a few hours. With the reporter satisfied and out of his way for the moment, the chief seized a fresh cigar, sagged down in his chair, and concentrated the full power of his by no means mediocre mentality on the problem that confronted him. Three unbroken days and nights of unmitigated third-degree harrying had developed nothing more satisfactory than increasingly vehement denials of guilt from Tatman and his partner, and Chief Renter, shrewd in judging men of their type, at last was forced to the conclusion that they spoke the truth. Who, then, had stolen the gold? If Tatman is innocent, as I know he is, Renter said to himself, the man I want is the one who struck him down outside the strong-room door. No one on shipboard, passenger, officer, or seaman, admits giving the blow. That proves it wasn't struck to protect the gold. The detective's mind leaped to the logical conclusion. One of two things is true, he decided. There was another crook mob aboard the steamer, and it, not a tatman, got the gold. Or this business was an inside job, and the thieves are on the steamer payroll. Nothing amazing in that. Gold by the hundredweight will tempt anything human. Had Renter guessed that Boston Blackie and Mary, his wife and pal, were among the Humboldt's passengers, his summing up of the possibilities would have ended with the first alternative. From the standpoint of a man unaware of this all-important fact, however, Renter's second theory was far from implausible. The unbroken but open padlock found near the door of the looted treasure room, and the fact that the missing gold was not found when the steamer was searched immediately after the robbery, or in the baggage of any of the passengers, strengthened the thought growing in Renter's mind that the vanished fortune might still be hidden on shipboard. Gold bars two feet long and weighing thirty pounds each are not easily hidden within a passenger's cabin. Renter touched the button that summoned his secretary. McNaughton, captain of the Humboldt, is coming down shortly, he said. When he arrives, bring him in at once, and admit no one else till I ring. As he waited, the gossamer clues upon which he must work expanded in the brain of the detective. The strong-room lock was opened by keys made for it, he mused. The purser had one, the captain the other. Now, there were no duplicates. That's a fact that means something. The door opened to admit the big, bluff, white-bearded commander of the Humboldt. "'What progress, Chief?' asked McNaughton anxiously. Renter studied the face of the visitor silently. "'Considerable, Captain,' he said slowly. "'More than you would imagine possible. What would you say if I told you I know the Humboldt was robbed by men paid to protect her treasure, by men on the ship's payroll?' Renter watched the effect of his question with keen eyes half concealed by drooping lids. McNaughton, startled by the suggestion, met the chief's gaze squarely. Impossible, he said at last. No member of the crew had an opportunity, and my officers, well, sir, I know them all. There's not a thief among them. Renter leaned across the table and tapped its top. And yet, he said, the padlock was removed intact from your strong-room door by two keys that fitted it. 
The most expert locksmith in America couldn't have made duplicate keys without the originals as models. That means one of two things. Either the original keys were used to open the treasure room door, or as patterns for the duplicates that did open it. Which was it, McDotton? You and the purser are the two men who had the keys in your keeping. McNaughton leaped to his feet, his face purple with rage. "'Do you dare to accuse me of robbing my own steamer, sir?' he cried, shaking a weather-bronzed fist at the detective. "'I don't accuse anybody. Yet,' Renter answered quietly. "'But I have just stated a fact you can't deny. And, Captain, every man, woman, and child who is on the Humboldt is under suspicion till this mystery is cleared.' Sit down, and we'll get the brass tacks. You have told me that you and the purser together locked the door of the vault immediately after the gold was placed there at Nome, and that your key never left the belt you wear around your waist night and day. Are you absolutely sure that's the truth? Absolutely, said McNaughton. Your key was never out of your possession for an instant? No passenger or officer went to you with a story of something to be put in or taken out of the strong room? Think carefully, Captain, and remember your reputation is at stake in this matter. The key never left my body, McNaughton answered without hesitation. No one asked to have the strong room open for any purpose whatsoever, and I wouldn't have permitted it if it had been asked. It is specially prohibited by the company that the treasure room be opened at sea when we're carrying the gnome gold and I obey orders. No, Renner, from the moment I locked up the bullion, the key never left my belt. The captain sat a moment, thinking. On the northbound trip, when the strong room was empty, he began, then paused, suddenly hesitant. Yes, yes, on the northbound trip when the strong room was empty. What happened then? demanded Renter eagerly. I remember now that Purser Jessen came to me and asked for my key. He wanted to show our treasure room to some curious passenger, the captain replied with reluctance. But that means nothing. We could have left the strong room door open if we had chosen. There was nothing inside then to be stolen. Renter bent over his desk and hid the eager, praying light in his eyes as he fumbled for another cigar. How long did this Mr. Jessen have both the keys? he demanded with the exultant ring of unhoped-for triumph in his voice. A half hour, possibly an hour. I didn't notice particularly. The captain now is grave and plainly worried. Don't jump to conclusions because of what I've told you, Chief. I know Jessen. I knew his father, the old captain. And a finer, straighter man never walked a ship's bridge. I've known young Dave since the days when I dandled him on my knee when he wore short breeches. I've seen him grow up and become the ship's officer in line for a command of his own some day. He had no hand in this crooked business. No, sir, Dave Jessen's like his dad. Straight. Renter leaped up with a scoffing, worldly-wise smile on his lips. Because you held this fellow on your knee when he was a boy, that's no reason he mightn't be a crook, he cried belligerently. If his father was honest, that's no reason he is. And I'll tell you now, we'll prove he isn't. While he had your key, he did one of two things. Either he made a duplicate of it himself, or he gave it to a confederate who did. Dave Jessen's the man who robbed or helped to rob the Humboldt, and in twenty-four hours I'll have his confession. Captain McNaughton shook his head in firm unbelief. Call him down and talk to him, he suggested. If he knows anything, he'll tell you gladly. But don't do anything to ruin his prospects. Reputation is about all we seafaring men have that we can't afford to lose. If you were to hold him, even on suspicion, he'd never command a ship as long as he lives. Besides, he has a mother, old and feeble, and it isn't my business to worry about men's mothers or reputations. I put men behind bars who belong there. This young crook is going into a cell, and in a cell he'll stay till he tells me who stole the Humboldt's gold or signs a confession that he did it himself. Where does he live? Captain McNaughton gave the address and went out sorrowfully with bowed head. Ten minutes later, two detectives in a police auto were on their way to Jessen's home to take him into custody as a suspect in the bullion robbery. Maybe Jessen did this, and maybe he didn't. 
Chief Renter mused as he impatiently awaited the car's return. There's better than an even chance that he's really guilty, but whether he is or not, one thing is certain. I've found a goat and a bit of incriminating evidence that will justify the pinch in the newspapers. One after another he pulled the knuckles of his big hands until the joints cracked like pistols. That was Larry Renter's way of expressing extraordinary jubilance. He was planning the details of the third degree by which he hoped to extort a confession that would clear the Humboldt mystery. The door of the Jessen home was opened to the detectives by a sweet-faced little woman with snow-white hair and age-dimmed eyes. "'My son is at home. I'll call him,' she said in response to the detective's inquiry. Dave Jessen, roused from a daydream in which he stood again on the Humboldt's deck, beside a dark-eyed girl with sun-tinted cheeks and wind-blown hair, appeared behind his mother. Mrs. Jessen vanished. "'Put on your hat and coat, Jessen. The chief wants to see you,' said Mulligan, spokesman of the paired officers. "'Sure. I'll be with you in a jiffy,' the purser agreed, dropping the nautical book in his hand. "'Mother!' he cried. "'I'm going down to police headquarters, but I'll be back in time for the dinner you've been fussing over all afternoon so foolishly.' He kissed her and followed the detectives to the auto waiting at the curb. "'What's happened, boys?' he inquired as they climbed into the car. "'Have you caught the bullion robber?' "'I reckon we have. Now,' said one detective pointedly. He drew a pair of handcuffs from his pocket and deftly slipped them over Dave Jessen's wrists. The first instinctive flush of anger on the purser's cheek faded, leaving him pale beneath his sea tan. "'You're arresting me?' he gasped in bewilderment. "'I'm accused of the gold robbery?' "'Looks that way. What do you think yourself?' replied the detective. "'This is ridiculous. It's an outrage!' cried Jessen, straining his wrists against the steel circlet so hatefully new to them. I know nothing of the missing gold except what I've told. I'm not a thief. Prison is full of men I've heard say those identical words when they were arrested, said the detective. Save all that guff for the chief, young fella. All I got to say to you is that you're three times seven kinds of fool to get yourself tangled in a mess like this. A nice old mother you got, too. It'll go hard with her when she learns what you've done up to. "'But, man, I didn't do it. I have neither done nor said anything to justify the faintest doubt of my honesty,' cried Jessen. "'Who dares say I robbed the Humboldt? Who accuses me?' The detectives smiled at each other knowingly. "'You'll find out soon enough,' replied Mulligan's partner. "'Take good advice and forget that high and mighty stuff before we get to the chief. He has a real dope on you.' Then, though Jessen, outraged, angry, and credulous, asked a dozen fiercely insistent questions, the two officers maintained an omniscient silence until the car stopped at detective headquarters. The prisoner leaped to the sidewalk in advance of his guardians. "'Take me to Chief Renter, quick,' he demanded. "'Somebody will suffer for this, for it won't take me ten minutes to clear myself of whatever charge some irresponsible blunderer has made against me.' "'Easy, lad, easy,' cautioned the first of the officers, taking him by the arm and into the building through a private entrance. "'You'll see the chief, all right, but don't be in a hurry. Time is one thing you'll have to spare from now on.' Fretting with rage and impatience, Jessen was taken into a private room, where his name was entered in the detinue, or small book, a police device, unlawful, but that is a mere detail for holding prisoners against whom the department is not ready to make a public accusation. He was searched and relieved of papers, watch, penknife, money, and all other trinkets in his pockets. Then he was pushed into a dimly lighted steel cage, and its massive door clanged behind him. A bolt shot into its sockets. The footsteps of the departing officers died away. Many minutes, each longer than any hour Jessen had ever passed, dragged away while he paced the steel floor. "'It's only a few minutes,' he kept assuring himself. "'I'm innocent. They can't keep me in this filthy den. It isn't possible.' But the minutes dragged into hours, and no one came. Meanwhile, the arresting officers were reporting. "'How'd he take it?' asked Renter, cracking his knuckles. "'Mad as a she-bear, and stands pat he knows nothing,' 
answered Mulligan. Naturally, he'd do that, said the chief. You couldn't expect a man with nerve enough to pull a stunt like this steamer robbery to cough up at the first touch of the cuffs. He'll come across, though. I'll leave him in there alone to sweat a while. Tonight we'll spring the phony identification stuff, and then I'll be ready to talk turkey to him. End of chapter 16《of Boston Blackie》by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Third Degree Chief Renter then climbed into his auto and was driven home to dine leisurely, while at Dave Jessen's bungalow a little old woman who reminded one of a fading flower fretted nervously as she kept an overdone dinner hot for the son who didn't and couldn't come. It was early in the evening, though Jessen was sure it must be early morning, when a door opened noisily in the corridor, and he heard voices nearing his cell. "'At last!' he cried, springing eagerly to the door. Suddenly his cell was flooded with light, though the corridor beyond remained in darkness. He waited, hot with impatience, for the welcome sound of the jailer's key in the lock. Instead, a wicket in the door was lifted, and a pair of eyes peered in from the outer darkness. There was a moment's silence, then a man's voice spoke. "'That's him,' it said. "'I could swear to him on a hundred Bibles.' "'Good,' replied Mulligan's heavy voice. "'We thought we had him right, but this settles it.' The wicket dropped, and the men started down the corridor. "'Come back!' shouted Jessen as he realized that they did not intend to release him. "'Take me out of this hole! I demand to be taken to the chief!' Somebody's laugh came back through the darkness, as the door at the far end of the corridor closed with a bang. Ten minutes later the same performance was repeated, and a new voice assured the detective that it would know that fellow's face anywheres. Again Jessen's shouts and demands remained unanswered, and the lights winked out. For the first time, though the consciousness of innocence buoyed his drooping spirits, a numbing horror of the inconceivable thing that had happened overwhelmed him, exactly as Chief Renter intended. Back from dinner, Renter crackled his knuckles noisily as his men reported the prisoner's shouts and violent demands for a hearing, following the faked identifications. "'Fine,' he ejaculated. "'That stuff always jars their nerves, whether they're innocent or guilty. He's ripe now for a friendly heart-to-heart -heart talk. Bring him in, boys. And see that the detectaphone operator is on my line, ready to get every word that's spoken in here. I'll cut out the parts of the talk I don't need afterward. That sympathy stuff you told us to spill about his mother seemed to hit him hard, suggested Mulligan. That's a trump card, replied the chief. Lead in the lamb and forget the bawling out I'm going to give you, boys. I want him to think I'm a friend. Jessen, fresh from the gloom of his cell, stumbled at the threshold as the detectives threw open the door of the chief's office. They pushed him roughly into a chair, his hands still bound by the steel cuffs, and the glare of a desk lamp full upon his face. "'Who is this?' asked Renter, looking up from a pile of reports in simulated surprise. "'Not Dave Jessen, handcuffed. Take off those bracelets, Mulligan.' "'They've had me locked in a dirty cell for hours, chief.' interrupted Jessen. I demanded to be brought here to you, but they only laughed. I told you to bring Jessen here to my office, but I didn't give you permission to treat him like a common crook, roared the chief angrily at his men. I knew this boy's father before he was born, and no matter what sort of trouble he is in, he will be treated right while he's in my custody, you blockheads, or I'll know why not. I didn't think it safe to take any chances after those two positive identifications, chief said Mulligan in mock humility, and you being out for dinner, I thought— You pay to do what you're told, not to try to think, interrupted Renter. Get those cuffs off his wrists and get out. I want to talk to this boy alone. As the door closed behind the detectives, the chief motioned Jessen to draw his chair closer. His manner was grave, sorrowful, deeply sympathetic. Dave, you're up against it hard. I'm your friend when it's going to take every bit of influence I can swing to keep you out of stripes. He began with the air of a man who regrets his bad news. Old Clancy wants you prosecuted to the limit. 
How the devil did you ever come to lose your head and get tangled up in a mess of this kind? Prosecute me, echoed the prisoner. Surely you can't believe I'm guilty of the robbery on the Humboldt chief. On oh, my word of honor, I'm as innocent as you. I— Renter interrupted by laying a friendly hand on Justin's arm. Don't, Dave, he cautioned kindly. It's useless to deny facts. I'm your friend, willing to go the limit for you. But you must be square with me. If there are others in this job, and you help to land them and get back the gold, I think I can save you, and I'll do it for the sake of your old mother and your dead father, God bless him. But you must tell me the whole truth. I've brought you in here alone so that no one but me will ever hear what you tell me tonight. It's your one chance, boy, and for the sake of your mother, who's worrying herself into hysterics already, don't throw it away. Chief, I'm innocent, but it is evident some blunderer has given you reason to believe me guilty, replied Jessen. I'll clear myself to your full satisfaction in ten minutes if you'll tell me exactly on what grounds you suspect me. Renter drew further into the shadow of the shaded lamps and fixed his eyes on the purser's face to catch the slightest betraying change of expression. Evidence against you has been coming in for two days, he began, but I'll ask one question that will show why we first suspected you. He paused, then thrust his face close to Jessen's and spat out his question viciously. What did you do with the two keys of the treasure room while they were both in your possession? I never had both keys, answered Jessen, unperturbed and without hesitation. From the moment we locked the gold in at Nome, Captain McNaughton— Wait, interrupted Renter peremptorily. I didn't say you had both keys after the gold was shipped. You couldn't have got them then. But on the way up to Nome, Jessen, how about that? Have you forgotten your story to the captain about showing the strong room to a curious passenger? You're right about that admitted the purser slowly. I did get the captain's key while we were on the way up. But what of that? The treasure room was empty then. I borrowed the captain's key to show the strong room to a, to a, a passenger, one whom I had told of the millions in gold we would carry there on the trip home. How can you connect that with a robbery many days afterward? Renter was cracking his knuckles as he answered, because, while Captain McNaughton's key was in your hands, duplicates of it, and of your key as well, were made for the bullion robbers, who used the duplicates later to remove the padlock when there was something in the strong room well worth taking. With growing exultation, Renter saw the blood drain away from Justin's cheeks. Instantly he knew that his bold guess had found a vulnerable mark. What happened to those keys while they were in your possession? he snapped. Did you let them go out of your hands, or did you yourself make duplicates? Justin's eyes wavered and fell. For the first time, doubt of the ultimate outcome of his interview with the chief crept into his mind. I made no duplicates, he said nervously. Neither key was out of my hands except for a single instant. He paused, and Renter leaned forward, eager for the all-important admission to follow. While we were in the empty treasure room, Justin continued, the person to whom I was showing it remarked it was curious. Such frail bits of metal could protect such vast treasure as I described. My companion took the keys from my hand and held them for a second. One dropped. She picked it up from the floor before I could stoop and handed both to me. A woman, cried Renter, springing triumphantly to his feet at Justin's use of the feminine pronoun. I might have known there was a woman at the bottom of a job as clever as this. When she dropped the key and stooped for it, she took wax impressions of both of them, of course. That stunt's as old as the hills. Who is this woman? She's the party I want now. Jessen's chin dropped to his chest. His strong brown hands were clenched. There was a long pause, during which the thought that he had been tricked by the girl he had learned to love on that last ill-fated voyage, the girl whose gentle no, when he had asked for her hand, had not lessened his love, seared his brain like molten metal. Could she have been guilty of playing upon that love? Her face, sweet, 
kind and innocent, rose before him, and because he loved her, denied the accusation convincingly. If he named her, she, a woman, would be subjected to the tortures he was enduring. They might put her in a cell as they had him. Jessen straightened in his chair and met Renter's piercing eyes squarely. "'I won't tell you her name,' Jessen said quietly. "'It wouldn't be right. I know she isn't a crook, but you won't believe that. You would do to her what you are doing to me. I won't name her.' "'You'll go to the penitentiary if you persist in protecting this woman, Crook. "'You understand that, don't you?' asked Renter. "'If necessary, I'll go,' replied Jessen wearily. "'If this girl's innocent, I won't harm her. "'If she's guilty, unless you are her accomplice, "'why should you be willing to do time to protect her?' "'Renter asked, probing the one phase of the situation that still puzzled him. Jessen's apparently quixotic determination to sacrifice himself for a casual steamer acquaintance. "'I'm innocent, and you've harmed me,' the purser answered. The pair studied each other eye to eye. "'Chief,' began Jessen at last, with a note of boyish appeal in his voice, "'I can understand how my refusal to name the girl who, unfortunately, has been dragged into this case, may seem suspicious to a man like you.' whose business makes it necessary to suspect everybody. Even so, there's a spark of humanity in you, I'm sure. For her sake and mine, I'm going to tell you everything, and then I know you'll not demand her name. Go on, said Renter encouragingly. She was a passenger on the Humboldt, making the round trip to Alaska with us, Jessen continued. She was alone, and I tried to make the trip pleasant for her, first for duty's sake, and then— when I grew to know her, because I treasured every moment I could be near her. Long before we reached Nome, I knew she is the one woman I want and shall always want for my wife. Ah! On the return trip, I asked her to marry me. She told me there is someone else, and Jessen raised a hand to shield himself from the coldly piercing eyes that never wavered from his face. I'm glad she's going to be happy. That's all there is to tell, Chief. Now you'll understand why I can't let the unlucky chance that led to the incident of the keys permit me to involve her even remotely in such a case as this. No decent man could do that. I know she's not a crook. Such a girl couldn't be. Renter pressed the button that summoned the waiting officers. Now I've got you just where I want you, my bucko, he exclaimed gleefully. The one thing I lacked to make my case complete was a motive that would explain why you try to protect the woman. You have just given it to me, the oldest and best motive in the world. Will you give me the name of this she-crook? Never, said Jessen. Take him away, boys, Renter ordered as his men appeared in the doorway. Tell Clark to take this fellow's Bertillon measurements and to mug him the first thing in the morning so I can give the afternoon papers his pictures tomorrow. This has been a neat piece of work, if I did do it myself. Jessen, as he rose to follow his guards, looked down on burly Larry Renter, half in hatred, half in scorn. I understand now how crooks are made, Jessen said, in a voice whose evenness failed to hide the tempests of bitter anger that shook him from head to foot. Larry Renter merely laughed. When Jessen had been lodged again in his cell, the chief called in four of his best men and gave them instructions for the continuation of the third degree. Handcuff him to a chair and keep at him without a second's let-up all night, he ordered. Never let him close his eyes. Never let him rest. Keep up a perfect stream of questions and drag answers out of him any way you can. Play on his love for his mother. Pretend that we have taken over the house to search it and turned her out. Pretend that we think she may have been implicated and that she is to be brought down here in the morning for the same kind of a deal he's getting. We'll take her through one of the cells for an instant tomorrow and let him see her there. That'll fetch him. Now go to it, boys. By the way, somebody better go out and talk to the old lady. She might tell something worth knowing. The men filed out. The result was a night of horror that Dave Jessen never forgot and never recalled without a shudder. 
While the stenographer was transcribing those portions of Jesson's statement in which he admitted having both strong room keys, admitted that he had given them momentarily into the possession of a woman passenger, and in which he flatly refused to give her name, Chief Renter analyzed the results of his night's work. Jesson has told the truth from beginning to end, he decided. First, he was this unknown woman's goat. Now he is mine. It's a hundred to one without takers that she made impressions of the keys during the moment he left them in her hands. She had pals aboard, and of course they turned the trick. The chief chewed his cigar reflectively, and his thoughts brought a look of shrewd and ruthless cunning to his eyes. It's the luckiest thing in the world that this fellow is fool enough to refuse me the girl's name, he thought. If he had not done that, he would practically have cleared himself and put me up against the problem of finding the girl. As things stand now, I've almost got enough on Jesson to make a showing in court, and if I never find the woman of the gold, he gets all the blame. Anyway, it's a safe bet now that old man Clancy will be satisfied I'm big enough for my job. The fox-like cunning in the eyes beneath Renter's shaggy brows deepened. If Tatman would say Jesson is the man who hit him in front of the strong-room door, it was directly opposite Jesson's own door, too, my case would look good even before a jury, he reflected. That would be the final link of the chain. I'll have a talk with him. He ordered Tatman up from his cell. Tatman, said Renter when they were alone, Purser Jesson has been booked for complicity in the bullion robbery. He took both keys to the strong room on the northbound voyage, and admits he allowed them to go into the hands of a woman on board. He refuses to give her name. Were there any crooks on the Humboldt, either men or women, that you knew? The ex-convict shook his head. The chief continued, You're likely to stay inside a cell for a long time, Tatman. I'm fairly well satisfied you weren't in on this, but I can't let you go until I've cinched somebody. You understand that. Tatman grinned without replying. He was an old hand at the game, and knew the chief's sudden consideration had an explanation. I've just been thinking, Tatman, that if you had caught a glimpse of the face of the man who hit you, and that man happened to be Purser Jesson, I wouldn't have any object in keeping you after you had identified him in court, continued Renter insinuatingly. It would be a mighty lucky break for you, old-timer, if you happen to be able to make that identification. I get you, Chief, said the convict. Leave me to him when you like. It might have been him, for all I know, and anyway, he's only a square shooter. Leave me to him. That's my answer. You understand I want only the truth, cautioned the detective. Tatman grinned knowingly. I understand, he repeated. End of chapter 17Eighteen of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Answer in Grand Larceny. The following morning, the papers told of Jesson's arrest in flaring headlines, Boston Blackie's Mary in the seclusion of a friend's flat in which she was awaiting the day when Blackie now out of town, judged it safe to return for the Humboldt's gold, felt a sickening sense of guilt grow with each line she read. "'Poor boy! What a shame!' she murmured with deep regret. "'What hopeless bunglers the coppers are!' When she read the account of her visit to the strong-room under Jesson's guidance, and Renter's assertion that she had taken wax impressions of the keys during the brief moment they were in her possession, the furrows in her brow deepened into wrinkles of concern. A shrewd guess that hits the mark, but that doesn't involve the purser, she thought. Then she came to a paragraph that brought a mist of tears to her eyes. It was the paragraph that quoted Jesson's statement to Renter that he declined to give her name, that he would go to prison himself rather than involve her. Oh, oh, tell them, tell them, she cried as if the accused man were within hearing. It can't harm me. Surely you must guess now that the name and address I gave you were both fictitious. Then in a flash, because she was a woman with womanly intuition, she understood why Jesson had answered never to the police demand for her name. He believes me innocent, 
Mary murmured, awed by the proof of what principle may cost those who have it. He still thinks I am what I seemed, an innocent girl, a girl about to be married, who would be ruined by a breath of scandal such as this. And because he believes that, he is sacrificing himself to save me. She sprang to her feet and paced the room with clenched hands and cheeks wet with tears of compassion. It's the rightest act I ever knew, she sobbed. They shan't railroad this poor, loyal boy. Oh, how I pity his distracted, broken-hearted old mother! What have Blackie and I done? What shall I do? Like an answering message, the thought of Judge Mortimer Garber came to her. Judge Garber was an attorney of long-proved ability whose specialty was criminal law. He was a trusted neutral in frequent negotiations between the police and the crook world, for he never betrayed to either the secrets of its warring adversary. He despised police chicanery and hated thug brutality. He was respected, feared, and trusted by both classes. As Mary was ushered into his office, he was frowning over the newspaper accounts of the Jessen identification by Tatman. "'Well, well, Mary!' the judge exclaimed cordially. "'It has been a long, long time since either you or Blackie paid me a visit. Sit down and tell me all about it. I can see that you are in trouble.' Mary slipped a hundred-dollar bill from her purse and pushed it across the table. "'I want you to take a case for me, Judge Garber. There's a retainer. The lawyer handed back the money. Tell me the case first, he said. We'll discuss the fee later. It's the Humboldt bullion robbery, began Mary. I thought so the moment I saw you at the door, interrupted Garber. It's fortunate. I am a lawyer instead of a detective, Mary. When I read the first accounts of this affair, which for sheer ingenuity stands alone, I said to myself, the one man I know who might have done this is Boston Blackie. Was this boy Dave Jessen mixed in it with you? He was not, Judge. That's why I'm here. Renter is trying to frame him, said Mary. I suspected that. The moment I read that this tame crook Tatman has suddenly recovered his memory and identified Jessen. I'm glad that Vlad isn't implicated. Old Captain Jessen was my good friend for many years, and the boy has the dearest old mother in the world. Tell me the story from the beginning. Mary told it, omitting nothing, mitigating nothing. The old judge was muttering angrily to himself long before she finished. So this rat renter, who is getting rich on the graft he is collecting from gambling houses and the red light dens, thinks he'll make a reputation by railroading to prison a boy whose only crime is that he is too decent to ruin a girl's reputation, growled Garber. He won't succeed as long as I keep my southern blood and remain a member of the Seattle Bar. He looked across the table at Mary with shrewd but kindly eyes. Well, what do you and Blackie want to do about it? he demanded. Blackie isn't here, said Mary. If he were in town, he'd know what should be done. But I'm alone. That's why I came to you. I thought that when I told you the circumstances, you might be willing to take Jessen's case and clear him. We'll stand all expenses, if you will. I can't see that boy Jessen ruin, Judge, added Mary. The attorney pondered with half-closed eyes and touching fingertips. With the information you have given me, I can acquit him without a doubt, before any jury that can be dragged together in the state of Washington, he said at last. But Mary, my dear, has it occurred to you that a mere acquittal won't do? If Jessen even goes to trial on this charge, it will wreck his career and probably send his mother to her grave. You've shouldered a heavy responsibility, girl. I know, she cried, and I'm frantic with remorse. What can be done? If you went to Clancy of the steamship company and told him you know positively that Jessen is entirely innocent of any connection with the robbery, he would believe you. And Clancy is a man important enough to have his way at detective headquarters. He could have Jessen set free within an hour with an apology from Renter to take home with him. Clancy could do that, but he wouldn't, 
said Garber. He would never see any man free whose stubbornness was causing him a chance to get back sixty thousand dollars. Stubbornness due to what Clancy would think a silly scruple. My judgment is that if he knew all you have just told me, he would wring your name from Jesson or see him hanged if he had his way. Jim Clancy is a man with a soul dead to all feeling that cannot spring from a dollar mark, Mary. That's true, and I hate him, said Mary furiously, letting long-nourished resentment reveal itself. He sent my father to prison, wrongly, Judge, and Dad died there. Afterward, when the truth was discovered and Clancy was forced to admit that he had blundered, he stated to the papers that the mistake was less regrettable, because poor old Dad was no benefit either to himself or to society. The principal reason Blackie and I attempted this robbery is because Jim Clancy owns the Humboldt. That's Clancy with photographic accuracy, assented Garber. Well, Mary, Jesson's predicament is a hard proposition. Shall we abandon it as hopeless now and content ourselves with doing something when he goes to trial? No, no, she said. Wait, Judge, please. I'm trying to decide something. Ten, fifteen, twenty minutes passed. It's all right now, Judge, she said resignedly at last. I've decided. If you will trust us for your fee until Blackie gets money, you can call up Jim Clancy and tell him you know where his gold bars are and that you will return them to him ten minutes after Mr. Jessen is free and in possession of a written document from the Northwestern Steamship Company that admits his innocence and guarantees his position on its steamers. It's hard to give up the day of righteous reckoning for which you've waited and prayed year after year, but, with a wry smile, it's worth even that price to feel as content as I do since I decided to forego revenge for a clear conscience. A faint glow of gratification flushed the old lawyer's cheeks. "'Child, have you thought what Blackie will say to this?' he suggested gently. "'Do you realize that you are planning to give away sixty thousand dollars that, according to his code, rightfully belongs to him?' "'Neither Blackie and I care about the money. The two things that worried me most were the debt I owe Clancy and can't pay now and the fact that all of the sixty thousand dollars doesn't belong to us. We owe fourteen thousand five hundred to those who helped us get the gold safely ashore. But we have enough bank to pay that off. I've just figured it up. We'll have just twenty dollars left when we're done. That's why I told you you would have to wait for your fee. The old judge wiped his glasses. Will Blackie approve this, Mary? Of course. Blackie always does right, no matter what the cost, she answered, utterly unconscious of the naivete of the verdict she so confidently pronounced upon a man with a nationwide reputation as a criminal. He would never forgive me if I let a boy who had proved himself right ruin himself for my sake. Call up, Clancy, Judge. I want to feel sure that Jessen will be at home before night. Garber reached for his phone with a hand that was tremulously eager. "'By the way,' he said, "'you haven't yet told me where those trouble-making bars of gold are to be found.' Mary opened her purse and tossed a bit of metal across the table. "'There's the key of the safe-deposit box Blackie rented months ago for the gold,' she said, smiling. "'It's in Jim Clancy's own vaults.' "'Ho!' Oh, chuckled the man delightedly. That's a joke on the old skinflint that will be told on him to the last day he breathes, even though he outages Methuselah. I wouldn't miss the sight of his face when I show him the missing gold stored in his own deposit vault for all his millions. What's your fee, Judge? said Mary, rising. Fee? shouted Judge Garber wrathfully. Get out of my office, young woman, before I call my stenographer and have you thrown out. When I take a fee for an afternoon's work like this, I'll change my name to Clancy. Suddenly he stooped and kissed her gently on the forehead. Permit an old man that privilege, my dear, he said with the graceful deference of the old school gentleman. I'm honored in calling you and that mad scapegrace husband of yours my very dear friends. 
A quick answer to her SOS to Blackie bade her take the night train to Spokane. The following afternoon in Spokane, looking into Boston Blackie's face from the stool beside his chair, as she finished relating how old Jim Clancy's wandering bars of gold had found their way back to his covetous fingers, she entreated, "'Tell me I did right, dear. Tell me I did what you would have done.' "'Right? Of course you did right. My girl never did anything else. She couldn't,' declared Blackie, echoing the words Mary had spoken of him to Judge Garber. Always remember, Mary, that an honest crook can afford anything but crooked honesty. The smile of happiness in Mary's eyes just then was worth more to Boston Blackie than all the gold the Humboldt ever carried. Blackie gravely flicked the glowing end of his cigarette. How much money have we in bank, dear? he asked. We must give the others their bid on the day I named. We can't give away their money. Enough, said Mary. But we will have only... Twenty dollars left. Twenty dollars and a crystal-like conscience, corrected Blackie jubilantly. Why, Mary, dear, we're rich. End of chapter 18of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Alibi Ann It's good to be home again, dear, said Mary, sinking wearily into a chair as Blackie dropped suitcases and put an arm caressingly about her shoulders. Home again, broke but not broken, little girl, he answered. Let's check up on that bankroll, and then I'll get busy. He emptied his pockets. Ten dollars and thirty cents, he counted. We owe Frank Cavanis one hundred dollars we borrowed for the trip home, too. Well, what does it matter? I'll go down to old Mother McGinn and borrow a thousand, and then we'll go out and get enough in the night to give us a good long rest. I'm better satisfied since you gave back that sixty thousand dollars than I have been in ten years. It's proof to myself that we really live up to the code we preach. I'm off to Mother McGinn. I'll be back for dinner. Rest, meanwhile, little sweetheart. No one ever knew how or where Alibi Ann found the glad rags kid. She had been absent from her haunts in San Francisco for a fortnight. Nothing unusual, for Ann was accustomed to make solitary pilgrimages out of town that invariably caused consternation and frenzied but futile activity in the detective department of the Jewelers Protective Association. Then, Unexpectedly, as always, she appeared one night before the barred doors of the Palms Hotel, rendezvous and sanctuary of the elect among the powers that pray, and whistled up the speaking tube to the cage-like cubbyhole where old Mother McGinn, knitting interminably, had sat for many years answering such summonses from the strange and furtive company that frequented her house. "'It's me, Mother,' said Anne softly into the tube. At the sound of her voice, the door swung open. Anne and her companion entered, and the doors closed behind them. As they climbed the stairs, Mother McGinn's quick ear detected the double step, and she appeared suddenly on the floor above them, gazing down suspiciously. "'It's all right, Mother,' said Anne quickly. "'He's with me.' Mother McGinn stared in speechless amazement. There was a new and strangely buoyant quality in Alibi Ann's voice, and with her was a man. No wonder Mother McGinn almost unbelievably watched them ascend the dingy, ill-lighted stairway. For many, many years Ann's proudest boast had been her solitary spinsterhood. During the eventful double decade that had passed since Ann, then a young girl, had first been admitted to the Palms, many men of many kinds had made love to her in many ways. Some she had scorned silently, some she had laughed at gaily, some she had withered with the biting sarcasm of a ready tongue and a fertile wit, and to none had she ever listened. Yet now she was climbing the stairs of the familiar old hotel with a stranger, one who, had he appeared alone, might have whistled out his lungs without gaining admittance. It passed belief. 
Alibi Ann dropped her suitcase at the door of the tiny office. Her companion dropped another beside it. And as the light fell full upon him, Mother McGee, in one quick, curious glance, sought to appraise him. She saw a youth who manifestly tried to belie immaturity beneath a self-conscious swagger that accentuated it. He was good-looking, in a way, though a weak chin and self-indulgent mouth marred an otherwise attractive face. But Mother McGinn forgot his features in her wonder at his clothes, the last word an exaggeration as to both style and pattern. A mammoth diamond horseshoe scintillated from his tie. His Panama hat was one of the kind that is weighed by the ounce and priced by its weight in gold. He wore spats. Alibi Ann laid a trembling hand on the old woman's shoulder, and Mother McGinn, looking at her for the first time, saw that her eyes were bright and eager, and her cheeks flushed as they never before had been. Mother, said Ann with a queer little break in her voice, meet my husband, Tom Coyne. Met her, Tom. Mother McGinn's the pal of all the gang. The old woman stuck out a gnarled and withered hand and clasped the newcomer's palm. Gracious Peter, your husband! she ejaculated, turning to Anne. Congratulations, folks. Then an aside to the girl. We'll all have to hand it to you, Annie, my dear. You were a long time picking one, but when you did, you sure grabbed the original glad rags kid. Right there, Tom Coyne ceased to exist. From that moment, in the world of Alibi Ann and her kind, he was the glad rags kid. Mother McGinn had given him his moniker. "'Are Boston Blackie and the bunch upstairs?' asked Anne. "'Sure. Smoking in the chink room,' answered the old woman. "'Take your man up and let them give him the double O. The kid in his clothes will astonish him all right. He'll give the crowd something to chew about all night.' "'Not tonight, Mother,' said Anne. "'But I wish you'd slip Blackie the news about me.' and tell him I'm going out to the flat tomorrow to see his Mary. I want a long talk with her. And send old Crowder the fence down. We've brought back a swell bunch of stones, and we want dough. We're going to scatter some, Tom and me." Mother McGinn, chuckling hoarsely, made a gesture indicating the pulling of a champagne cork. "'No, no,' corrected Anne. "'Nothing like that for us. We've a better way than that to blow our coin.' We. Us? Our? echoed the old woman pointedly, for Anne, until now, had always prided herself in making her money alone and spending it as she made it, alone. We is right, said Anne softly. It's fifty-fifty between Tom and me. Fifty-fifty now and always, in good luck or bad, eh, Tom? That's it. Fifty-fifty in good luck or bad, repeated the glad rags kid with wholehearted enthusiasm. Alibi Ann's eyes, as she looked up at him, revealed the possibilities that lie latent and hidden, except for one man, in all women's eyes. But the glad rags kid missed their message. He was too young, too self-centered, too unthinking even to perceive the heights to which love had raised the woman the world called Alibi Ann. Next day Ann called on her friend Mary. Yes, it's like that with me, Mary said Anne, as she told of her marriage, and I'm so happy that sometimes I wake in the night shivering with dread for fear it's only a dream. Anne's words answered the thought in the mind of Boston Blackie's Mary, who realized from the moment of her visitor's appearance to the little apartment that a new and vastly altered alibi Anne had taken the place of the self-sufficient, cynical diamond thief she knew so well. A new and different world is opening itself to Anne. Mary thought. Love is a whole lot like the measles, Mary, Anne continued after a pause. The longer you escape it, the harder it hits you when it does come. Until I met the glad rags kid, I never knew how empty and lonely my life was. I never knew what I was missing. I never knew how ignorant I am. Say, Mary, if you turn me loose at the diamond counter of a swell store, I can handle myself. But in the kitchen— I'm as helpless as a three-year-old kid. But I'm going to learn, quick. Any half-wise flapper can steal for a man, 
but it takes class to cook for one so he'll like it. Am I right or am I wrong, Mary? You've learned a lot about life and the road to happiness, and how long is it, Anne? A week. Just one little week, and it's worth more to me than all the years that went before it. When I think that maybe there are hundreds of such weeks ahead, I begin to tremble. I know I don't deserve them, and it don't seem possible there can be that much happiness in the world. How long have you and Blackie been together? Seven years and a month. Seven years, each three hundred and sixty-five days long, and on every one of those days you've known you've had the love of the man you love. You're the luckiest girl living, Mary. There was a long silence in which a faintly troubling thought slowly furrowed Anne's brow. Do you know how old I am, Mary? asked Anne at last. Mary shook her head. In my thirties, well along in them, said Anne almost defiantly. Mary made no comment. And the kid is twenty-four and doesn't even look that. Alibi Anne gave the information with deeper, far deeper anxiety than she would have made the announcement that police were breaking in the door. Then she added, Mary, do you think that that need make any difference in the years to come? It doesn't matter if you really love each other, Mary answered, and she slipped an arm around her friend and drew her closer. The unspoken message of sympathy and understanding reopened the floodgates of Alibi Anne's overfull heart. Can you guess what we're planning, the kid and I? She began reverently as one approaching a sacred subject. You will understand, Mary, for you love Blackie. We're planning a home, a real home, one like this. We're not going to have fuss and frills and things made for show instead of for comfort. The kid and I want a place to live in, just for us two. It's going to have big, deep, easy chairs and cushions everywhere, and an open fireplace that we can enjoy together in the evenings. All the little comforts a man wants and enjoys without knowing what they are will be there. And when it's all ready, I'm not going to let Tom set his foot inside the door until it's ready. Then I'll show it all to him, and we'll sit down to dinner at our own table. She clasped her hands and looked up with glowing eyes. And then, Mary, there'll be a little bit of heaven right here in old Frisco. And what will there be for you, Anne, in this bit of heaven? asked Mary, tightening her clasp around the shoulders of the woman the newspapers had often called the most dangerous and incorrigible of professional criminals. For me? Why, for me, there's going to be a cook stove, the best I can buy, replied Anne, laughing happily as a child. I'm going to get a cookbook today, which is the best, Mary, and learn it by heart. I've got to. For when the kid and I decided on a home of our own, he asked me if I could cook. And I said, You just wait and see, Tom, after you eat the first dinner I give you. Pure bluff, Mary. But I'll deliver the goods, believe me, even though I've never made a cup of coffee or fried a steak. Broiled a steak, corrected Mary. You see, what a simp I am about things that are really worth knowing. I don't even know what the difference is. That's one reason I'm up here now. I want you to help me make a list of things I'll need and tell me where to get them. I'm going to plan it all, just as if it were the biggest diamond job I ever tried to put over. It's the biggest job of my life, Mary. Long after Alibi Anne had gone, list in hand, flushed and radiant with the excitement of her great adventure, Mary sat weighing the chances of her friend. Her face betrayed indecision. Anne is right. It's the biggest job she ever undertook, Mary murmured to herself. A key turned in the lock, and she jumped up to throw her arms around Boston Blackie and drag him to a chair, while she drew up a footstool from which she could look into his face. Alibi Ann has been up here all afternoon, she began, and she's bound up heart and soul in the plan she's making for a wonderful little home, just like this, she added with a little smile that meant more than words to her husband. Her new husband has been down at the Palms all afternoon, and he's bound up heart and soul in the plans he's making to corner the diamond market of the world. With Anne's help, said Blackie. What sort is he, Blackie? asked Mary anxiously. 
He's going to make Anne as, well, as happy as I am, or as wretched as I would be without you. Blackie caught her hands and held them with a caressing touch. He's a ten-dollar check-passer, loose-tongued and vain, who's got his growth up here, tapping his forehead, about the time he went into long trousers. X, Y, and Z is where I rate him. Poor Anne, murmured Mary. Poor Anne, echoed Blackie with a deeper regret than if she were on her way to prison. Alibi Anne spent two happy days in finding a flat exactly to suit, and five other days even more deliriously happy in selecting furniture. Then she was ready for the great event, the evening on which she would proudly give the glad rags kid his first glimpse of their new home and cook his dinner for the first time with her own hands. With Mary's assistance, she planned and replanned every detail of that dinner. It was to be her great triumph, a fitting culmination of all her dearest hopes, a suitable beginning for the new life that promised a little bit of heaven in old Frisco. After an afternoon spent in helping Anne with her final preparations, Mary was back in her own apartment, recounting the events of the exciting day to Blackie, for she had caught from Anne the spirit of the occasion. "'The Gladrags kid is there now. He was to come at six, Mary said, glancing at the clock. "'Oh, I wish I could be there for just a second, to see Anne's face when he sees all she's done.' A taxicab swung around the corner on two wheels and stopped before the door. There was a hurried ring at the bell. "'Something has happened!' cried Mary as Blackie opened the door. "'He has a package and a note,' said the taxi chauffeur. "'It's from Mrs. Coyne over on Lyons Street, and she promised me a five-dollar tip if I'd get here quick enough for you to answer her over the phone in five minutes. Four minutes is up already, lady, and I need that five-spot.' Mary tore open the note and read its scribbled contents. Then she tore away the paper from the package. Within was a yellow pellet as thin and hard as a board. "'Oh, look! Look, Blackie!' she cried, midway between tears and laughter. "'It's supposed to be a biscuit!' She handed Blackie the note, and he read it aloud with occasional pauses for laughter. "'Dear Mary, Tom is here and has asked for hot biscuit with dinner. I've made them twice, exactly as the cookbook says, and they're all like the thing in the package. Dinner is ready and waiting, but I've got to have biscuit.' For the love of Mike, what's wrong? Phone me quick, or I am disgraced, and everything has been going so beautifully. Quick, Mary. And the simp. Blackie dropped the biscuit to the table. It struck with a resounding thud, bounced to the floor, and rolled away like a silver dollar. Oh, oh, this is too good, he cried, collapsing into a chair, helpless with laughter. She's making ammunition, not biscuits. "'Don't laugh, Blackie,' said Mary reprovingly. "'It's serious to poor Anne.' She recovered the sample of her friend's cookery and broke it open. It was as yellow as a grapefruit. Mary ran to the phone. Anne, evidently waiting, answered instantly. "'It's yellow, Anne, and it didn't rise at all,' Mary cried. "'It looks as if you had used baking soda.' "'What?' "'No, no, the book doesn't say baking soda.' It says baking powder, the little red can you put on the second shelf in the pantry. A teaspoon and a half, Anne, and mix the dough just as it tells you in the book. Yes, hurry. Call me after dinner. Two hours later, the phone rang. Oh, Mary, said Anne's voice softly over the wire. The biscuits were fine, and the dinner was just perfect, the kid says. When he finished, he said, no more restaurants for me, Anne. You're some cook. He's sitting before the fire, in the big chair, with his feet on a footstool. And, oh, Mary, dear, I'm so happy. Mary repeated Anne's words to Blackie as they sat together before their own fire. Her hand slipped itself into his. All Anne's eggs are in one basket, she murmured. I pray from the bottom of my heart that the bottom doesn't fall out. End of chapter 19
Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Blackie's Prophecy Comes True During the months that followed, the Glad Rags Kid became a conspicuous figure in petty police circles in San Francisco, so conspicuous that the newspapers discovered him and made the most of the discovery. He developed a perfect genius for publicity, the one indulgence a crook may not permit himself. After a trip with Anne to a Puget Sound city, a trip from which they brought back a palm full of gems that made the eyes of old Crowder gleam avariciously, the kid bought a bright vermilion racing car which a salesman solemnly assured him was an exact duplicate of Barney Oldfield's. His first taste of newspaper publicity followed the day on which he was arrested for speeding slightly over fifty miles an hour along a crowded driveway in Golden Gate Park. He appeared before the police judge next morning bedecked with diamonds and in apparel that made the room gasp and gave reporters a chance to comment humorously on the descriptive justice of his nickname. The judge fined him fifty dollars. The glad rags kid peeled a hundred dollar bill from a thick roll and tossed it to the court clerk. "'Buy yourself a smoke with a change,' he said carelessly. "'I haven't time to wait.' In a second he was gone, and an amazed courtroom through open windows heard the staccato reports of his giant motor fading away in the distance at a speed that caused the judge to remark, "'I hope to have the pleasure of finding that debonair young gentleman again.' A reporter with a real gift for fiction discovered that the Gladrag's kid was a New York gunman and the kid, though he had never seen the eastern slopes of the Sierras, tacitly confirmed the charge, and wrote a page story for his paper's Sunday magazine called New York's Man-Killers Invade the Wild West. It was profusely decorated with photographs of the kid and his newest and most startling examples of the tailoring art, and contained a circumstantial account of my bloodiest street battle over the kid's signature. The Gladrags kid clipped that page from the paper and carried it about in a wallet from which he offered it for inspection at the slightest provocation. Also he began to carry a gun, slung under his armpit crook fashion, whereby carelessly throwing back his coat he could display it in cafes and saloons when opportunity offered. "'He's a thoroughbred notoriety hound,' said Blackie disgustedly to Mary. "'His one joy is to be the spectacular figure in the center of the calcium.' It will take all of Anne's cleverness to keep them out of prison, if he keeps on. Also, he's becoming a familiar figure at the downtown restaurants and the beach dancing pavilions. Sometimes Anne is with him, and more often she isn't. I'm afraid her little bit of heaven is going to be no more than that. I know, answered Mary mournfully. She never says anything, but I can see the truth in her face. She never comes over here any more, and very seldom calls up. She don't even go downtown or to the palms. I'm afraid she spends many a lonely evening beside a big chair that's vacant by the fireplace. I never see her with a cookbook any more. The next evening, Anne called up Mary to ask if she and Blackie would dine with them at an Italian restaurant noted less for food than for its dancing. Let's go and try to cheer her up a bit, suggested Mary to her husband. There was something in her voice over the phone that hurt me to hear. All through the dinner, the Gladrags kid monopolized the conversation, dividing his time between discussing clothes and diamonds and berating the waiter for faulty service. The men were dawdling over cigarettes and a liqueur when the orchestra began an old waltz. The Gladrags kid turned to Alibi Anne. "'Come, honey,' he said. "'Let's dance.' Anne rose quickly, and they glided away. "'Did you see the light that came into her eyes when he asked her to dance?' asked Blackie of Mary. Yes, said she, I saw it. Poor Anne. She's clinging desperately to the remnants of her happiness, and she asks so very little, and gives so very much. What would he be without her? Just what he is anyway. Nothing, answered Blackie. As Anne, flushed and happy, returned to the table and sank into her chair with the last strains of the waltz, the Gladrags kid glanced across the dining room to a table where a young girl sat alone. "'I see Desi DeVry, the dancer, across the room,' he said. "'I'm going to invite her over to our table. She's good company, and besides, she's anxious to get on here as an entertainer, and I'm going to introduce her to Williams, the manager.' For just a second, Alibi Anne's body stiffened. 
Then, with a forced lip smile that revealed in an instant the utter soul weariness of a woman consciously losing a vital struggle, she looked up at her husband. Yes, do bring her over, Tom, she said. I would like to meet her. The glad rags kid threaded his way between the tables to the one where the girl sat. She looked up at him with a confident, welcoming smile. They talked a moment and started back to the now silent table from which Anne, with half-shielded eyes, was studying every detail of the newcomer's appearance. Alibi Anne saw in Desi de Vries a slender girl, young, attractive, and vivacious, with great coils of golden hair low on her head. If the dancer was conscious of the atmosphere of constraint, she ignored it, and in a moment was chatting across the table to Anne and Mary, but particularly to Anne, with the easy familiarity of assured acquaintanceship. Anne, if she felt hostility, masked it beneath a concealing but thin veneer of cordiality. During a lull in the conversation, the orchestra began the jazziest of foxtrots. "'Bully time! Let's dance!' cried the gladrags kid, rising. Anne, her pale face warmed by a flush of becoming color, half rose eagerly, and then, as she looked up, saw Desi de Vries also rising. There was an awkward moment as their eyes met. They both looked toward the kid. "'Dessie and I will dance this,' he said, flushing slightly as he made the choice. Then, with a clumsy attempt at playfulness, and utterly unconscious of the dagger in his words, he added to Anne, "'The time's too fast for you, Grandma.' "'Of course it is, Sonny,' said Anne, with a laugh. The gladrags kid whirled away with Dessie de Vries in his arms. Alibi Anne poured a glass of champagne, her first of the evening, and drank thirstily. Youth turns to youth, she said, looking across the table to Blackie and Mary. It's always been so, but until now I never realized how inevitable it is. She snapped her fingers with a reckless gesture, vividly expressive, and began to talk of inconsequential things with a careless gaiety that might have deceived less keen observers than the two opposite her. The ferry boat Piedmont was making her final trip across the bay from Oakland to the San Francisco shore. The few passengers she carried had found shelter from the chilling night wind within the brilliantly lighted cabin, all but two. One of these was a woman who, from the moment the boat had left the Oakland slip, had been standing alone, motionless and silent, against the after-deck rail. The other was Boston Blackie, who, from concealment in the shadow of the deck-house, was watching her curiously. Not until the Piedmont had passed Goat Island did the woman raise her eyes from the inky blackness of the water. Slowly she straightened herself, and turned for a moment toward the distant San Francisco shore, a bright flare of light against the black background of the night sky. The cloak that had been drawn high about her neck slipped to the deck, and Blackie, leaning forward, caught the glint of something in her hand that she had drawn from beneath the discarded garment. Without making a sound, he stepped quickly to her side and laid a hand on her arm. The woman trembled under the pressure of unexpected fingers and turned a white and haggard face toward him. "'Anne!' cried Blackie, and reaching down he took a bottle from between ice-cold fingers that surrendered it without resistance. A thin beam of light from his pocket flash lamp revealed the label. "'Cyanide of potassium,' he read. "'So, Anne, it has come to this with you. You, Alibi Anne, the gamest of them all. The woman turned away her face. Why not? she said at last in a faint, faraway voice. Other tired ones have. Why not I? She felt the pressure of the firm fingers on her arm tighten. Because, Anne, you never were and never can be a quitter, he said quietly. A quitter? she cried wonderingly. I don't understand. "'You wouldn't leave a pal in prison,' said Blackie. "'You wouldn't abandon a pal lying sick. "'No. "'But without knowing it, you were thinking of doing just that.' "'She shook her head. "'He doesn't need me. "'He doesn't want me. "'Youth turns to youth.' "'For the first time her voice trembled. "'Yes, and turns into old age, too, "'before it finishes paying for its folly.' Blackie answered. The glad rags kid hasn't brains enough to know it, I admit, but he needs you as no one else ever did or will. 
Alibi Ann turned to him instantly, with something like faintly kindling hope in her eyes. "'You know him better than anybody,' Blackie went on. "'Alone, he couldn't steal bottles from doorsteps without landing himself behind bars. He has trained himself to spend money, lots of it. He has a faked reputation as a gunman to uphold, or thinks he has. Well, easy money and that reputation. What's the answer? You've played the game long enough to know, Anne. It's prison. If you quit the glad rags kid in this or any other way, I'll tell you just what will happen. He will spend all the money you've left him. Then when he has to have more money to live as he wants to, he'll try one brainless caper and land himself in prison for the rest of his days. You've undertaken something, Anne, that you can't pass up. You say the kid doesn't need you? I say you know better. Boston Blackie laid the vial of cyanide in her hand. There's your bottle, Annie, he said gently. It's up to you. For a second, the bottle lay in the hand that rested on the deck rail. Then the fingers slowly opened and let it slip overboard, to splash faintly as it struck the water and vanished. Alibi Ann seized Blackie's arm. You're right, dear old pal, she whispered between sobs. I'd have been a quitter if I'd gone where that bottle is now. I'm going back to the flat, and I'll wait with a smiling face for him to come. I'll play the game out, Blackie. Just before daylight, Boston Blackie was awakened by the telephone. Ann's voice, very low and frightened, replied to his, Hello. It's happened already, Blackie, she said. All that you predicted came true tonight. Tom has killed a man at the Trocadero Pavilion. The coppers have him, and it looks like a hard case. Thank God and you, I'm still here to save him. Will you and Mary come over now, oh, quickly? The morning newspapers carried the news in flaring headlines. At last, the glad rags kid, much advertised gunman, had justified his newspaper reputation by committing deliberate murder. It had been an unusually dramatic crime done on the crowded dancing floor of the Trocadero, under the eyes of scores of diners. The newspapers agreed on all the essential details. The glad rags kid had come in from his racing car alone, and at once appeared to resent the fact that Miss Desi DeVree, cabaret entertainer, was dancing with the manager of a downtown dining place. As the music had ended and the dancer and her escort started toward the table from which they had ordered supper, the glad rags kid intercepted them. There had been a quick, angry exchange of words between the men, and the older had roughly shouldered the gunman aside. Instantly the kid had drawn his automatic and covered his adversary, but he did not shoot. His experience in gunplay ended when he had drawn his revolver, the cue for his opponent to fade out conveniently through the nearest door and leave the gunman a spectacular figure in the spotlight. This particular antagonist, however, knew what the San Francisco crook world had always known, that the glad rags kid was a gunman on paper only. Instead of retreating precipitately as the kid expected, the girl's escort had faced him. Put up that gun, you four-flusher, before I stuff it down your throat, he had commanded. A kid's pop gun is all a chief bluffer like you ought to be allowed to carry. Then, for the first time since he had owned it, the glad rags kid's pistol had spat forth a jet of flame, and the man who had said four-flesher crumpled to the floor with a bullet through his heart. The price of forgetting that even a four-flesher may become the real thing when his vanity is sufficiently stung. The diners and dancers had fled the room, hysterical with fright, foremost among them Miss Desi de Vries, and left the glad rags kid very white and very frightened standing above the man he had killed and wondering dully how and why it had happened. He had still been staring down at his victim when a policeman tapped him on the shoulder. Long before the police auto reached the city prison, the glad rags kid was begging like a frightened child for someone among his blue-coated captors to telephone for Alibi Ann to come to him at once. He needed her now. It was late afternoon before Anne reached the city prison where her husband was confined. All day she had stifled a frantic desire to rush to him with the comfort of her love and loyalty, for she knew instinctively his state of utter despair and fright. But there were other matters vastly more important that must first be arranged if the kid was to have a fighting chance for life. Already the prosecuting attorney had announced publicly that he intended to stamp out gunmanism in San Francisco by insisting that the so-called glad-rags kid, a notorious criminal, 
be given the extreme penalty of the law, death on the scaffold. Drennan, shrewdest of all criminal lawyers, for whom Anne was waiting when he appeared in his office, listened to the story and read the papers with steadily growing gravity. "'It's a tough case, Anne,' he said solemnly when he had gathered all the facts, "'and it's being made a hundred times worse by this cursed reputation as a gunman he has allowed the papers to build up against him in the past. It is established that his victim was unarmed. That knocks out self-defense. Insanity doesn't go with juries any more. It's been badly overdone. There were a dozen, maybe twenty witnesses. We can't get them all out of town. I tell you frankly, we're going to be mighty lucky if we can save this kid's neck. Anne shuddered. It looks, the lawyer continued, as if we are up against proof of what obviously is the truth, that this young gentleman committed a deliberate murder and cold blood. He's only a boy, pleaded Anne, just a poor, foolish boy. What the devil did you marry such a fool of a boy for? demanded the lawyer in exasperation, for he knew and liked Anne, and her voice told him how deeply she was suffering. Because I loved him she answered, and now that he needs me, I love him even more. Boston Blackie, who was with her, jumped to his feet. Drennan, he said, play for time. Delay every move as long as possible. Have the inquest continued, the preliminary continued, everything continued. Every week gain is an advantage, every month is a victory. Anything will happen, you know, if you wait long enough for it, and something may, even in this case. The attorney looked up with shrewd understanding. "'I don't know, but you're right,' he said. "'I don't see a chance in the world to save him if he ever goes before a jury.' It was after a long day of such discouragement that Alibi Ann was at last admitted to the visitor's room at the prison, where the glad rags kid was waiting. He rushed to her with outstretched hands and reproachful eyes. "'Oh, Anne!' he cried brokenly. "'You've left me here for the whole day without a word. I, I thought you were not going to come at all.' I've been half crazy with worry. Have you seen the papers? Have you read what the prosecutor says? He says he will insist that they hang me, me. He broke down completely over the dreaded words. Never, Tom, never, said Anne, drawing the bowed head close against her breast with a movement inexpressibly tender and protecting. They'll never do that, she faltered, her lips refusing the words she meant. Never while I live, Tom. She told him of the employment of Drennan, and of their plans to delay and postpone each step in the preliminaries to the actual trial. "'And meantime, Anne, what am I going to do?' he asked. "'Can I get bail? Can you buy me out?' "'There is no bail for murder,' she answered regretfully. "'Then I've got to stay in this dirty, rotten hole for days, weeks, months?' he cried in resentful amazement. "'I can't do it. I won't. There must be some way to release me, if you'll take the trouble to find it.' You've never had to lie in jail yourself, but now that I'm in, you don't care. You're willing to let me stay in here through days of hell like this. Anne dared not tell him that her one hope was that the subtlety of the shrewdest of lawyers might win him the privilege of remaining in a prison cell, instead of being carried, still and silent, to one narrower, darker, lonelier, and eternally permanent. That night, Alibi Anne, who had neither tasted food nor rested since the murder, worked alone in her flat on a list she was making of every diamond and jewel and marketable possession she owned. She was turning everything into cash to make a fight for the glad rag kid's life. At the same hour, Desi DeVry was posing before the camera of a newspaper photographer who had promised her his paper would treat her beautifully and that he would send her enlarged copies of her photograph. End of chapter 20《20 21 of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Love of a Woman. Weeks passed, weeks in which the glad rags kid fretted and fumed and raged at Anne because she did not take him from his cell and restore him to liberty and life. During those weeks, Anne grew so old and haggard and worn that Mary, alarmed, begged her to come to Blackie's flat, where at least she would have care and companionship. Anne refused. I would rather stay in my own little place, 
She said, You know, I must sell it soon, and I want to be there as long as I can, for I was happier there than I will ever be again. It is all that is left of my dream. At the preliminary hearing, the Glad Rags kid, as was inevitable, was held for trial before the higher court, and was moved from the city prison to the county jail, located on the outskirts of the city. On the next day, Blackie summoned Anne. "'I have waited until now,' he said, "'to tell you a plan.' "'Tell me quickly, Blackie,' cried Anne, rising excitedly. "'You know the Black Mariah in which prisoners are taken back and forth from the county jail to the downtown courtrooms?' Blackie began. "'Well, as you know, it's a closed machine, boarded up all around, and with a door opening at the rear. In that door is a barred window, big enough for a man to get through if the bars were sawed out and then cemented back into place to hide the cuts until the time for the getaway came. A copper is supposed to ride outside on the steps behind the door on the trip downtown. But it's a long trip and tiresome work standing on the steps, so three times out of four the coppers ride on the seat with a chauffeur until they get downtown. Well, Anne, if those bars were sawed through some night while the Black Mariah is standing in the old jail stables, which are unguarded, and the Glad Rags kid pulled out the sawed bars and climbed out just where the county jail drive joins the Ingleside Boulevard, a fast car could pick him up and race him away to safety before anyone could interfere, even if some snitch in the Mariah gave the alarm. You will saw those bars for me, Blackie? Alibi Anne was trembling from head to foot. Of course, he said. A week later, the Glad Rags kid was scheduled to appear in court to have his case set for trial. Anne visited him on the day before and explained Blackie's plan. Instantly, the kid's bravado and swagger returned. He threw back his shoulders immediately. "'Gee, but it will be great to be on the street once more,' he said. "'This will be some little sensation for the town, won't it? You're all right, Annie.' At midnight, Blackie returned to the flat where Mary and Anne were waiting and reported the bars cut and everything ready. A big touring car idled along the Ingleside Boulevard in the bright sunshine the following morning, as the Black Mariah began its daily journey into the city. Blackie was at the wheel with Anne beside him. In the tonneau was a grimy set of workmen's clothes, the disguise in which the Glad Rags kid was to attempt an escape from the state after his rescue. The prison car and Blackie's approaching each other diagonally drew nearer together. The junction of the roads at which the escape was to be made was at hand. There was no policeman on the rear step. As the cars drew abreast, Blackie saw that the bars of the wicket were out and the way to escape open. Then a head appeared through the aperture, a helmeted head, and a hand holding a revolver. "'A copper!' cried Blackie. "'He's riding inside and guarding the open wicket. They're wise to the job, Anne. It's all off.' Anne made no sound, and except for her ghastly pallor she might not have heard or understood. The Black Mariah disappeared around a curve, and Blackie turned his car back toward the city, driving slowly on the trip that was to have been a wild race to freedom for a man now doomed. "'Mary and I, and you and the kid himself, knew of this,' said Blackie. "'Did you mention it in any way to anyone?' Anne shook her head. "'It's strange,' Blackie continued. "'There isn't one chance in a million that the coppers would discover the cut bars without information.' And yet they did. Anne neither cried, spoke, nor gave outward indication of the bitterness of her disappointment. She sat silent and still and very white, staring straight ahead with eyes whose faraway look reminded Blackie of what he had seen in them on the night she stood on the deck of the Piedmont with a bottle of poison in her hand and said, Why not? Blackie returned to the palms and sent old Mother McGinn out to the county jail to investigate. She came back toward night with the explanation. "'The kid snitched on himself,' she reported. "'He bragged to his cellmate during the night that he'd be free and on the street before the Black Mariah got downtown, and that the papers would be full of it. His cell partner tipped it off to the guards the first thing in the morning, and they frisked the Mariah from top to bottom and finally found the cut bars.' They're going to take him downtown in a special car with gun guards from now on. The glad rags kid has let his tongue put a rope around his neck. I thought he had done it himself, said Blackie to Anne, who sat staring into the street with dull, glazed eyes. I'm afraid it's all off now, little woman. They'll guard him as if he were the Kaiser every moment he's out of his cell. There's not a chance on earth to save him now. Not a chance on earth now, Blackie. 
repeated Anne in a lifeless monotone. Not one. Well. She stepped to Mother McGinn's mirror and smoothed her hair and straightened her hat. Then she began to talk as if her mind suddenly were freed of a crushing burden. That was some diamond stunt that was pulled the other night out of the Pullman mansion, eh, Blackie? She began and then chatted on, discussing the big job with all the zest of a crook woman without a care or a worry. "'Well, I've got to get downtown and see Drennan before he closes up for the night,' she said finally. "'I'll see you tomorrow or next day, Blackie. Be good to yourself, old pal, and thanks.' She was gone, leaving Blackie staring after her in perplexity. "'I don't get her idea this time,' he said to himself. "'But whatever it is that's on her mind, it worries me.' The next day Alibi Ann was missing. Frequently, both Blackie and Mary called her phone number, without getting a reply. They called at her flat and found it locked and deserted. Probably gone on one of her diamond hunts. She was trying to raise a big bunch of money for the kid's defense, conjectured Blackie, but somehow this explanation did not satisfy, and he was distinctly uneasy. Other days passed without any word from Anne, and then from prisoners discharged from the county jail, San Francisco's crook world heard startling news. It was that Anne had quit the Glad Rags kid. She sent him a note by her lawyer telling him she was beating it, Reddy the Rube reported. He's raving like a lunatic and calling her copper-hearted and a rat and so on. She didn't even pay his mouthpiece, and the kid had to hawk all his stones to make good. It's the right dope, folks. I heard the kid tell it with my own ears. It's a lie even though that fool kid is telling it. It'll take better evidence than this to convince me that Alibi Ann has turned wrong," Blackie answered angrily. But notwithstanding his denial, Boston Blackie was worried. He called at Drennan's office. Some of the gang just in from the county are spreading the news that Ann has quit the Glad Rags kid, Blackie began. They say she sent him a note by you saying she was going. I know it isn't true. It is true, Blackie. Drennan interrupted. I delivered the note myself. She came here and told me what she was going to do. She surprised me, I admit. After he finished raving over it, the kid gave me the note to keep for him. I'll show it to you if you like. He drew an envelope addressed to her husband in Anne's writing from his desk and handed it to Blackie, who took it with the air of one disbelieving his eyes. This is what he read. Dear Tom, good luck and goodbye. I've done all I can for you, but there isn't a chance in the world, and I'm on my way. You'll have to sell your diamonds and car to pay Drennan. I would, but I haven't the money. Anne. Blackie was stunned by the note's revelations. This thing wasn't possible, he felt, and yet it was true. She must have worried herself crazy, he insisted. In her right mind, alibi Anne never could have written that note to her husband facing the gallows. Why, it's downright yellow. She was in her right mind when she wrote the note, the lawyer replied gravely. On the day that the Glad Rags kid went to trial for the murder at the Trocadero, Boston Blackie and a few others were in the Chinese room at the Palms, when Mac the Gun came bursting in with an afternoon paper. Pop the news, fellers, he cried excitedly. Glad Rags has copped a plea and got off with a light jolt. That's only half. Alibi Ann was grabbed last night for the big jewel job up at the Pullman house. The bull says her dead to rights. They found all the sparks and even the clothes and the wig she wore when she was in the Pullman place. The old lady has identified her, and Ann sees it's all off and comes clean with a confession to the dicks. What? cried Blackie, snapping the paper from his hand. It was all there as Mac had related it. Ann, whose cunning in evading the best efforts of the police had supplied her moniker of Alibi Ann, had been tripped at last, and no less surprising was the sudden change in heart of the prosecuting attorney, who, after stoutly asserting for weeks that he would insist on the death penalty for the Glad Rags kid, had at the last moment permitted him to plead guilty and take a prison sentence. The paper passed from hand to hand, and as each read it, the men looked at one another questioningly, but hesitated before voicing something evidently in all their minds. Halstead Street Al was the first to speak. There's something rotten in Denmark, boys, he said slowly, and something else rottener, yet right here in Frisco. Gladrag saves his neck and gets off light, 
and Alibi Ann is grabbed with the goods all in the same day. What for did that prosecutor let the kid off with a stir jolt after bragging he would hang him? Which he sure could have done. Not for nothing, believe me. Boys, somebody snitched on Alibi Ann, and that somebody is the glad rags kid. And it quit him and he was sore anyway, spoke up another. She done wrong to blow him when he was up against it, but that didn't give him a license to turn copper. He's playing rat, folks. Blackie rose and put on his coat. I'm going down to Seine right now and find out exactly what has happened, said Blackie. Eloi Ann greeted Blackie eagerly. He was amazed at her appearance. She looked almost happy, almost like the Ann who had lavished all her love on the now desolate little flat on Lyon Street. "'Oh, Blackie, I'm so glad you're here,' she cried delightedly. "'I was going to send for you, for there is something I want you to do for me.' She hesitated for a moment. "'I suppose the gang are all saying the kid snitched on me to save himself,' she went on, studying Blackie's face as she talked. "'Isn't that what they ought to be saying?' demanded Blackie. "'Isn't that the truth?' "'That's the reason I wanted to see you, Blackie. I don't want that said of Tom.' I want you to tell everybody you know in town that isn't true. I won't do it, Anne, Blackie answered angrily. I won't give a rat like that a good name, even for you. But he didn't do it, Anne asserted, and Blackie all at once realized that she spoke the truth. As far as I know, Tom never heard of the Pullman jewels. And anyway, he couldn't have snitched on me because— She glanced cautiously over her shoulder and lowered her voice. Because, Blackie— I didn't steal them. You didn't? cried Blackie. Then why have you confessed that you did? Explain it, Anne. Explain it. I can't make even a guess at the answer. Anne drew closer to him and spoke in a whisper. You and Drennan are the only two in the world who will ever know the truth, Blackie. He'll never tell, and I know you won't, Anne said. On the day when the rescue failed, you told me there wasn't a chance in the world to save the kid. And there wasn't, except one. That one chance was that the prosecutor would consent to let him take a plea and a prison sentence. The prosecutor wouldn't consent. He wanted a hanging. Well, I had a plan of my own to change his mind. He and the police department are at outs. I knew he would do almost anything to clear up the Pullman mystery and show him up the police by getting back the jewels himself. I knew who pulled that job. It was Baltimore Ben and his Molly. I followed them to Seattle, and there, Blackie, I bought the Pullman jewels of them. When I got back, I sent Drennan to the prosecutor to hint that he might be able to fix it for him to get back the Pullman jewels. The cuter bit. He wanted those jewels bad. Drennan told him Tom knew where they were and might agree to tell if he could get a prison sentence. The cuter sputtered for a while, but finally agreed, except that he insisted that he must have the thief as well as the Pullman jewels. Somebody has to do time for that job, he declared, or the kid must hang. Drennan came back, thinking it was all off, and that he would have to go to trial with the kid's case, but I told him to agree to the cuter's terms, the jewels and the thief, too, in return for the kid's life. And that's why, Blackie, I'm going to take a jolt at last, my first one, and for a job I didn't do. Anne, Anne, murmured Blackie, divided between admiration for gameness and sorrow for her fate. You are buying the kid's life with yours. It's cheap as dirt at the price, she said, and she meant it. But the note to the kid, saying you would quit him, said Blackie. You wrote that and let him believe it was so. Why? Camophate, Blackie, pure camophate. You know it isn't safe to trust Tom to keep anything to himself. And yet we had to convince the prosecutor that all this was absolutely on the square, and that Tom had a real reason for hating me and wanting to see me in trouble. That's why I wrote the note and let everybody think it was on the square. Up in the prosecutor's office they'll always think that Tom did the snitching. But I want you to be able to tell the gang he's right and no snitch. When you say you know it's so, they'll all take your word for it. You're a wonder, Anne, Blackie said. Oh, yes. I did the job up right with all the trimmings, Anne admitted with a trace of pride. I had Molly describe exactly how she was dressed when she got into the Pullman house and conned the old lady while Ben turned the trick. 
I duplicated her costume, hat, dress, shoes, and all, and got a wig that matches Molly's hair. All this junk was in the flat, ready for the cutest men to find when they pulled their raid and got me and the jewels. Of course, they dressed me up in the clothes this morning, and Mrs. Pullman identified me immediately. It isn't half hard to alibi yourself into jail. How much time are they going to give you, Anne? Turning his head to hide his eyes. The limit. Twenty years, she answered calmly and without regret. That's the deal we made. The cuter was to be free to do his worst to the Pullman thief. Twenty years! Oh, Annie! ejaculated Blackie. This is awful. It's a long time, Blackie. An awful long time. But it was the best I could do, said Anne, growing suddenly grave. Do you know how old I'll be in twenty years? she asked after a long pause. Nearly sixty. A white-haired old woman fit for nothing but the poor house. The weary, haggard look was stealing back over her face. There is one last favor I'm going to ask you, Blackie, she said unsteadily. Tom is upstairs in the anteroom waiting to be taken back to the county. If I don't see him now to say goodbye, I never will see him, Blackie, never again as long as I live. Will you try to fix it up for me to be taken up there for just one moment? I won't try to fix it. I'll do it, Blackie answered. The glad rags kid was sitting with his back toward her when Anne caught her first glimpse of him. Beside him, and with her hands clasped in his, sat Desi DeVree. Alibi Anne, as she got sight of the girl, caught her breath in a quick choking gasp. Then slowly she managed to force back to her lips the smile that had been on them when she entered. "'I've come to say good-bye, Tom,' she said gently. "'Oh, it's you, is it?' answered the glad rags kid, looking up with a sneer. "'Now that I've got myself out of danger, you turn up like a bad penny that's not wanted any more. It strikes me that you have your nerve with you to be here at all.' His anger and disdain grew as he talked. "'That was a swell little note you sent me,' he continued. "'That showed you up for what you are. I'd be headed for a death cell by now if I had depended on you for anything. Didn't even have the dough to help pay my lawyer, did you? But now, when you're in trouble yourself, you come sneaking back, looking for sympathy. Nothing doing with me.' With the fear of death now safely behind him, the glad rags kid was his old, swaggering, bullying self again. Alibi Ann stood looking down at him for a full minute with immeasurable love and eyes that seemed to be searching and memorizing every line in his face. Suddenly she stooped and kissed him. "'Good-bye, Tom, dear,' she whispered softly. "'It's the last time we will ever see each other in this world.' She was gone before his jeering reply reached her. "'Why didn't you tell him that you paid for his life with twenty years of your own?' demanded Blackie as the door clanged shut behind them. "'I didn't want him to know,' Anne answered in the detached, faraway tones he had heard on the deck of the Piedmont. "'It will be easier for him to think of me as he does now than to know that I am doing time for his sake. I hope that girl will be decent enough to visit him. Prison life is going to be hard on him, poor boy. No, I won't let myself be sorry she is up there with him now.' She continued, speaking as if to herself alone. No matter how kindly he felt toward me, we could never, never meet again, anyway. I'll be a woman of sixty when I come back, if I do come back. It's all over, forever. For the first time, Anne let the grief and loneliness in her tortured heart sweep away all self-control. Even crook women are women beneath their masks. Dropping her head, Anne sobbed as women do when the first clods of falling earth touch the caskets of their dead. After many minutes the flood of tears gradually ceased, and Anne looked up at Blackie with eyes that were resolutely courageous behind their wet lashes. Two lines of a poem that I read years and years ago have been running through my mind for days, she said. Listen, Blackie. The sins ye do two by two ye shall pay for one by one. That comes home to me now, Blackie, particularly that last line. It is one by one that Tom and I are going to pay. Yes, one by one. 
apart. Again her eyes flooded with tears, but she brushed them aside. Anyway, I have something precious to take across to the prison with me, Blackie, she said with a smile on her lips and her eyes that was not forced. And it's something no one and nothing, not even penitentiary walls, can take from me. It's the memory of the little home out on Lyon Street. The home that was a little bit of heaven while it lasted. Alibi Ann took Boston Blackie's hand in hers. Anyway, old pal, she said, I've played the game, haven't I? End of chapter 21《of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. For fifteen years. Coming in with the dripping sea fog which San Franciscans love, clinging to him in glistening crystals, Boston Blackie found Mary crouched over the open fire. As she smiled up at him, he saw new and deep emotion in her eyes. "'What's happened, little woman?' he asked solicitously. "'Blackie, I've been over to San Quentin Prison today to visit Alibi Anne, and I found her—' The unfinished sentence ended in a sob. "'Found her how, dear?' "'Happy, absolutely happy, Blackie. Think of it. The fact that she's sacrificed herself for the glad rags kid has brought her peace and contentment even beyond the walls of that gloomy old penitentiary. Blackie, that's the truest and best love in the world. Sacrifice is the rock upon which real love is built, said Blackie reverently. And yet, poor Anne. Her only thought still is for him, continued Mary with glistening eyes. Bit and a half Kelly owes Anne some money. What do you suppose her only request was? That I collect it and send it to that worthless young rotter, guessed Blackie. Exactly. Poor, poor Anne. And yet at last she has found happiness, far more perfect happiness than there ever was for her in the little flat on Lyon Street when he was with her. I'll have to do as Anne has asked, but I hate to, said Blackie grudgingly. Kelly lives at the Carteret. I'll see him tonight after the theater. Blackie and Mary spent the evening at the Orpheum Theater. A supper at a downtown restaurant after the performance kept them until just midnight. Then Blackie sent Mary home in a taxi. I may have to wait quite a while for Kelly, he said as they parted. He's a night hawk, and besides, he and his mob have been planning a stunt for some night this week, unless I'm mistaken. At a quarter past twelve, Blackie entered the dingy South of Market Street lodging house, frequented by crooks not welcomed at Mother McGinn's. The place was dimly lighted and apparently deserted. Blackie climbed the worn stairs to the second floor, and with the freemasonry of his craft, opened mitt and a half Kelly's door and entered when there was no response to his knock. No one was within. He'll surely be back soon thought Blackie, settling himself in a chair and picking up a paper. Half an hour passed. Then Blackie heard the street door open and close with a bang. Listening intently, he heard staggering steps slowly climbing the stairs. A groping hand clutched the doorknob. A fumbling key sought the lock. The door opened, and Mitt and a half Kelly stood on the threshold. Blackie sprang to his feet with a low cry of alarm. Blood was streaming from Kelly's clothes. His left arm swung helplessly at his side. "'A rumble, and a bad one from your looks, Kelly,' ejaculated Blackie, seizing the wounded man's arm and leading him to a chair. "'What happened?' "'We made a try for the Buffalo Brewery safe,' groaned Kelly. "'We got the box open, and the dough packed up. Then as we were leaving, a harness bull turned the corner. He saw us and drew his gun. We got him.' He's dead, I think, but he got me. The worst of it is, I've let the clear trail of blood all the way here. The others got away, but the coppers will follow me here, sure. I've got to get out quick. Blackie slipped the man's coat from his shoulders and slit his shirt with a skill of experience. I'll stop this bleeding, and then you'd better go, he agreed. This looks like a bad night's work, Kelly, if the copper is dead. 
Deftly he bound the wound. Then he threw off his own coat and slipped the wounded crook's uninjured arm into it. "'That'll keep you until you can get out of town and to a doctor tomorrow,' he said. "'And now, Kelly, it's leaving time for you.' The man pressed Blackie's hand. "'Thanks, pal,' he said. "'I'm going by the alley. They may be at the front door any minute.' As the door closed behind Kelly, Blackie looked at himself in the mirror. His hands, face, and arms were covered with blood. "'Bad business,' he ejaculated. "'This shows the result of using bullets instead of brains.' Kelly and his bunch never did have any judgment. As he turned toward the washstand, he heard the street door open again, and heavy feet tramped up the stairway. "'The coppers!' cried Blackie. He looked about him. Kelly's bloody coat lay on the floor. Blood was everywhere. Blackie glanced toward the window, weighing its possibilities as a means of escape. Then he straightened up, folded his arms, and waited. "'What's the use of running?' he thought. "'They can't tangle me in this business.' There was a knock at the door, plainly from a heavy gun butt. Blackie threw it open. "'Here he is!' cried the leader of the group of policemen that stood outside. "'We've got him, boys!' Blackie, unarmed, was powerless to resist, even had he wished to. A policeman's club crashed against his skull, and he dropped to the floor, unconscious, with a thousand scintillating points of light flashing through his brain. When Boston Blackie recovered consciousness, he was in a hospital with a policeman on guard at either side of his cot. His bandaged head ached horribly. "'Ho, ho, ho, me bucka, you're coming around, eh?' said one of the officers vengefully, as Blackie opened his eyes. "'Better for you, my lad, if your head hadn't been so hard. Now you'll live to be hanged. McManus, the boy you shot, is dead.' "'I shot nobody. I wasn't even armed, as you know. I wasn't in on this brewery job. If I had been, nobody would have been killed.' "'You've a mighty good idea what happened for a man who wasn't there.' persisted the policeman slyly. The chief will be after wanting to see you soon. That afternoon, Blackie was led to the office of Detective Chief Jim Moran. Meanwhile, he had read the papers in which the police exultingly announced the capture of the famous cracksman Boston Blackie after a safe robbery in which a policeman had been shot to death. So, Blackie, we've got you right at last, began Moran. You'll swing for last night's work. "'Listen, Chief,' said Blackie, "'I had no more to do with this job than you. "'I'm going to tell you exactly what happened.' He did, while Moran watched him from beneath gradually contracting brows. "'You dressed this fellow's arm, you say?' Moran interrupted. "'You knew him. Who was he?' Blackie's shoulders straightened. He looked squarely into Moran's eyes. "'I thought you knew me better than to ask me that question, Chief. "'You'll never find out from me.' Moran's heavy fist banged the table. "'You'll tell!' he cried belligerently. "'You'll tell unless you want to do his time for him. If we don't get him, we'll get you!' The detective paused and lowered his voice while he shook his clenched fist in Blackie's face. "'Even if we have to railroad you.' "'You're capable of it, but it can't be done,' said Blackie quietly. "'The bloody coat with a bullet hole in the shoulder will acquit me. I've no bullet hole in my shoulder.' The only wound I have is on my head, where your coppers struck me down while my hands were up. That coat will acquit me, Chief. We'll see, said Moran with an evil smile. We'll see, Blackie. I believe your story. But unless we get the right man, we'll get you. Take your choice. It's made, answered Blackie. Do your worst, you framer. Three months later, Boston Blackie, charged with murder and safe robbery, faced a jury. He was defended by a skillful lawyer. The prosecutor presented his evidence. Policemen told how at the sounds of the shots at the brewery they had rushed to the scene and found the dying policeman. They told of the trail of blood leading from the spot, and that they followed it to the cataray and up the stairs to the door of the room in which they had found Blackie, blood spattered and disheveled. His reputation as a safe-cracker was skillfully interjected by the prosecutor. The state rested. Blackie took the stand on his own behalf and told the complete story of the evening. "'Who is this mythical person whose wound you say you dressed?' demanded the prosecutor on cross-examination. "'I decline to answer,' was the reply. The prosecutor turned toward the jury with a triumphant smile. "'That's all. We want facts, not fairy tales.' he said. 
Mary told how the evening had been spent at the theater and of the supper that followed it, a supper which ended at midnight, ten minutes after the robbery was committed. The waiter remembered serving them, but was not positive as to the time. Then Blackie's lawyer played his strongest card. He demanded the bloody coat with the bullet hole in the shoulder. The police denied all knowledge of it. They had never seen such a coat, they testified. The prosecutor waved aside the incident as pure fiction. In rebuttal for the state, the policeman who rode in the ambulance with the dying officer was called. He swore that the victim's last words were that Boston Blackie was one of the safe robbers he had surprised. He knew him and recognized him by the flash of the guns. "'Didn't McManus tell you that this defendant is the man who fired the shot that struck him down?' persisted the prosecutor. The witness twisted uneasily in his chair as he glanced toward Blackie, whose black eyes were fixed on him as though they would wring the truth from his perjured lips. The policeman was willing to lie to send his man to prison, but his conscience rebelled at swearing away his life. He didn't say who fired the shots. He only said he saw this man, Boston Blackie, in the bunch. "'That's all,' snapped the prosecutor disgustedly. The jury, impressed by the straightforward, sincerely told story of Mary and Blackie himself, refused to convict him of murder, but found him guilty of safe robbery. "'This Boston Blackie's story sounded like the truth,' the foreman said to his wife when he was eating his dinner that night. "'Those policemen might have lied. I don't know. But anyway, the man is a safe-cracker, and even if he wasn't guilty of this, he is guilty of other robberies. So we compromised and acquitted him of murder, but sent him across for robbery. The judge roasted us for it, too.' Boston Blackie was sentenced to fifteen years in San Gregorio. "'It's hard, Mary, but it can't be helped,' he said tenderly as his wife clung to him on the morning he was leaving her for fifteen long years of a living death. "'I'm taking a clear conscience with me, anyway. Some day I'll be back, and then—' Their tears dropped together as Mary sobbed hysterically on his breast. And so the police at last rid themselves of Boston Blackie, first among cracksmen. End of chapter 22《23 of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Revolt The great jute mill of the San Gregorio Penitentiary was called by the Board of Prison Commissioners a marvel of industrial efficiency. The thousand striped-clad men who worked there, hopeless, revengeful bits of human flotsam wrecked on the sea of life by their own or society's blunders, called the mill the T.B. factory. T.B., of course, meaning tuberculosis. Both were right. The mill was in full operation. Hundreds of shuttles clanged swiftly back and forth across the loom warps with a nerve-wracking, deafening din. The jute dust rose and fell, swelled and billowed, covering the floor, the walls, the looms, and the men who worked before them. Blue-clad guards armed with heavy canes lounged and loitered through the long aisles between the machines that were turning out so rapidly hundreds of thousands of grain sacks destined some day to carry the state's harvest to the four corners of a bread-hungry world. To the eye, everything in the mill was as is usual. Every convict was in his place, feverishly busy, for each man's task was one hundred yards of sackcloth a day, and none was ignorant of what happened in Punishment Hall, to any who checked in short by even a single yard. Outwardly, nothing seemed amiss, and yet the guards were restless and uneasy, they gripped their canes and vainly sought this new, invisible menace that all felt, but none could either place or name. Instinctively they glanced through the windows to the top of the wall outside, where gun guards paced with loaded rifles. The tension steadily increased as the morning dragged slowly away. Guards stopped each other, paused, talked, shook their heads perplexedly, and moved on, doubly watchful. Something was wrong, but what? If they could have read the brain of one man, a convict whose face, as he bent over his loom, 
bore the stamp of power, imagination, and the ability to command men, they would have known. They would have seen certain carefully chosen striped figures pause momentarily as they passed among the weavers delivering cobs for the shuttles. They would have guessed the message these men left, a message that would have been drowned in the roar of the machinery had it been shouted, instead of spoken in the silent lip language of the prison. The word went out through the mill in ever-widening circles, leaving always in its wake new hope, new hatred, and desperate determination. Those who received it first passed it to others near them, others chosen after long study by the convict leader, for a single traitor could wreck the great scheme and bring upon all concerned punishment of a kind that the outside world sometimes reads about, but seldom believes. Trusted lieutenants, always approaching on legitimate errands, reported back to their leader the acceptance of his plans by the hundred men selected for specific tasks in the first great coup. Each had been given detailed instructions, and knew precisely what was required of him. Each, tense, alert, and inspired by the desperate determination of their leader, awaited the signal which was to precipitate what all knew was truly a life-and-death struggle, with the cards all against them. A convict with a knife scar across his cheek, and sinister eyes agleam with excitement, approached the loom at which worked the one man in the secret whose face betrayed nothing unusual. The convict emptied a can of cobs and spoke, though his lips made no perceptible movement. Everton, sit and pray, Blackie,' he said. "'Everybody knows what's doing and what to do. Nobody backed out. Give the high sign any old time you're ready, and there'll be more mess around this old TV factory than she's ever seen.' Boston Blackie looked quickly into the eyes of his lieutenant. "'You told him all there's to be no killing.' For none knew better than he that bloodshed and murder ride hand in hand, usually, with a sudden mastery by serfs about to be unleashed. "'Told them all what you said, word for word,' replied the man. "'Though I don't get this no blood scheme myself. Give them a taste of what they give us for mine. But I done what you told me. Let her go when you're ready.' Boston Blackie looked up and glanced around the mill. Covert eyes from a hundred looms were watching him with eager expectancy. The guard, sensing the culmination of the danger all had been seeking, involuntarily turned toward Blackie, too, and, reading his eyes, started toward him on a run. Instantly he, high above the sea of faces beneath him, flung up both arms, the signal of revolt. One convict seized the whistle cord of the mill siren, and out over the peaceful California valley beyond the gray prison walls there echoed for miles the shrill scream of the whistle. Another convict threw off the power that turned the mill machinery. The looms stopped. The deafening noise within the mill ceased as if by magic. The guards rushing toward Blackie with clubs aloft were seized and disarmed in a second by squads of five convicts each who acted with military precision and understanding. Ropes appeared suddenly from beneath striped blouses, and the blue-coated captives were bound, hands behind their backs. Two squads of ten ran through the mill, armed with heavy wooden shuttles seized from the looms, and herded to the rear scores of their fellows who, because of doubtful loyalty, had not been entrusted with the secret. The guards' phones connected with the executive office of the prison were jerked from the walls, though there was none left free to use them. The great steel doors of the mill were flung shut, and bars dropped into place on the inside, making them impregnable to anything less than artillery. In three minutes, the convicts were in complete control of the mill, barred in from outside assault by steel doors and brick walls. The gun guards on the walls surrounding the mill yard turned their rifles towards its walls, but they held their fire, for there was no living thing at which to shoot. Calmly, with arms folded, Boston Blackie still stood on his loom, watching the quick, complete fruition of the plans that had cost him many sleepless hours on his hard cell-house blunk. Of all the officers in San Gregorio prison, Captain Denison, head of the mill guards, was hated most. He was hated for his favoritism to pet snitches, informers who bought trivial privileges at usurers' cost to their fellows. He was despised for his cowardice, for he was a coward, and the convicts instinctively recognized it. When he was found hiding behind a pile of rubbish in a dark corner of the mill and dragged none too gently into the circle of captive guards, a growl of satisfaction, wolfish in its hoarse, inarticulate menace, swelled through the throng that confronted him. 
What Captain Denison saw as he turned his ashen face toward them would have cowed a far braver man than he, and he fell on his knees and begged piteously for his life. Boldness might have saved him. Cowardice doomed him. As he sank to his knees, mumbling inarticulate pleas, a convict with a wooden bludgeon in his hand leaped to his side and seized him by the throat. "'We've got you now, damn you!' cried the volunteer executioner called Turkey Birch, because of the vivid-hued neck beneath his evil face. "'Denison, if you've got a god, which I doubt, talk to him now, or you never will till you meet him face to face. Pray, you dog, pray. Do you remember the night you sent me to the straight jacket to please one of your rotten snitches? I told you when you laughed at my groans that some day I'd get you. Well, that day has come.' Birch stooped toward his victim, his lips curling back over his teeth hideously. "'In just sixty seconds,' he snarled, "'this club is going to put you where you've put many a one of us, underground.' The prostrate mill captain tried to speak, but fear choked back his words. The convict's grip on his throat tightened like a vice. A roar of approval came from the stripe-clad mob. Someone leaped forward and kicked the kneeling form. Birch raised his club, swinging it about his head for the death blow. Stop! The sharp command was spoken with authority. Involuntarily, Birch hesitated, turned. Boston Blackie sprang from his vantage point on the loom and snatched the club from Birch's hand. He flung it on the floor and roughly shouldered his fellow convict from the man he had saved. I said no blood, and that goes as it lays, Turkey, he said quietly, but with finality. The convicts, being human, erringly human, but still human, screamed their protest as Blackie's intervention saved the man, all hated with a deep hatred of real justification. Turkey Birch, encouraged by the savage protest from his mates, caught up his club. "'Get out of my way, Blackie!' he cried. "'That skunk on the floor has to die, and not even you are going to save him!' "'Listen,' said Blackie, when the howl of approbation that followed this threat died down, "'he's not going to die. He's going out of the mill without a scratch. I planned and started this revolt, and I'm going to finish it my own way.' Birch was a leader among the men, scarcely second in influence to Blackie himself. He sensed the approval of the men behind him. The blow Blackie had intercepted would have been compensation to his inflamed mind for years of grievances and many long hours of physical torture. He swung his club. Boston Blackie seized an iron bar from a man beside him. "'All right,' he said, standing aside from the kneeling Captain Denison. "'Croak him whenever you're ready, turkey.' But when you kill him, I kill you. The two convicts faced each other, Blackie alert and determined, Birch sullen and in doubt. For the first time, the crowd behind was stilled. Thirty tenth seconds passed in which life and death hung on balanced gales. Why don't you do something? Blackie said to Birch with a smile. Then he threw his iron bar to the floor. Boys! he continued, turning to the crowd. I hate that thing on the floor there, wearing a captain's uniform, more than any of you. I didn't stop Birch from croaking him, because he doesn't deserve it. I stopped him because if there is one drop of guard's blood shed here today, we convicts must lose this strike. If we keep our heads, we win. Now it's up to you. If you want to pay for that coward's blood with your own, Denison dies. But if he does... I quit you here and now. If you say so, he goes unharmed, and we'll finish this business as we began it. Right. He turned unarmed to Birch, standing irresolute with his club. You're the first to vote, Turkey. What's the verdict? He asked. Birch hesitated in sudden uncertainty. Denison cowered on the floor with chattering teeth. Then the convict tossed aside his club and stepped away from the prisoner. "'You've run this business so far, Blackie,' he said slowly. "'And I guess it's up to us to let you finish it in your own way. If you say that dog must go free, free he goes, says I.' There was a chorus of approval from the convict mob. "'Fine,' said Blackie. "'I knew you boys had sense, if I only gave you a chance to use it. Now we've got work to do. The first thing is to boot our dear captain out those doors, and I nominate Turkey Birch to do it. Action always pleases a mob. 
Joyous approval greeted the suggestion. Denison was dragged to the doors. They were unbarred, and then propelled by Turkey Birch's square-toed brogan, Captain Denison shot through and into the yard, where he was under the protecting rifles of the guards on the walls. One after another, the captives were treated similarly. "'Take this message to Deputy Warden Sherwood,' said Blackie, as the last of the bound bluecoats stood ready to be kicked past the doors. "'Tell him we control this mill. Tell him all his gun guards and gatling guns can't touch us in here. Tell him that unless within one hour he releases from Punishment Hall the ten men he sent there yesterday for protesting against the rotten food, we're going to tear down his five million dollar mill. We're going to wait just one hour, tell him, for his answer. Now go. The man shot out. The doors were banged shut and barred behind him, while the mill resounded with the joyous shouts and songs of the convicts, hugging each other and the unrestrained abandonment that followed the first victory any of them had ever known over discipline. End of chapter 23《of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain first blood deputy warden Martin Sherwood disciplinarian and real head of the prison management sat in his office gripping an unlighted cigar between his lips the screaming siren had warned him of trouble in the mill Wall guards reporting over a dozen phones had told him all they knew, that the men had seized the mill and barred its doors against attack and were ejecting the guards one by one. "'Any of them hurt?' Sherwood inquired. "'Apparently not, sir,' the subordinate answered. "'Their hands are tied, but they don't seem to be harmed. Captain Denison is out and on his way up to you.' "'If Denison is out unharmed, nobody needs a doctor.' Sherwood said with a glint in his eyes that just missed being disappointment. If they had spilled any blood, his would have been first. Strange. Twenty men at the mercy of a thousand uncaged wolves, and nobody dead, eh? I wouldn't have believed it possible, and I thought I knew Kahn's. He turned and saw a nervous assistant buckling on a revolver. Take off that gun and get it outside the gates quick, he commanded. Don't leave even a bean shooter inside these walls. This is no ordinary riot. There's headwork behind this. It looks as if we might have real trouble. Deputy Sherwood reached into his desk, struck a match, and lighted his cigar. When Martin Sherwood lighted tobacco, he was pleased. The whole prison knew this habit. Among the convicts, the sight of the deputy smoking invariably sent a silently spoken warning from lip to lip. The old man smoking. Be careful. Someone's going to hang on the sack straight jacket tonight they would say and the prediction seldom was unfulfilled it was true that martin sherwood took grim silent delight in inflicting punishment he hated and despised convicts and took pleasure in making them cringe and beg under the iron rod of his discipline somewhere well back in his ancestry there was a cross of indian blood a cross that revealed itself in coarse coal-black hair in teeth so white and strong and perfect they were all but repulsive, and lastly, in the cruelties of Punishment Hall, cruelties that made San Gregorio known as the toughest stir in the country. There was a reason for this strange twist in the character of a man absolutely fearless and otherwise fair. Years before, he had brought a bride to his home just outside the prison walls. She was pretty and young and weak just the sort of girl the attraction of opposites would send to a man like Martin Sherwood. There were a few months of happiness during which Sherwood sometimes was seen to smile even among the convicts. Then came the crash. A convict employed as a servant in the deputy's home completed his sentence and was released. With him went the deputy's wife, leaving behind a note that none but the deserted husband ever saw. He never revealed by word or look the wound that festered in his heart, but from that day he was a man unfeeling as iron, a man who hated convicts and rejoiced in their hatred of him. Punishment Hall, when he could use its tortures with justice, became his instrument of revenge. 
This perhaps explains why Martin Sherwood sat in his office calmly smoking a cigar when Captain Denison, white and shaken, rushed in and tumbled into a chair. His superior read in a glance the story of the scene in the mill. "'They might as well have killed you in the mill as to send you up here to die of fright in my office,' the deputy said with such biting sarcasm that Denison, terror-stricken as he was, flushed. A few quick, incisive questions brought out the facts about the revolt. "'Deputy, there is serious trouble ahead,' Denison warned in conclusion. "'Those cons have a leader. They obey like a regiment of soldiers. He is—' "'Boston Blackie, of course,' interrupted Sherwood. "'There isn't a man down there who would have planned and executed a plot like this but Blackie. I should have known better than to put him where he could come in contact with a man.' The guard who had been given the convict leader's ultimatum to the deputy warden rushed in. "'He says he wants the men out of Punishment Hall, and your promise of better food from now on, or he'll tear the mill down in an hour,' the man reported. The deputy warden tossed away his cigar and stepped out into the courtyard, bright with a thousand blossoms of the California spring. "'Sends an ultimatum to me, does he?' he repeated softly to himself. He's a man with real nerve and real brains. There is no way for me to reach the men while they're inside the mill. I must get them out and up here in this yard where the Gatlings and rifle guards will have a chance, and then I'll break Mr. Boston Blackie and the rest of them in the jacket, one by one. His eyes gleamed at the thought. He turned to the men in the office. I'm going down to the mill he said. Have a Gatling gun ready in each of the four towers that cover this yard. Ready, but out of sight. Do you understand? Down to the mill? cried Denison in amazement. Deputy, you don't realize the spirit of that mob. You won't live five minutes. They will murder you as surely as you put yourself in their power. Don't go. If I am not back in half an hour, your prediction will have been fulfilled, Sherwood said. He took his pocket knife and a roll of bills from his pocket and locked them in his desk. If I am not back in half an hour, Denison, call the warden at his club in San Francisco. Tell him what has happened and that they got me. Say my last word was for him to call on the governor for a regiment of militia. But for the next half hour, do nothing except get your nerve back, if you can. Sherwood pulled a straw from a whisk broom on his desk stuck it between his teeth, from which his lips curled back until the abnormally long incisors were revealed, and started for the mill yard as calmly as though he were going to luncheon. White-faced guards at the last gate tried to stay him. The uproar from within the mill was deafening. Songs, curses, and cries of frenzied exultation came from behind the steel-barred doors. "'Open the gates!' commanded Sherwood. Lock them behind me, and don't reopen them again, even if you think it's to save my life. Still holding the straw clenched between his teeth, the deputy crossed the yard, neither hurrying nor hesitating. Nothing in his face or demeanor gave the slightest indication that he knew he was delivering himself, unarmed, into the power of a thousand crazed men, every one of whom had reason to hate him, with that sort of undying hatred that grows from wrongs unrevenged and long suppressed. Sherwood hammered on the door with his fist. The clamor inside suddenly died. "'Open the door!' he commanded. "'I'm coming in to talk to you. I'm alone and unarmed.' The man on guard at the door raised the iron wicket and looked out. "'It's the deputy,' he whispered. "'He's alone, too. Once we get him inside—' The man sank his teeth into his lip until the blood streamed across his chin. Primeval savagery, hidden only skin deep in any man— reverts to the surface hideously among such men in such an hour. With hands trembling with eagerness, the convict unbarred the door, and Martin Sherwood stepped quickly in and faced the mob. For five seconds, that seemed an hour, there was dead silence. It was broken by an inarticulate, unhuman, menacing roar of rage that rose to a scream as the men realized the completeness of their power over the man who to them was the living embodiment of the law which denied them everything that makes life livable. A man in the rear of the mob thrust aside his fellows, rushed at the deputy and spat in his face. As calmly as though he were in his own office, Sherwood drew out his handkerchief and wiped his cheek, but never for an instant did his eyes waver from the men he faced. His teeth, 
whiter and more animal-like than ever, it seemed, gleamed like a wolf's fangs as he chewed at the straw between them. "'I'll remember that, Kelly, when I get you in the jacket,' he said slowly to the man who had spat upon him. The convict laughed, but pressed backward, cowed against his will by the fearless assurance of his antagonist. Boston Blackie was in the rear of the mill when the sudden silence warned him of new developments at the front door. Forcing his way through the crowd, he was within ten feet of the deputy warden before he saw him. The striped leader's face paled as he recognized Sherwood, paled with fear not of him but for him. If the official were killed, as there was every probability he would be, he knew it meant the gallows for himself and a score of the men behind him. He had risked everything on his ability to prevent bloodshed. The lives of all of them depended on the safety of the hated autocrat who stood before him calmly chewing a broom straw in the midst of hundreds of men hungering for his life. Blackie caught the deputy warden by the shoulder and turned him toward the door. Go, he said. Get out before they kill you. Sherwood threw off his hand. You may be able to command this convict rabble, Blackie, he said in a voice perfectly audible in the new silence which had fallen on the mob. But you can't command me. I came to talk to these men, and I'm going to do it. From somewhere in the rear came a metal weight which missed Sherwood's head by inches and crashed against the door behind him. The screaming blood cry rose again. One struck at the deputy's head with a shuttle, but Blackie, quicker in eye and hand, hit first and laid the man senseless at his feet. Then he jumped to the top of a loom. Men, if you want to hang, his voice rising even above the bedlam about him, I'll go along with you, if you'll listen to me first. The outcry died for a moment, and Blackie talked to them. He made no pleas, asked no favors. He told them their situation and his plan to attain the ends for which they had revolted, the release of the prisoners in punishment hall, and better food for themselves. He pointed the futility of the hope of escape, bringed about as they were by gatling guns and rifles and a score of watchtowers, even if they could force the walls as one suggested. Gradually, by sheer force of mind, he dominated the crowd, and when at last he called on them to follow him to the end, their cheer was that of soldiers to a recognized leader. All through this harangue, Sherwood stood listening, his face as inexpressive as the walls behind him. Deputy, said Blackie, turning to him, we have been told you said you would keep the men in punishment hall in the straight jacket until they die, if necessary, to find out who smuggled out the letter complaining about the rotten food. Is that true? It is, said Sherwood, who never lied. We make three demands, then, said Blackie. First, the release of all the men undergoing punishment. Second, your promise that no man concerned in this revolt shall be punished. Third, your guarantee that henceforth we get the food for which the state pays, but which the commissary captain steals. And if I refuse, what then? asked Sherwood. At noon, we will destroy the mill. Boys, said the deputy, I have listened to your spokesman. You know I can't grant your demands without consulting the warden, who is in San Francisco. I will do this, however. I will declare a half-holiday. It is almost dinner-time. Come over to the upper yard, have your dinner as usual, and we'll watch a ball game in the afternoon. Before night I will give you your answer." With the thought of the Gatling guns and rifles that covered the upper yard in his mind, Sherwood smiled grimly. The men cheered and made a rush in the direction of the doors, thinking the victory won. "'Wait!' cried Blackie, barring the door with uplifted arms. "'Nobody is going to stir out of this mill until you, Mr. Sherwood, have given us a definite promise all our demands are granted. You would like well enough to get us in the upper yard, away from those protecting walls, and where we couldn't do a dollar's worth of damage.' but we're not going. When the men in Punishment Hall are free, and you, who have never been known to lie, have told us that we'll be fed right, and no one harmed or punished now or in the future for this morning's work, we'll go into the upper yard, not before. Boys, said the deputy, still hoping to urge the men into the trap, do as I suggest. Why should you let this man, contemptuously indicating Blackie, order you around? He's only a con like yourselves. Come on up to the yard, and I'll issue an extra ration of tobacco all around. Are you going to go along with me, or stay here with him? We'll stay, answered Blackie for the men. It's no use, deputy. The game doesn't work this time. 
A shout from the man proved Sherwood's defeat. He wasn't a man to delay or lament over a beaten hand. "'You're quite a general, Blackie,' said the deputy slowly, a flicker of admiration in his eyes. "'I'll give you an answer in fifteen minutes. But—' He looked straight into Boston Blackie's eyes with steely determination. "'Don't think you are always going to have all the cards as you have today. The next time you and I clash, I'm going to break you like this.' He jerked the straw from his mouth and twisted it apart. Then he walked out of the mill. A quarter of an hour later, ten pain-racked prisoners from the punishment chambers were welcomed back to the mill with an outburst of exaltation such as San Gregorio Penitentiary had never seen. With them came the deputy warden's acceptance of Boston Blackie's terms. The men rioted joyously in an abandonment of happiness. In the midst of the turbulent jollification, a half-witted, one-armed boy, nicknamed the Squirrel, climbed to the top of a loom, drew out his one treasure, a mouth-organ, and tried to express his joy in the one way he knew, and his dismal interpretation of the star-spangled banner floated out over the crowd. "'Cut out the bum music!' cried a burly convict to whom the spirit of the hour had given a wanton impulse to command. "'Where do you figure in this, you nutty squirrel?' The boy's eyes filled with tears, and his notes faltered and died in the middle of a bar. Boston Blackie, always sensitive to the feelings of others, stopped the lad as he slunk from his perch on the loom and lifted him back. "'Go ahead. Play, little squirrel,' he said encouragingly. "'Your music is as good as a band. Go to it. You're one of us, you know, and we're all happy.' Intuitively, Blackie had salved the wound caused by the jibe. Radiant now, the squirrel pressed his mouth-organ to his lips and played on and on with a light in his dull eyes that made Blackie mutter, "'Poor kid! A pardon wouldn't make him any happier.' And the convicts, only one degree less childish than the squirrel, celebrated and sang in their cells that night, until at last they settled into silence and carefree sleep. No thought of a tomorrow disturbed them. But Boston Blackie, quiet and wakeful, lay on his cell-bunk, anxiously probing the future. In his mind he still saw the broken bits of Martin Sherwood's broomstraw fluttering to the mill floor and heard his threat. "'The next time you and I clash, I'm going to break you like this!' End of chapter 24 25 of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Boston Blackie's Mary For Mary, the days were the longest and saddest she had known. Her father, Dayton Tom, had done his bet, but this was different. She was a prison widow now, who never missed a visiting day at the San Gregorio Penitentiary. Twice each month she crossed the bay from San Francisco to the prison. Twice each month, with others like herself beside her, she rode from the station to the prison gates in the rickety old stage, and waited in the reception room, a quiver with impatience and longing, for the first glimpse of the man she loved. When he came, when he caught her in his arms and kissed her, looking into her face with eyes that answered the love in hers, then for a pitifully short half-hour both forgot prisons and the law and separations, and were happy. Boston Blackie and his Mary reckoned time from visiting day to visiting day. Those half-hours together, separated though they were by thirteen long blank days, made life endurable. Neither ever spoke of the long years that must elapse before Blackie would walk out through the gates and go home a free man with Mary. Blackie reckoned them at night in his cell, and Mary checked off each day on a calendar in her rooms, but when they were together, they let no evil thoughts mar their happiness. Ever since the strike, Blackie had been apprehensive and watchful. Deputy Warden Sherwood had made no attempt to punish any of the men concerned in the revolt. He was not a man to break his word. But when any of the men involved in it transgressed a prison rule, even in a trifling matter, the punishment that followed proved that Sherwood neither forgave nor forgot. On a bright Saturday afternoon, Blackie was impatiently pacing the yard, awaiting the summons to the reception room and Mary. 
it came at last, and he hurried through the gates, pass in hand. She was waiting for him, and sprang to his side, hands outstretched and trembling with eagerness, in her fear of losing even one second of their thirty precious minutes. Their kiss was interrupted by the gruff voice of Ellis, the reception-room guard. "'Wait a minute there, Blackie,' he commanded. "'Who is this woman?' "'Who is she?' repeated the convict in black amazement. "'Why, she's Mary, my wife. You surely know her well enough. She has been here every visiting day.' "'I know she's managed to slip in here on visiting days,' Ellis said. "'But what I ask you is, who and what is she? "'We're told she's an ex-con herself. "'If so, she can't visit you. "'The rules don't permit it.' "'The man turned to Mary. "'Isn't this your picture?' he asked sneeringly, "'as he handed her a photograph of a woman "'with a prison number pinned across the breast. "'It was Mary's picture. "'Years before, Mary Dawson, daughter of Dayton Tom, a professional crook, had been sent to the penitentiary because she declined to clear herself at the expense of one of her father's pals, and her past now had suddenly risen up to deprive her of the single treasure that life held, her half-hour visits with Blackie. "'It's my photograph,' she said in a voice choked with anguish, for she knew prisons too well not to realize what the admission meant. "'But, Mr. Ellis, please, please don't bar me because of that.' I did time, yes, but I wasn't guilty. For God's sake, don't take our visits away from us. They're, they're all we have. The girl's voice was broken by her sobs. Of course you weren't guilty. That's what they all say, the guard answered. You better beat it, woman, while you've got a chance. You're lucky the deputy don't put the city dicks on to you. There's a bunch of them over here today, too. Boston Blackie, white as a marble image, glared into the guard's face with eyes that narrowed dangerously. The man's reference to the deputy made everything clear. This was Sherwood's revenge. "'Did the deputy tell you to bar Mary from visiting me?' he demanded of the guard. "'What's that to you?' the man answered with pointed insolence. "'I don't want her here, and she's barred, that's all. She's got nerve to come here anyway, among decent women, the—' The word never left his lips. Boston Blackie's blow caught him on the chin, and Ellis sprawled across the room and toppled to the floor. In a second, Blackie was on him again, grasping his throat in a frenzy of savagery. The whole reception room was in an uproar. Women screamed. Convicts shouted encouragement. Blackie's vice-like grip was strangling the all-but-unconscious guard. Mary's voice, pleading with him frantically, restored the convict to sanity. "'Don't kill him! Don't kill him!' she begged. For your sake and mine, let him go, dear. Think what it means to us both. Slowly, Blackie's grip loosened. He dropped the man and took Mary in his arms. Goodbye, dear one, he said. I've tried to get by here without trouble, but Sherwood won't let me. From now on, I've just one purpose. I'm going to beat this place. I'm going to escape. Watch and wait for me. It may be a month, it may be a year, but some day... I'll come. Guard summoned by the uproar rushed in, and one struck Blackie over the head with a club, laying him bleeding and senseless. Blackie, still unconscious, was carried inside the gates into the deputy's office, where Sherwood was informed that Boston Blackie had committed the most heinous of prison crimes. He had struck an officer. Take him to Punishment Hall and leave him there for tonight. Don't give him punishment of any kind. I'll attend to that in the morning," the deputy ordered. As the guards carried Boston Blackie across the yard toward the punishment chamber, Martin Sherwood took a match from his desk and lighted the cigar he had been chewing. Boston Blackie lay on the floor in punishment hall, trussed up in the straitjacket as tightly as two able-bodied guards could draw the ropes. Great beads of perspiration stood on his forehead. A thin trickle of blood showed on his chin, beneath which his clenched teeth bit into the flesh. The man's eyes betrayed the torture he was suffering, but no sound came from his lips. Martin Sherwood stood above him, looking down at the helpless form in the canvas sack. He was smoking. A prison straitjacket on a wall is nothing alarming to the eye, but in operation it is an instrument of most fiendish torture. The victim stands upright, arms straight down before him, and hands on the front of each leg. 
The jacket itself is a heavy canvas contrivance that extends from the neck to the knees with eyelets in the back in which ropes make it possible to cinch it to any degree desired, as a woman's corset can be tightened. When the jacket is adjusted over the arms and body, the man is laid face downward on the floor, and guards tighten the jacket by placing a foot on the small of the convict's back and drawing in the ropes with their full strength. Fully tightened, the jacket shuts off blood circulation throughout the body almost completely. For the first five minutes, oppressed breathing is the only inconvenience felt. Then the stagnating blood commences to cause the most excruciating torture, a thousand pains as if white-hot needles are being passed through the flesh, run through the body. The feet and limbs swell and turn black. Irresistible weights seem to be crushing the brain. Four hours in the jacket made one convict a paralytic for life. Some men have endured it for half or three-quarters of an hour without crying out, but only a few. Boston Blackie had been in the jacket for an hour and five minutes, and as yet Martin Sherwood had waited in vain for groans and pleas for release. The prison physician stood nearby looking on anxiously. One man had died after the jacket had been used on him in San Gregorio, and the newspapers made quite a fuss about it. The doctor didn't want a repetition of that trouble, and yet he knew the man on the floor had been under punishment fully twenty minutes too long. Still the deputy gave no indication of an intention to release him. Five minutes passed. Blackie's face was a ghastly purple. Blood oozed from his nostrils. He rolled aimlessly to and fro on the floor, but his lips still were clenched, and no sound came from them. The doctor grew more and more nervous. At last he called the deputy warden aside. "'He said enough, more than enough, deputy,' he urged. "'Hadn't we better call it off?' "'Never, till he begs,' said Sherwood, biting off his cigar in the middle and tossing it away. Perspiration stood on his brow, too. Five more minutes passed, and the form on the floor, too horrible now to be described, ceased to roll and toss. The doctor stooped over him quickly. "'He's out,' he announced. "'You've got to quit now, Sherwood. A few more minutes are likely to kill him, and anyway he's unconscious and you're not doing any good.' "'Release him,' said the deputy warden curtly. "'Take him over to the hospital and bring him round.' We'll try it again tomorrow. Hours later, Boston Blackie, slowly and painfully, came back into what seemed a blurred and hideous world. He didn't break me, he said over and over to himself. I've beaten him again. I'll do it just once more, too. Nobody has ever escaped from this place since Martin Sherwood has been deputy, but I will. The relieved doctor gave Blackie a drink that sent him off into an uneasy slumber, in which he was climbing an interminable ladder to a garden from which Mary stretched down her arms to him. But when he seized her hands, the fingers shriveled into cigars, and her face changed to Martin Sherwood's, whose white teeth bit into his flesh until he clenched his lips to keep from crying out. "'When Blackie gets out of the hospital, put him in charge of the lawn in front of my offices,' said Sherwood to the assignment captain the following morning. "'I have decided not to give him any more of the jacket.' The captain wonderingly obeyed. It was the first time he had ever known the deputy to deviate from his inflexible rule that a convict once sent to the jacket stayed until he begged for mercy. End of chapter 25 26 of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Play for me, Little Squirrel. Martin Sherwood, from within his office, stood fixedly studying Boston Blackie, who was spraying the courtyard lawn with a hose. The convict was more like a skeleton than a living man. His striped coat hung sack-like across his emaciated shoulders. His cheekbones seemed about to burst through the crinkled, parchment-like skin that covered them. His eyes were dull, deep-set, and haggard, his movements slow and languid, like a confirmed invalid's. "'He's ill, without doubt,' mused the deputy warden. "'The doctor's evidently right about the stomach trouble. No man could counterfeit his appearance. And yet... Sherwood's brow was wrinkled with perplexity as he studied the convict. 
everything may be as it seems. If he were any man but Boston Blackie, I should be wasting my time thinking about it. But because he is Boston Blackie, I am puzzled. It's three months since I barred his wife from the prison and gave him the jacket. Three months in which he has been docile as a lamb, though I know such a man must have murder in his heart every time he lays eyes on me. Why this calm? The perplexed furrow and the deputy's brow deepened. For ten minutes he stood studying Blackie without making a movement or a sound. "'One of two things is true,' the deputy concluded. "'Either he is just a common con after all, and I did break him in the jacket, or else he's getting ready to cover my king with the ace of trumps. Suppose his plan, whatever it is, requires him to sleep in the hospital. He'd have to be sick to get there, of course. Really sick, too.' Just then Boston Blackie, unconscious of the deputy's scrutiny, turned toward him, and the sunlight fell full on his emaciated face. "'God, he looks like a corpse now,' was Sherwood's thought. "'It's impossible this sickness is a trick. And yet nothing is impossible to a man who can stand the jacket without a murmur. I'm going to play safe. I'm going to move him out of the hospital, though there isn't a surer place to keep a man inside the walls, as far as I can see. I'll move him, anyway.' If he tries to get back there again, I'll know I'm right. Sherwood turned to his clerk. Phone to the doctor to come over, he said. The physician protested strongly against the deputy warden's order to transfer Boston Blackie from his cell in the hospital to one of the dormitories in the cell house. The man's nothing but a living corpse now, deputy, he argued. He has a stomach complaint I haven't been able to diagnose. He isn't likely to live another three months. He hasn't eaten a thing but bread crusts for weeks. Let him die in the hospital. Move him over to see dormitory tomorrow morning, Sherwood commanded with finality. I'm going to put him in with Tennessee Red, who keep me informed of what he does nights. I've got a hunch, Doctor, that Mr. Boston Blackie is framing another surprise party for us. I'll find some excuse to move Red's present cellmate out by tomorrow. The doctor went back to the hospital shaking his head at the strange vagaries of his superior concerning Boston Blackie. He sent his runner, the half-witted one-armed boy Blackie had protected on the day of the strike, for the turnkey. "'The deputy has ordered Boston Blackie out of the hospital,' he said when the messenger returned with the officer. "'He thinks Blackie is framing something. I told him the man won't do anything worse than die, but he's set on moving him, and so we'll have to do it. Looks to me as if Blackie's sort of on the old man's nerves since the affair of the jacket.' I never knew him to worry so much about any man in the prison. He's going to put him in with Tennessee Red, his chief stool pigeon, and see what he can find out. The deputy won't have Red's cell partner out until tomorrow, so don't say anything to Blackie tonight. The officers separated. The squirrel climbed back on his stool and looked out through the barred windows to the lawn, where he could see Boston Blackie laboriously dragging his hose across the grass. There was new grief in the squirrel's dull eyes. He had heard what the doctor told the turnkey. They were going to take Blackie away from the hospital dormitory. Blackie, who gave the squirrel tobacco and the inside of a loaf of bread each night. Blackie, who always protected him when the other men teased him. Blackie, his friend. The boy's eyes filled with tears. Blackie was the only one who liked to hear the squirrel play his mouth organ, and now they were going to take him away. But Blackie was smart. The doctor had said, not until tomorrow. Maybe if the squirrel told Blackie at dinner time what he had heard, Blackie would find some way to make them let him stay in the hospital. Slowly the ideas filtered through the haze that clouded the dull brain. Boston Blackie was sitting in his dormitory cell, slowly chewing the crust of a half loaf of bread, from which he had hollowed out the soft inner portion that his tortured stomach couldn't digest, when the squirrel slipped into the cell. The boy laid his fingers on his lips as Blackie started to speak. "'They mustn't know I'm here,' he said. "'I heard what the doctor told the screw. "'They're going to take you out of the hospital.' Boston Blackie's loaf fell to the floor. "'When, little squirrel, when?' he whispered hoarsely, gripping the boy by the shoulder. A great fear showed in the convict's eyes. "'Tomorrow, when the deputy gets a place ready for you with Tennessee Red,' the boy answered. "'Thank God, I've one more night.' One night must be enough. 
Blackie, scarcely aware that he was voicing his mind, sank back in relief so intense it left his whole body dripping with perspiration. A new danger occurred to him. "'What else did the doctor say, little squirrel?' he asked. "'He said the deputy thinks you are framing something, but it isn't so, because you're going to die in three months. Are you going to die in three months, Blackie?' "'No, not in three months, little squirrel.' answered Blackie, and then softly to himself he added, "'But maybe tonight.' He turned again to the boy, his mind swiftly grappling with the details of the task before him, which must be done now in a single night. "'Will you play your mouth organ for me tonight, Squirrel?' he asked. "'Will you play it all the time, from lock-up till the lights go out? All the time, Squirrel, and loud, so I can hear it plain. Here's a sack of tobacco for you. You won't forget.' all the time, and loud. Yes, all the time, and loud, the boy repeated, dog-like devotion in his eyes. Boston Blackie mopped a forehead, dripping with cold perspiration. All his hopes of freedom depended on a half-witted boy and his mouth organ. Boston Blackie's mind that afternoon was a jumble of torturing doubts, painstaking calculation, and unflinching resolution. The deputy warden's intuition had not misled him. Blackie had planned an escape, and his every act for weeks had been taken with that sole purpose in view. His plan required that he sleep in the hospital dormitory used for tubercular patients and others unfit for the cell houses, but not bedridden. To accomplish this, he diluted prison laundry soap strong with lye and drank it day after day until it ruined his stomach and left him unable to digest any food but hard-baked crusts of bread. The lie caused him excruciating anguish, but in ten days it accomplished its purpose. Blackie had been ordered to the hospital dormitory to be put on a diet and given treatment for his puzzling stomach trouble. He had been there two months and was still using the lie to prevent the possibility of being turned back to his old quarters. He had wrecked his physique, but each night saw him a step nearer his goal. He wasn't ready to make his bid for freedom. But the deputy, with uncanny divination, had given him no choice. He must make the attempt that night, or never. First he took a spade and laboriously began to dig around the rose bushes that flanked the lawn. No one saw him uncover a rudely improvised saw made with his hoe file from a steel knife stolen from the kitchen. The saw and a tobacco sack containing a single five-dollar bill were quickly hidden in his blouse. The bill had come from Mary, in the cover of a book sent him according to instructions delivered by a discharged convict. Next he asked permission to air his blankets on the clothesline in the lower yard. The tool house in which his garden implements were kept was nearby. From beneath its floor he took the treasures that cost him the hardest work and greatest risk, a civilian pair of trousers, a blue shirt, and a Mackinac coat made from a blanket, and a cap. It had taken him one full month to steal them from the tailor shop where the clothes of the new arrivals were kept after they received their prison stripes. The trousers Blackie put on under his striped ones, pinning up the legs while out of sight. When the blankets went back to his cell, the coat, shirt, and cap were hidden in them. A half hour before lock-up time, Blackie rolled up his garden hose and carried it to the tool house. Once within the doors, and alone, he cut off six feet of the hose and wound it around his body, tying it securely in place. Next from a pile of rubbish, he unearthed a single rubber glove which he had filched one day from the hospital dispensary. He had tried in vain to get its mate. Two hundred feet of heavy twine from the mill completed the list of his preparations. It would have puzzled even a man as shrewd as Martin Sherwood to determine how Boston Blackie planned to escape from San Gregorio Penitentiary with a motley array of contraband he had gathered together. The hospital dormitory, where he celled, was on the top floor of a detached building that stood alone in the yard, fully a hundred feet from the wall that surrounded the prison. It was conceivably possible for a man with even such a makeshift saw as Blackie's to cut the bars of his window and escape from his cell. But freedom from his cell was a long step from real freedom. There still remained the thirty-foot wall to be scaled, a wall guarded on top by a gun guard and a watchtower, and patrolled at the bottom all night by other armed guards. At five o'clock Boston Blackie and the other hospital inmates were locked in their cells for the night. Thereafter, twice each hour, a guard was scheduled to pass and inspect the cells. 
At five minutes past five, the squirrel, faithful to his promise, began to play on his mouth organ. And as the boy played, Blackie chipped away the soap and lamp black with which he had plugged a half-sawed window bar and cut it with his pitifully inadequate saw in frantic haste. The noise of the mouth organ drowned the gentle rasping of the saw, a vitally and necessary precaution. A mirror hung on the wall near the door warned Blackie of the approach of the guard each time he made his rounds. Hour after hour the squirrel played, and hour after hour Blackie sawed. He had spent a month and a half sawing through the first bar and halfway through the second. Tonight, in four hours, he must complete the task, for at nine o'clock lights out would sound throughout the prison and silence would settle over the dormitory, making further work on the bar impossible. The saw blade cut into his hands and tore his fingertips. His arms were numb with pain. The sing-song rasping seemed like a voice crying out a warning to the guards. The saw grew hot, and again and again he had to cool it in the water bucket. Often it seemed as if he couldn't drive his tortured muscles another second. But he conjured into his mind a picture of Martin Sherwood's face with the teeth gleaming in a white line as he bent over a form in a straitjacket. Sheer willpower kept the saw moving then, and so slowly it was almost imperceptible, but surely, none the less, it bit through the steel that seemed a living thing bent on binding Blackie to years of prison slavery and punishment. At last it was done. With fifteen precious minutes to spare, the saw grated through the outer rim of rust and left the bar severed. With two bars cut and bent outward, Blackie knew he could squeeze his body through the window to the wide ledge outside and four stories above the guarded courtyard below. He swept the glistening filings into his water bucket, hid the saw, worn now smooth as a knife, and tumbled on his bunk a quivering wreck. The prison bell tolled out nine. The lights winked out, and silence settled over the dormitory. At one o'clock, Blackie waited for the guard to pass, and then, with a half-hour at his disposal, slipped out of his convict clothes and fashioned them into a dummy which he covered with blankets to resemble a sleeping man. He dressed in his civilian clothes, with his six-foot length of hose still coiled about his body. He tucked his one glove carefully into his breast beside the ball of twine. Then he pulled out one of the heavy legs of his stool and tied it across his back. His preparations were complete. He took another stool leg, and using it as a lever, bent the severed bars straight out. A moment later he stood outside on the window ledge. Below him the wall fell away sheer for four stories. Six feet above his head the rain gutter marked the level of the flat roof. So far Blackie had followed in the footsteps of other men who had tried to escape. But the others, once free from their cells, had gone down, each to be shot to death as he lurked in the courtyard, vainly seeking a means to cross the towering wall that barred him in. Instead of going down, Blackie went up. He took off his shoes and hung them about his neck. With fingers and toes clutching the bricks that jutted out a few inches around the window coping, he climbed slowly and with infinite caution upward. A single slip, the slightest misstep, and Martin Sherwood would smile and light a cigarette in the morning when they carried his body in. Inch by inch Blackie raised himself, pressing his body close to the wall to keep from overbalancing. For the first time he realized his physical weakness. His arms were like dead things, and unresponsive to the iron will that commanded them. Again and again, in the agony of forcing his wasted muscles to obedience, he thought of releasing his clutch and falling to a quick death. Relief. But always, in the wake of that thought, Martin Sherwood's face danced before his eyes, and the cruel satisfaction of the deputy nerved Blackie to climb on. At last his groping, bloody fingers clutched the edge of the roof gutter. He faced the last crucial task. He must now swing his feet clear and raise himself to the roof by his arms alone. No great feat for a well man, but to the ill and exhausted convict, one that taxed even his iron resolution to the last atom of its resource. Somehow he did it, and lay at last safe on the roof, blinking back at the stars, which hung so low it seemed he could reach up and touch them. 
He lay still, thoughtlessly content, until the chiming prison bell forced on his wandering mind the realization that a precious half-hour was gone, leaving him still inside the walls that barred the road to Mary. Blackie rose and crept silently to the edge of the roof nearest the wall. He was high above that stone barricade, from which he was separated by a full hundred feet of space. Nothing, apparently, spanned that impassable gap, and yet when one looked again, something did span it, two glistening copper wires that ran down from the roof at a sharp angle to a pole outside the wall above which they hung a full twenty feet. They were uninsulated live wires which fed the prison machinery and lighting system with a current that was death to whatever touched them, yet they were the key to Boston Blackie's plan of escape. Carefully he unwound the length of rubber hose from about his body. Carefully he laid the insulating rubber over the strands of shining metal. With infinite pains he bound and rebound the stool leg to the dangling length of rubber that hung beneath them. The result was a crazily insecure trapeze, which swung under wires the touch of which was fatal. Then Boston Blackie pulled out his ball of jute twine and attached it to a brick chimney, the only thing upright and secure in sight. He glanced toward the wall far beneath him, where a sleepy guard dozed in his tower. Then Blackie unhesitatingly seated himself on the bar of his improvised trapeze. With his back toward the wall, he swung clear of the roof and began to slide down the wires, regulating his speed with a cord on the chimney. The light wires swayed and sagged, but supported his weight. Yard by yard he let himself down. Half the perilous journey through the air was accomplished, and he was directly over the wall when the chimney cord that kept him from shooting madly backward down the incline suddenly snapped. The hose trapeze shot downward at headlong speed. Instinctively, Boston Blackie reached up with both hands to seize the wires and check his fall. Even as he reached, realization of the certain death they carried flashed through his brain. He stayed one hand within inches of the wire. With the other, the one covered with a single rubber glove, he caught one of the wires and gradually checked his fall. Slowly he slid over the wall and down toward the pole outside the prison enclosure. When its shadow warned him he had almost reached it, he stopped himself, and turning his head studied the network of wires with deep caution. Seeing no way of avoiding their death-dealing touch if he tried to work his way through them and clamber down the pole, he slipped from his seat on the trapeze, hung by his hands for the fraction of a second, and dropped. The fall jarred him from head to foot but left him crouching by the light pole, uninjured and outside the walls. For five minutes he lay motionless, watching for any sign of an alarm from the walls. None came. He was free. Slowly and on his stomach, Indian fashion, Blackie worked his way out from San Gregorio and across the sweet-smelling fields that led toward the world of free men. When the last watchtower was behind him, he rose to his feet and raised his arms toward the blinking and kindly stars in a fervent but unspoken prayer of thanksgiving. He had done the impossible. He had escaped from the hitherto unbeatable prison ruled by Martin Sherwood. End of chapter 26seven of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Trapped. Just as the morning bell was rousing the sleepy cell houses at San Gregorio to another weary day of serfdom, a gaunt wraith of a man climbed a rear stairway to a tiny apartment on Laguna Street, San Francisco. The early morning fog added to his ghost-like appearance as he softly rapped at the bedroom window with the knock that is the open sesame of the underworld. The woman sleeping within awoke instantly with a start, but lay quiet, fearing she still dreamed, for in her dream she had been with Boston Blackie, her husband. Again she heard the soft rap at the window. She sprang to the sash, looked out, and threw it open, seizing in her arms the scarecrow of a man who stood there and dragging him inside. Mary, he cried. Blackie, she answered. 
All the endearments of all the languages accentuated a hundredfold were in the two words. God in heaven, I thank you, she whispered, falling to her knees with Blackie's stained and haggard face clasped to her breast. Boston Blackie is missing from his cell in the hospital, sir. He sawed two window bars and got out during the night. He left his clothes rolled into a dummy on his bunk, and the night guard didn't discover it until the morning count a moment ago. But he can't be far away. He couldn't have gotten over the wall and must be hidden somewhere about the prison, the night captain thinks. He has ordered the whole force out to make a search. The hospital turnkey saluted the deputy warden and stood awaiting his orders. There was no surprise in Martin Sherwood's eyes, and no excitement in his manner. "'And so he's gone,' he said. "'His convict suit in his bunk, you say?' the guard nodded. "'Tell the captain he needn't bother to search the prison yard or buildings. He's wasting his time,' Sherwood continued. "'Blackie has five to seven hours' start, at least. He's miles away from here now.' "'But he can't be. He must be inside the walls. He couldn't have gotten over them,' protested the guard. "'He's over the walls, safe enough,' Sherwood returned with conviction. "'Boston Blackie isn't a man to saw his way out of a cell and then hide in the dark corner of the prison and wait for us to find him. He's gone, without a doubt.' The deputy pulled his phone toward him and called the chief of police of San Francisco at his home. "'Boston Blackie, the safe-blower, has escaped.' he said when a sleepy voice answered him over the wire. "'What? It's the first time, yes, but there has to be a first time for everything, you know, particularly when you're dealing with a man like Blackie. Now, Chief, he's bound to go straight to Mary Dawson, a woman who is living somewhere in your town. I wish you would put your best men out quick to locate her. It ought to be easy, for every crook in town knows them both, and somebody will be sure to tell where she is living.' You have a second to spare, for both she and Blackie will drop out of sight before night so completely we will never find them. We'll offer five hundred dollars reward for Blackie. Sure. All right. I'll be over. Martin Sherwood hung up the phone and turned to the work before him with something akin to pleasurable anticipation in his face. Like all truly strong men, he found satisfaction in a battle with a worthy foeman. Meanwhile, in Mary Dawson's Laguna Street apartment, Boston Blackie was no less alert than Martin Sherwood. "'Does anybody know this address?' he asked the woman who sat on his knee stroking his hair and running gentle, loving fingers sadly over the deep lines left in his haggard face by pain and illness. "'I moved only a month ago when you sent me word,' she said. "'Scarcely anyone knows. I met Diamond Frank and Stella last week, and they were up here to dinner.' "'We must get away from here at once,' Blackie said. "'We've got to disappear so completely it will be humanly impossible to trace us. One overlooked clue, the slightest in the world, will lead the deputy warden to us. He's no ordinary copper. It's a hundred to one he has half the detectives in town out hunting this flat now, for he knows, of course, that I'll go to you. But, little sweetheart, I'll promise you this. Whether he finds us or not, He'll never take Boston Blackie back to San Gregorio. Have you my guns? Mary nodded, shuddering, and began to throw clothes into a trunk. Never mind packing the trunk, Mary, Blackie corrected. Just throw together what you can get into a couple of suitcases, dear. We'll leave everything else behind. We're not going to use any transfer man in this move, little woman. Mary sighed as she obeyed without question. Little feminine trinkets are dear to a woman, and she hated to leave them, but Blackie's word was the only law she knew. There was nothing to distinguish the man and woman carrying suitcases who took a car near Mary's apartment and crossed to the other side of the city from scores of other passengers who traveled with them, except the man's emaciation. They rented a room in a modest lodging house on the edge of a good residence district. Mary said Blackie the moment they were alone. There's work for you to do, quickly. We're safe here until tonight, but no longer. Go downtown to Levy's theatrical shop. Tell them you're playing a grandmother's part in an amateur play and get a complete old woman's outfit. White wig, clothes, shoes, everything. Get a cheap hat and a working girl's hand-me-down, too. 
You're too well-dressed not to attract attention where we're going. Draw every dollar we have in the bank just as soon as possible, for every moment you are on the street is a danger. You better bring something to eat, too, just a loaf of bread, for I ruined my stomach with lye to get into the prison hospital and can't eat anything but crusts. Above everything, be careful no one recognizes you and trails you out here. Every copper in town must be looking for us by this time. He drew two revolvers from the suitcase, looked carefully to their loads, and laid them on the bed. I'm going to sleep while you're gone. I didn't get much rest last night, he said, smiling happily. At noon that day, while Boston Blackie lay sleeping in the Crosstown Lodging House, the police located Mary Dawson's Laguna Street apartment. Diamond Frank had casually mentioned the address to another crook, who happened to mention it to a bartender who was a stool pigeon, and so deviously but surely it finally reached headquarters. The chief of police called in a dozen of his best men, armed them, and sent them out in two autos. "'Take no chances with him, boys,' the chief warned. When he's lying dead in a morgue, it might be safe to walk in on him. But I wouldn't gamble on it then unless I'd seen him killed. He's a bad un. Take care of yourselves. The chief's men did so to the very best of their ability. They put officers with drawn guns at every door and window, outside. When everything was ready, and not even a mouse could have escaped from the house without being riddled by a dozen bullets, the captain in charge of the expedition asked who would volunteer to enter the apartment and arrest the escaped convict. The policemen shifted uneasily on their feet and glanced expectantly at each other, but no one spoke. Somebody had an inspiration. "'Let's send the landlady to the door with a phony letter,' he suggested. "'When the girl comes to the door, we'll grab her and bust in on Blackie before he knows we're in the joint.' The plan was adopted. The landlady knocked on the door with four brawny men behind her, ready to seize whoever opened it. There was no response. Finally the landlady herself opened the door. Gone, chorused the detectives as they saw the empty rooms. The girl's out somewhere, probably to meet him. Then they'll come back here, both of them, the captain declared. They haven't blowed. Look at the trunks and clothes. Now we'll get them dead to rights. We'll just plant inside here and cover them when they come back. But the guards in Mary's flat stayed there three days waiting to pounce on the man, who never came. Meanwhile, Sherwood started a canvas of every hotel and lodging house in the city. On the third day, a detective brought in the information that a landlady, when shown Blackie's picture, identified it as that of a man who came with his wife and rented a room on the morning of the escape. They had two suitcases. The woman went out and came back with some packages. The next morning, when she went to collect her rent for the second day, the couple had gone. That was all the landlady knew. I thought so. Sherwood mused when the news was phoned him. He's hidden somewhere he thinks is perfectly secure. Every exit from the city is guarded, but that's pretty much wasted effort, for Boston Blackie, if I know him, won't stir from his place of refuge for weeks, maybe months. The man who finds him now will have real reason to compliment himself. And, he added with unalterable determination, I'm going to be that man. Sherwood turned the management of the prison over to a subordinate, and spent his time directing the investigation of the hundreds of clues the reward brought to the police, but all proved futile. Fewer and fewer clues came in. A newer sensation crowded stories of the hunt for Boston Blackie from the first pages of the newspapers. The police, frankly, were beaten. Only Martin Sherwood kept at the task. Sherwood puzzled and pondered for days without finding the clue he sought. Every detail of the escaped convict's appearance as he last saw him on the prison lawn was graven photographically on his brain. He remembered the emaciated face, the two brilliant eyes, the sunken shoulders from which the flesh had fallen away during his illness in the hospital. The doctor said that illness was real, he pondered. Stomach trouble, he said. And he's not a man to be fooled. Blackie was really sick, without doubt, and yet that sickness couldn't have been mere chance. He hadn't eaten anything but outer crusts of bread for weeks. Even the night he escaped he left the inside of a loaf. He always did that, always threw away the inside of bread loaves, because he couldn't digest them. Martin Sherwood sprang to his feet more nearly excited than he had been in years. It's a long chance, he said to himself, but it is a chance. 
He'll be more than human if he has thought of that, too. The deputy warden ordered his car and drove out to the city incinerator, where garbage wagons of the city consigned their ill-smelling burdens to a cleansing flame. Sherwood explained to the superintendent. "'Tell every garbage collector in the city,' he said, "'that I'll pay the man who finds the hollowed-out insides of loaves of bread in a garbage can one hundred dollars for the address from which that can was filled.' In three days, Mary, just three short days, we'll sail out through the Golden Gate. You and I will be together with a new world ahead, and Martin Sherwood behind, nursing the bitterness of defeat. Mary, with a better, sweeter happiness in her eyes than Boston Blackie had ever seen there, clung to him as he spoke. They were in the two small rooms, kitchen and bedroom, in which they had lain securely hidden during the ten days which had elapsed since Blackie's flight from prison. Their landlady, who scrubbed office-building floors at night to support herself, lived alone on the floor below. The house was an attic cottage with a garden in San Francisco's sunny mission. Boston Blackie and his Mary sat hand in hand, planning a future without a flaw, a future as rosy-hued as the girl's cheeks. The realization of their hopes was very near now. In three days a steamer sailed for Central America ports. Their passage was paid. The hunt for Blackie had died down. Once aboard the steamer and out of the harbor, a matter of little risk now, they would be safe and free and unafraid. So they sat and planned at happy whispers, for caution still bade them be low-voiced while their landlady was in the house, while just below them, low-voiced and cautious too, Martin Sherwood questioned that landlady. End of Chapter 27 8 of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Man to Man. I have no rumors but a Miss Collins and her mother, who is an invalid, poor soul. They have the two rooms in the attic, she was telling the deputy. The girl is learning shorthand and don't go out much. The old lady is crippled with rheumatism and can't leave the rooms. Well, they are nice, quiet, respectable people, sir. Sherwood was deeply puzzled. From the garbage can behind this house had come a half dozen loaves of bread in three days, with the crusts, and only the crusts, eaten off. He had come to the house after painstaking preparation, feeling that Blackie and Victory were within his grasp. The landlady's story of the girl who studied shorthand and an invalid mother found no place in his theory of what he would find there, and yet it was evident the woman spoke the truth. "'What does the girl look like? What is the color of her hair?' he asked. "'Red, sir, a beautiful red like a polished copper kettle.' Mary's hair was coal-black. For the first time Martin Sherwood's confidence was shaken. "'When did they come here?' he asked. Why, let me see, the woman reckoned on her fingers. It was a week ago Thursday, sir, in the evening. They saw my advertisement in the paper and came just before I went to work, which is nine o'clock, sir. Blackie had escaped early in the morning of the day she mentioned. On that Thursday night he and Mary had disappeared from the lodging house, which was their first place of refuge. The date and hour of their arrival decided Sherwood. He would have to look at this red-haired girl and her invalid mother. "'I would like to go up and see them for a moment,' he told the women. "'I'm an officer,' he showed his star. "'Oh, no, nothing wrong at all. I just want to see them. I like to keep track of people in the district.' "'Certainly, sir. I'll call Miss Collins and—' "'No, no, that isn't necessary,' hastily interrupted Sherwood. "'I'll just step upstairs and knock.' Though he tried to step lightly, as Sherwood's tread sounded on the uncarpeted stairway, there was a sudden shuffling of feet on the floor above. He smiled, for that augured well, and he felt for the gun slung just inside his coat. Then he rapped. Muffled sounds came from behind the door. A chair squeaked as it was pushed across the floor. A few seconds of silence. Then plain and unmistakable came the sound of a woman sobbing hysterically. Sherwood tried the door, found it locked, and knocked again peremptorily. 
the door suddenly was flung open, and in the flood of light from within a woman faced him, a woman with a wreath of bronze hair that should have been black, a woman with tears on cheeks that were as bloodless as death, a woman whom he instantly recognized as Boston Blackie's Mary. Martin Sherwood sprang inside with drawn revolver ready to answer the stream of lead he expected from some corner of the room. None came. Instead, he saw a woman, white-haired and evidently feeble, sitting beside a bed with bowed head while her body shook with convulsive sobs. On the bed, covered with a sheet that was drawn up over the face, lay a silent, motionless form that told its own story. Sudden disappointment gripped Martin Sherwood's heart. Had the man he had rated so highly cheated him of his long-coveted triumph only by the coward's expedient of suicide? "'Where's Boston Blackie?' he demanded, his gun still covering the room. Mary pointed silently to the still figure on the bed. "'Dead?' exclaimed the deputy warden. "'When? How?' "'An hour ago,' she sobbed. "'You starved him to death in your prison.' She dropped to her knees. "'God have mercy on us now,' she prayed. Sherwood strode to the bed, beside which the aged woman still sat sobbing, and leaning over lifted the sheet. As he did so, his gun for the first time failed to cover all the room. Beneath the sheet, instead of the face he expected, he saw a roll of blankets carefully molded and tied into the semblance of a human form. Before he could turn, cold steel was pressed against the base of his brain. "'Drop that gun, Sherwood,' said Boston Blackie's voice from behind him. "'Drop it quick. Raise it one inch, and you'll be as dead as you thought I was.' Sherwood hesitated as a full realization of the new situation flashed through his mind. Then he smiled as he thought of the posse he had thrown around the house and let his revolver slip through his fingers to the bed. Here was a worthy antagonist, a bit too worthy as the cards lay just then, but the deal was far from done. "'Pick up his gun, Mary, and lay it on the table in the corner, well out of the deputy's way,' directed Blackie. "'Then see if he has another.' I don't care to move the muzzle of my gun from his neck just yet. Now, he continued, slip off these skirts. I'm not overly well used to them, even though I've worn them for ten days, and if Mr. Sherwood should forget the company he's in and get suddenly reckless, they might be in my way. Now turn around, Sherwood, and face the music, ordered Blackie a moment later. The deputy warden turned and faced the convict behind whom lay a discarded white wig and an old woman's garments. He met his captor's eyes without a tremor and smiled. "'Well done, Blackie, I must admit,' he said. "'But I should have known that when you didn't shoot as I came in, things weren't what they seemed.' "'I didn't expect you, Sherwood,' Blackie replied. "'But as you see, I made preparations to receive you in case you came.' The convict's face grew pale and suddenly grave. His grip on the gun leveled at the deputy's head, tightened. "'You understand, of course, Sherwood.' I've got to kill you, he said then. As matters stand, naturally it wouldn't surprise me, the deputy answered. His voice was absolutely calm and unshaken, his eyes without the remotest trace of fear. If you have anything to say or do or think, be quick, said the convict. I haven't. Thank you. The men stared into each other's eyes, the silence broken only by Mary's sobs. "'I hate to kill a man as brave as you in cold blood,' said Boston Blackie slowly. "'You're a brave man, Sherwood, even when you don't hold all the cards in the game as you do inside your prison. I hate to kill you, but I've got to. I can't tie and gag you. You'd get free before we could get away from the city. I can't risk that.' "'Naturally not,' said Sherwood. "'I couldn't trust your promise not to bother me in a life-and-death matter like this if I let you go alive.' continued Blackie, with troubled eyes. "'I wouldn't give it if you did.' There was no hesitation in the answer. "'Well, then,' the gun that covered the deputy warden's head swayed downward till the muzzle covered his heart. "'Are you ready?' "'Any time,' said Sherwood. The hammer rose under the pressure of the convict's finger on the trigger. Mary Dawson, crying hysterically now, turned away her face and covered her ears. "'Do you want to go, Mary, before I—I I do what I must do?' asked Blackie, realizing what the scene with its inevitable end must mean to the girl. 
It would be better for you to go, dear. No, no, she cried. I want to share with you the all blame for what you do. I won't go till you do. Sherwood turned his eyes curiously on the woman. Sherwood knew what he would have risked for such a woman and such love. Boston Blackie's face was strangely gray. The hammer of the revolver rose, hesitated, fell, then rose again. The deputy, his gaze returning from the woman's face, looked into the gun unflinchingly and in silence. Another pause, freighted with that sort of tension that crumbles the strongest, then slowly the convict let the muzzle of his weapon drop below the heart of the man he faced. Sherwood, he said in a voice that broke between his words, I hate you as I hate no living man, but I can't kill you as you stand before me unarmed and helpless. I'm going to give you a chance for your life. He stepped backward and picked up the deputy warden's revolver. He pushed a table between himself and the man he couldn't kill. He laid the revolvers side by side on it, one pointing toward him, the other toward Sherwood. The clock on the mantel showed three minutes of the hour. Sherwood, he said, in three minutes that clock will strike. I'm exactly as far from the guns as you. On the first stroke of the clock, We'll reach together for them, and the quickest hand wins. Martin Sherwood studied Boston Blackie's face with something in his eyes no other man had ever seen there. He glanced toward the guns on the table. It was true he was exactly as near them as the convict. Nothing prevented him from reaching now and firing at the first touch of his finger on the trigger. Blackie deliberately had surrendered his irresistible advantage to give him, Martin Sherwood, his prison torturer, an even chance for life. For the first time the deputy's eyes were unsteady and his voice throaty and shaken. "'I won't bargain with you, Blackie,' he said. "'You're afraid to risk an even break?' "'You know I'm not.' Sherwood answered his gaze, turning once more to the woman who stood by the door, staring panic-stricken. It was plain that the issue to be decided in that room was life or death to her, as well as to the man. Boston Blackie reached toward his gun, hoping the deputy warden would do likewise, and end, in one quick exchange of shots, the strain he knew was breaking his nerve. Sherwood let Blackie recover his weapon without moving a muscle. Once more the convict's revolver rose till it covered Martin Sherwood's heart. They stood again as they had been, the deputy at the mercy of the escaped prisoner. Seconds passed, then minutes, without a word or a motion on either side of the table over which the triangular tragedy was being settled not at all as any of those concerned had planned. The strain was unbearable. The muscles of the convict's throat twitched. His face was drawn and distorted. "'Pick up the gun and defend yourself!' he cried. "'No!' shouted Sherwood, the calm which his mighty will had until then sustained, snapping like an over-tightened violin string. "'You want to make me feel myself a murderer!' cried Blackie in anguish. "'Why didn't I give you the bullet for bullet when you came in the door? I could have killed you then. Now I can't, unless you'll fight. Once more I ask you, will you take an even break?' "'No!' cried Sherwood again. With a great cry, the cry of a strong man, broken and beaten, Boston Blackie threw his gun upon the floor. "'You win, Sherwood,' he sobbed, losing self-control completely for the first time in a life of daily hazards. "'You've beaten me!' He staggered drunkenly toward Mary and folded her in his arms. "'I try to force myself to pull the trigger by thinking of the life we hoped for together, dear, but I couldn't do it he moaned brokenly. I'll go back with him now. Everything is over. I'm glad now you didn't, dear, she cried, clinging to him. It would have been murder. I don't want you to do that, even to save our happiness. But I'll wait for you, dear one. Wait till your time is done, and you come back to me again. Boston Blackie straightened his shoulders, and turning to Sherwood, held out his wrists for the handcuffs. Come, come, he urged. For God's sake, don't prolong this. Don't stand there gloating. Take me away. Martin Sherwood, with something strangely new transfiguring the face Boston Blackie knew and hated, reached to the table and picked up his gun slowly. Just as slowly, he dropped it into his pocket. 
He looked into the two grief-racked faces before him, long and silently. "'I'm sorry to have disturbed you folks,' he said quietly at last. "'I came here looking for an escaped convict named Boston Blackie. I have found only you, Miss Collins, and your mother. I'm sorry my misinformation has subjected you both to annoyance. The police officers who are outside—' The deputy warden opened a crack in the window curtain and pointed out to the dim shapes in the darkness, and who surround this house, will be withdrawn at once. Had Boston Blackie been in this room, and had he by some mischance killed me, his shot would have brought a dozen men armed with sawed-off shotguns. Escape for him was absolutely impossible. I saw to that before I entered here alone to capture him, but it all has been a blunder. The man I wanted to take back to prison is not here, and I can only hope my apology will be accepted. Blackie stared at him with blazing, unbelieving eyes. From Mary came a cry in which all the pent-up anguish of the lifetime that had been lived in the last half hour found a sudden relief. "'Good night, folks,' said Martin Sherwood, offering Boston Blackie his hand. The convict caught it in his own and the men looked into each other's eyes for a second. Then the deputy warden went out and closed the door behind him. Mary sprang into Blackie's arms, and they dropped together into a chair, dazed with a happiness greater than either had ever known. "'He is a man,' said Blackie. "'He is a man, even though he is a copper.' Martin Sherwood let himself out of the house and beckoned the cordon of police to him as he looked back at the windows of the attic rooms and spoke softly to himself. "'He is a man,' he said. "'He is a man, even though he is a convict.'" It was the greatest praise and the greatest concession either had ever made to another man. Three days later a steamer passed out through the Golden Gate. On the upper deck were a man and a woman, hand in hand, with eyes misty with happiness. Boston Blackie and his Mary. End of chapter 28 End of Boston Blackie by Jack Boyle Recording by Winston Tharp